What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Lieber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. He went where no Martian ever went before. But would he come out? Or had he gone for good? What's he doing in there? by Fritz Lieber. The professor was congratulating Earth's first visitor from another planet on his wisdom in getting in touch with a cultural anthropologist before contacting any other scientists, or governments, God forbid, and in learning English from radio and TV before landing from his orbit-parked rocket, when the Martian stood up and said hesitantly, Excuse me, please, but where is it? The baffled professor and the Martian seemed to grow anxious. At least his long mouth curved upward, and he had explained earlier that it curled downward was his smile. And he repeated, Please, where is it? He was surprisingly humanoid in most respects, but his complexion was textured, so like the rich dark armchair he'd just been occupying that the professor's pinstripe gray suit which he had eagerly consented to wear, seemed an arbitrary interruption between him and the chair. A sort of Mother Hubbard dress on a phantom conjured from its leather. The professor's wife, always a perceptive hostess, came to her husband's rescue by saying with equal rapidity, Top of the stairs, end of the hall, last door. The Martian's mouth curled happily downward, and he said, Thank you very much, and was off. Comprehension burst on the professor. He caught up with his guest at the foot of the stairs. Here, I'll show you the way, he said. No, I can find it myself, thank you, the Martian assured him. Something rather final in the Martian's tone made the professor desist, and after watching his visitor sway up the stairs with an almost hypnotic softly jogging motion, he rejoined his wife in the study, saying wonderingly, Who'd have thought it, by George? Function taboos as strict as our own. I'm glad some of your provisorial visitors maintain them, his wife said darkly. But this one's from Mars, darling, and to find out he's, well, similar in an aspect of his life, is as thrilling as the discovery that water is burned hydrogen. When I think of the day not far distant, when I'll put his entry in the cross-cultural index. He was still rhapsodizing when the professor's little son raced in. Pop, the Martian's gone in the bathroom. Hush, dear. Manners. Now it's perfectly natural, darling, that the boy should notice and be excited. Yes, son, the Martian's not very different from us. Oh, certainly, the professor's wife said with a trace of bitterness. I don't imagine his turquoise complexion will cause any comment at all when you bring him to a faculty reception. They'll just figure he's had a hard night, and that he's got that baby elephant nose sniffing around for assistant professorships. Really, darling, he probably thinks of our noses as disagreeably amputated and paralyzed. Well, anyway, Pop, he's in the bathroom. I followed him when he squiggled upstairs. Now, son, you shouldn't have done that. He's on a strange planet, and it might make him nervous if he thought he was being spied on. We must show him every courtesy. By George, I can't wait to discuss these things with Ackley Ramsbottom. When I think of how much more this encounter has to give an anthropologist than even a physicist or astronomer, he was still going strong on his second rhapsody when he was interrupted by another high-speed entrance. It was the professor's cultish daughter. Mom, Pop, the Martians. Hush, dear, we know. The professor's cultish daughter regained her adolescent poise, which was considerable. Well, he's still in there, she said. I just tried the door and it was locked. I'm glad it was, the professor said, while his wife added. Yes, you can't always be sure what, and caught herself. Really, dear, that was very bad manners. I thought he'd come downstairs long ago, her daughter explained. 
He's been in there an awful long time. It must have been a half an hour ago I saw him gyre and gimble upstairs in that real gone way he has, with Nosy here following him. The professor's coltish daughter was currently soaking up both Jive and Alice. When the professor checked his wristwatch, his expression grew troubled. By George, he is taking his time. Though, of course, we don't know how much time Martians... I wonder. I listened for a while, Pop, the son volunteered. He was running the water, a lot. Running water, eh? We know Mars is a water-starved planet. I suppose that in the presence of unlimited water, he may be seized by a kind of madness. And... But he seemed so well-adjusted. Then his wife spoke, voicing all their thoughts. Her outlook on life gave her a natural sepulcher voice. What's he doing in there? Twenty minutes, and at least as many frantic suggestions later, the professor glanced again at his watch, and nerved himself for action. Motioning his family aside, he mounted the stairs and tiptoed down the hall. He paused only once to shake his head and mutter under his breath. By George, I wish I had Fenchurch or von Gottschalk here. They're a shade better than I am on intercultural contracts, especially taboo-breaking and affronts. His family followed him at a short distance. The professor stopped in front of the bathroom door. Everything was quiet as death. He listened for a minute, then rapped measuredly, steadying his hand by clutching its wrist with the other. There was a faint splashing, but no other sound. Another minute passed. The professor rapped again. Now there was no response at all. He very gingerly tried the knob. The door was still locked. When they had all retreated to the stairs, it was the professor's wife who once more voiced their thoughts. This time her voice carried overtones of supernatural horror. What's he doing in there? He may be dead or dying, the professor's cultish daughter suggested briskly. Maybe we ought to call the fire department, like they did for old Miss Frisbee. The professor winced. I'm afraid you haven't visualized the complications, dear, he said gently. No one but ourselves knows that the Martian is on Earth, or has even the slightest inkling that interplanetary travel has been achieved. Whatever we do, it will have to be on our own. But to break in on a creature engaged in, well, we don't know what primal private activity, is against all anthropological practice. Still, dying's a primal activity, his daughter said crisply. So is ritual bathing before mass murder, his wife added. Please. Still, as I was about to say, we do have the moral duty to succor him, if, as you all too reasonably suggest, he has been incapacitated by a germ or virus, or, more likely, by some simple environmental factor, such as Earth's greater gravity. Tell you what, Pop, I can look in the bathroom window and see what he's doing. All I have to do is crawl out my bedroom window and along the gutter a little ways. It's safe as houses. The professor's question, beginning with, Son, how do you know? died unuttered, and he refused to notice the words his daughter was voicing silently at her brother. He glanced at his wife's sardonically composed face, thought once more of the fire department, or of the other and larger and even more jealous, or would it be skeptical, government agencies, and clutched at the straw offered him. Ten minutes later, he was quite unnecessarily assisting his son back through the bedroom window. Gee, Pop, I can't see a sign of him. That's why I took so long. Hey, Pop, don't look so scared. He's in there, sure enough. It's just that the bathtub's under the window, and you have to get real close to see into it. The Martian's taking a bath? Yep, got it full up and just the end of his little old schnoz sticking out. Your suit, Pop, was hanging on the door. The one word the professor's wife spoke was like a death knell. Drowned. No, Ma, I don't think so. His schnoz was opening and closing regularly like. 
Maybe he's a shape-changer, the professor's cultish daughter said in a burst of evil fantasy. Maybe he softens in the water and thins out after a while until he's like an eel, and then he'll go exploring through the sewer pipes. Wouldn't it be funny if he went under the street and knocked on the stopper from underneath and crawled into the bathtub of President Rexford or Mrs. President Rexford, or maybe right in the middle of one of Janie Rexford's Oh-I'm-so-sexy bubble baths? Please, the professor put his hand to his eyebrow and kept it there, cuddling the elbow in the other hand. Well, have you thought of something? the professor's wife asked him after a bit. What are you going to do? The professor dropped his hand and blinked his eyes hard and took a deep breath. Telegraph Fenchurch and Ackley Ramsbottom and then break in, he said in a resigned voice, into which, nevertheless, a note of hope seemed to have come. First, however, I'm going to wait until morning. And he sat down cross-legged in the hall a few yards from the bathroom door and folded his arms. So the long vigil commenced. The professor's family shared it, and he offered no objection. Other, sterner men, he told himself, might claim to be able successfully to order their children to go to bed when there was a Martian locked in the bathroom. But he would like to see them faced with the situation. Finally, dawn began to seep from the bedrooms. When the bulb in the hall had grown quite dim, the professor unfolded his arms. Just then, there was a loud splashing in the bathroom. The professor's family looked toward the door. The splashing stopped, and they heard the Martian moving around. Then the door opened, and the Martian appeared in the professor's gray pinstripe suit. His mouth curled sharply downward in a broad alien smile as he saw the professor. "'Good morning,' the Martian said happily. I never slept better in my life, even in my own little wet bed back on Mars. He looked around more closely, and his mouth straightened. But where did you all sleep? he asked. Don't tell me you stayed dry all night. You didn't give up your only bed for me. His mouth curled upward in misery. Oh, dear, he said. I'm afraid I've made a mistake somehow. Yet I don't understand how. Before I studied you, I didn't know what your sleeping habits would be. But the question was answered for me. In fact, it looked so reassuringly homelike when I saw those brief TV scenes of your females ready to sleep in their little tubs. Of course, on Mars, only the fortunate can always be sure of sleeping wet. But here, with your abundance of water, I thought there would be wet beds for all. He paused. It's true I had some doubts last night, wondering if I'd use the right words, and all. But then, when you rapped good night to me, I splashed the sentiment back to you and went to sleep in a wink. But I'm afraid that somewhere I've blundered, and... No, no, dear chap, the professor managed to say. He had been waving his hand in a gentle circle for some time, in token that he wanted to interrupt. Everything is quite all right. It's true we stayed up all night, but please consider that as a watch, an honor guard by George, which we kept to indicate our esteem. The End of What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Lieber How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. In the Control Tower by Will Moeller This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrew Gantz in the Control Tower by Will Moeller Shadows haunted the dying alleys. Madness stalked the wide streets. And what lay at the city's heart? 1. Dewforth had almost lost the habit of looking from windows, 
The train which took him to the city every morning passed through a country in the terminal stages of a long war of self-destruction. Whatever had been burned, botched, poisoned, or exhausted in that struggle had been filled along the right of way, among drifts of soot and ground mists of sulfurous smoke and chemical flatulence to form a long, tedious mural, a parody of cloud-borne Asiatic hills, precipitous and always so close to the tracks that their tops could not be seen. This was almost merciful, considering what had been done to the sky— when the train did not sneak between hills of slag, cinders, rubbish, garbage, dross, and the bloody brown carrion of broken machinery, it shot like a bolt in the groove of an arbalist between unbroken barriers of advertising or through deep concrete troughs and roaring tunnels full of grimy light and grubby air. There was one inconsistency in this scheme of things. Just as the train emerged from a deep valley of slag hills and swung into a long curve, passengers on the left side had a panoramic view of the city, a frozen scene of battle between geometrical monsters, made remote and obscure by the dust of a thousand thousand merely human struggles, too small to be visible from the crusty windows of the train by the merely human eye. They had about one second in which to absorb this vision of corporate purpose. Then they were plunging into a final stretch of tunnel to the center of the city itself, where no surface was ever more than fifteen paces away, and where there were no horizons at all. Dewforth was excited by this view, even though it reached him in a fragmentary and subliminal way. Day after day he told himself that he would have all his faculties at the ready before the train swung into the curve. But morning after morning he was still emerging from the stale fumes of the preceding night's beer, where he allowed himself to be hypnotized by the sound of the wheels, or fascinated by the jiggling of another passenger's earlobe at that critical moment. The train had always entered the clangorous colon of the city before this resolve could crystallize in his mind, and he was left with an impression which lay somewhere in the scale of reality between the afterimage of a light bulb and the morning memory of a fever dream. Could never have described the scene except in loose generalities about buildings of contrasting height and unemphatic color. The single memorable feature of the panorama, looming above the rest, was not even a building. It eluded all familiar categories. It was, like the other components of the picture, rectangular, but it was a displaced rectangle. A shining thread of morning sky could be seen beneath it. It was only logical to suppose that it stood on legs of some kind, a complicated process of girders. The upper part appeared to be made of corrugated metal, but, as with the matter of the legs, it was impossible to separate what was actually seen and what was merely inferred. The only other structures Dewforth had seen which resembled it at all were water towers and shipyard cranes, but these had been mere toys compared with the thing that hovered over the center of the city. Its purpose could not be guessed, but what disturbed Dewforth more was the fact that he could not be sure that it existed. He was a precision draftsman, more or less resigned to deteriorating eyesight, and his usual abstracted state of mind during that segment of his day had also to be considered. He hoped that someone else would mention the structure. Once, only once, a man sitting on the opposite seat had made a comment which could have applied to it. It turned, he said, just as the tunnel swallowed the train. Dewforth would have liked to ask the other passenger what he had meant. Had he seen the same thing? Had he seen anything at all? And what had he meant by turned? But he had not asked. The other had been not merely forbidding, not merely repugnant, but alternately forbidding and repugnant. In daylight, an impeccable burger sitting tall and righteous under a tall hat. In tunnels, a hunchbacked gargoyle picking its nose in the fickle darkness. If Dewforth had been the only passenger on the train, or indeed the last man in the world, he could not have been more alone with his wonder. You did not ask whimsical questions of strangers nowadays. You did not ask many questions of friends. All uncertainties incubated in private darkness, 
They lived and grew and even put forth new appendages. Not a building. Not a water tank. Not a crane. Perhaps it was only an illusion. Illusion or not, it wanted a name so that it might be at least catalogued in his own mind. Therefore, on a morning since forgotten and for reasons never closely examined, he decided to call it the Control Tower. 2. There was an unholy Friday restlessness upon Dewforth. To make matters worse, it was the last Friday in March. Logically, perhaps, this should not have made any difference, because Dewforth worked in one of a number of identical windowless rooms in a building from which all natural rhythms had been rigorously excluded. From skylights high in the ceiling of the drafting rooms came a light which had been pasteurized and was timeless. It could have been artificial. His work provided no refuge for his thought. It was demanding, but only mechanically so. Strictly speaking, he did not know what he was doing. No one did, apparently. He did not have the satisfaction of knowing that what he did was real. He filled large sheets of plastic with tracings of intricate, interconnected schematic hieroglyphs. But he knew that in another place a template would be laid over his work. An irregular portion like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle would be cut out of it, and the rest, perhaps more than half of his work, would be destroyed. It was even possible that all of it was destroyed. Duforth worked for a firm which made components. Of what, no one said, no one asked. Components, Inc., the firm was called. He knew that the finished products were small, heavy, and very complicated. Their names were mute combinations of letters and numbers, joined by hyphens or separated by virgules. Some said that these components performed no functions. Others said that they worked, but their operations corresponded to no known human need. It was known that some of the finished products themselves were destroyed. Some maintained that they were dissolved in vats of hydrofluoric acid. Others argued that they were encased in cement, then taken out to sea in speedboats on moonless nights and jettisoned. The favorite rumor was that the entire firm was a decoy to bewilder agents of foreign powers and preempt their espionage efforts. There was neither proof of this nor evidence to the contrary. The penalty for circulating this last rumor was immediate dismissal with prejudice. In another place, another time, Dewforth might have spread the burden of his mood by confiding in other workers, but not under the circumstances so painstakingly arranged by Components, Inc. in the interest of what was called the Interloathing Index, or I.I. It was an axiom of modern industry that a high I.I. meant high productivity and also tighter security. The latter was as much the measure of the importance of an industry as what it made or how much. That there was design in the egg-box compartmentation of workspaces, for example, was obvious enough. Less overt were the lengths to which personnel had gone to discourage the exchange of information, or confidences, among employees. Under the guise of aptitude testing, the psychologists had been able to select and organize teams consisting entirely of mutually incompatible individuals. So well had they succeeded that most workers could barely stand the sight of one another, and so were driven back upon themselves and their work. Only by practicing an almost egg-like self-containment could a draftsman or other worker hope to get through the day without open conflict and disaster. Latent antipathies among workers were further intensified by means of the annual proficiency competitions. At the conclusion of these tests, all employees save two were given proficiency stars. Of the remaining two, one was invariably a person who had shown signs of becoming too popular among his fellows. He was given a leadership star, and because an affable man was usually less rather than more efficient than the rest, this made of him a lonely little air bubble in a sea of resentment. The second of the two workers was always discharged. Thus, a dash of anxiety was added to the proceedings. 
The visible manifestations of high eye eye were hectic color, a characteristic ferocity of the eye, and throbbing jaw hinges. Often the jaw hinges of an entire team would be pulsating at once, sometimes even in unison. This spectacle emanated an overwhelming feeling of earnestness and purpose. Executives were fond of pointing out this phenomenon to visiting dignitaries. Observe their jaw hinges, they would say. Another factor which isolated employees from one another was the peculiarly virulent form of halitosis, which affected all workers without exception. The company cafeteria was the source of this malady. Thus, if Duforth had been the only employee in that vast complex of buildings, or in the world, he could not have been restlessness. Add to this the fact that it had been his misfortune to win the leadership star in the proficiency competitions only three days earlier. He did not have to trace the bitter stream of his mood any farther back than that to find the bile source. The object of the contest had been to draw a single line twenty-eight and five-eighths inches long, and one fifteen-thousandth of an inch thick, a feat which is starkly simple in conception, but only theoretically feasible. The draftsman had spent hours preparing the surfaces of paper, straining ink through filters, honing drawing pens with emery and polishing them with rouge, drawing practice lines and scrutinizing them with powerful bench microscopes. They did Balinese finger exercises, Chinese body coordination exercises, Hindu breathing exercises, and Tibetan spiritual calisthenics to dispel their incipient shakes. When the great moment came, a solemn little group of executives entered the drafting room and stood about in attitudes of grave ceremonial courtesy. The draftsmen then drew their lines. When it was over, the judges examined and graded the lines, and the scores were announced by Mr. Schrank, the foreman. The better scores prompted little flutters of restrained applause from the executives. This moist and muted sound had reminded Duforth of a hippopotamus venting its wind under water and in a moment of thoughtless exhilaration he had even thought of sharing this bizarre notion with his wife. He never did so, as it happened. Why had he never told his wife about that wretched leadership star? Her laughter persisted through his dreams, or through his dream. He only had one. In this dream she was always a massive machine which ingested songbirds between steel rollers and stamped them into pipe-flange gaskets at a rate of one hundred and twenty per minute. And the prize-winning line he had drawn, it revealed its true nature in the perspective of days. There was no mistaking what it was. It was the abyss. It could widen and it could engulf. How much light would a leadership star cast in that bottomless inkiness? Acute restlessness had the effect of sending Duforth frequently to the lavatory, not so much for physiological reasons as because there was no other place to go, and he had to go somewhere when the white walls of the drafting room threatened to crush him. He went as often as he thought he could without attracting the attention of Mr. Schrank or eliciting ponderous jocosities from the other workers. After several visits, however, he did begin to question himself. What drew him to that bleak refuge again and again? He was not aware of bladder irritation. He had no infantile obsession about such facilities. Was he driven by an aggregation of petty forces, each too small to make sense by itself? Or was there one reason hiding behind a cloud of small rationalizations? There was a difference in the air in the lavatory, and in the sound. The undifferentiated background sound which came from nowhere. Nowhere? It came through a window. He had been staring at a window, probably the only one in the building, and it had failed to register on his mind at the time because he had not expected it to be there. It was not part of the habitual pattern. He had seen a window. He had, moreover, looked through a window. What had he seen? He thought about this, and at the same time he thought about being sick, administratively sick. 
he succeeded in working up a palpable fever and a windy yawning beneath the diaphragm. Before taking any action, he would have to confirm what he had seen through the window of the lavatory. On his last trip to the lavatory, he climbed up onto the slippery wash basin and looked through the high window. His position there would be impossible to explain, of course, if anyone should come in. He was past caring about that. The unpasteurized air made him a little drunk, and the sound, the immense, distant, sighing groan like a giant's whisper, filled his brain. It made him want to expand to meet it somehow. Only one immense skeleton foot was visible, but there was no question about exactly what it was. No conventional structure would curve upward in that way. There was no point of reference by which to determine how far away it was, and the air was blue with haze, giving everything an appearance of remoteness and of unreality. He had never seen the city from that angle before, but if what he saw was what he thought it was, how could it have been so close without his knowing about it before this time? It was a thing which belonged to vast distances, spatial distances and other kinds of distance as well. Now it was close, or he was closer to it than he had ever imagined he would be in his life. It was accessible. Dewforth left at half-past three, when the somnolence of afternoon was heaviest on the heads of the other draftsmen. He did not speak to Mr. Schrank about it. He did not clear with Miss Plock in the dispensary, nor with Mr. Furt in personnel, nor with Miss Yurt in wage readjustment, nor with Miss Bort in sick leave subdivision, nor with Miss Vibe in special problems, nor with Mr. Feister in sick claims, nor with Miss Grope in employee grievances, nor with Miss Rupnick in company grievances, nor with Miss Gugward in allowance reductions, nor with Mr. Droon in privilege curtailment, nor with Miss Tremulo in psychological counseling, nor with Dr. Shrek in spiritual aid subdivision. He did not even trouble to see Miss Nosemilker, who kept the time book. He just left. Three. Nobody goes up there, said the hulking, oyster-eyed man in the burlap overcoat. The bum's eyes cleared long enough for him to peer into Dewforth's eyes in order to see if his madness was worth sharing. Then they filmed over again as he decided that it was not. Dewforth crowded past him and walked on. He was making real progress. He had at last found someone who acknowledged that there was something up there above eye level. The others, old lost children, figures of scab and grime, had been unaware of anything but inner cavities of craving and fear above the sidewalk firmament of trodden gum discs, sputum stars, and the ends of twice-smoked cigarettes. He could not have lost sight of the control tower. He had never realized what streets were. Before that time, he had known a single well-policed block between the station and his place of work. He still thought of streets as more or less open strips along which people moved, north or south, east or west, purposefully from point A to point B, with perhaps one right-angle turn, two at the most, pausing only to tip hats or look into shop windows. Now it developed that streets were sewers, battlegrounds, lairs, abattoirs, cesspools, lazarettes, midways of deformity and brawling markets where nightmares and spirochetes were sold. The city had not less than three dimensions. He had not been fully prepared for the implications of this either. Existence in three dimensions does not necessarily mean three-dimensional vision. The sky was not visible through the maze of girders, stairways, and catwalks overhead. Duforth tried to orient himself by the direction of shadows, but this was misleading. It was the heart of the shadow district, and the play of shadows was the order of things. The rules were the rules of phantoms. Flesh lived there in subjection. Long miscegenation with shadow had made phantoms of them all, and endowed all shadows with the menace of the real. Everything was equivocal as hell. Dewforth wandered in a cavern without walls. He saw bulky overcoats with defeated hats or defeated heads, long-legged dwarfs in black leather jackets, willowy chorus boys with platinum ringlets waiting in their niches for the gift of violence, 
scuttling trolls with horse-blanket jackets and alpine hats, deposed patriarchs under the small shelter of black derbies, hiding from persecution behind the Spanish moss of consolidated beards, headless things and thingless heads, importuning, threatening, watching, or just standing there, those that were able. In his search for a way out of the darkness, he was obliged to turn back time and again, if gangs of shadows fought with knives at the end of a street which had at first looked promising, what business had shadows cursing or screaming or bleeding? If the madman who enjoined the mob to fight in the service of nothingness was only a mouse dancing on a summit of garbage, why did they cheer? At the end of still another street, a mass rape may not have been in progress. The participants may not have waited sullenly in a long line. A macrocephalic gnome in a plaid suit may not actually have moved up and down the line selling tickets at a reduced rate, and explaining that the outrage had been in progress since the preceding Christmas Eve. But why was the unreality so consistent? And if no one was in fact being ravaged, why did everyone look as though they had been? All these spectacles tested Duforth's courage but they dimmed his resolve not at all. At last he found a deserted street. He followed it, and he was rewarded with encouraging signs. There was more bird lime underfoot, and the inhuman yammering of the streets was replaced with echoing silence, and that silence was invaded by the sound, the voice of the Colossus, remote and terrible. Duforth asked directions again, this time of a pear-shaped figure which may or may not have had legs, and which sat in the mouth of an iron cave and smoked what appeared to be a twist of hemp. Where? Duforth began. Nobody goes up there, the hemp smoker answered without looking up at him. Where do they come down, then? asked Duforth, trying a new approach but with little hope. There was a long pause. The pear-shaped man didn't have arms either, Duforth noticed. Hands, but no arms. Well, now some got it, some ain't, he said. How's that, asked Duforth. The pear blew out a cloud of smoke, sulfurous, with viscous strings through it. I knowed a guy caught it from a drinking glass once. This dialogue might have gone on much longer if Duforth had not just then noticed that his non-informer was sitting on the bottom step of a long, dark stairway, which led up and up into a jungle of lacy girders and shadows above them. He did not bother kicking the pear-shaped man. He stepped over him and ran up the stairs two at a time. His footsteps rang on the iron stairs and carried through the structure. It sounded like the bells of a sunken cathedral ringing in the tide. On the second level there was more light and more air. It was colder. There were loiterers on the second level, too, but these were far from menacing. They clung to things and pressed themselves against things, and they stared with unfocused eyes at something which had been there before but was not there now. These men seemed to be wearing greasy fezes and dark, baggy, long underwear with buttons and vestigial lapels. As he approached them, Duforth saw that the fezes were actually felt hats, with the brims atrophied or rotted away, and the funereal long johns were the weather-beaten remains of those suits which are designed for young men on the way up. As though by tacit agreement of long-standing, these men did not look directly at Duforth as he passed nor he at them. There was no difficulty about finding a stairway to the next level, but there was a rusty chain across the entrance. Duforth's foot caught in this chain as he stepped over it, and it shattered like a chain of stale pretzels. There were no more people beyond the second level, none that could be seen. He soon lost count of levels. Stairs became narrower and more heavily encrusted with bird lime and rust as he ascended, in some places there were long, sweeping ramps which led to blind sacks or reached out unsupported into space, and he was forced to retrace his steps. At no time did he look down, even when it was possible. There were usually high barriers along the platforms and ramps. These were covered with layers of old advertising posters which peeled and were torn by the wind, revealing still more ancient posters underneath. They seemed to have grown there by themselves like lichen. 
It seemed entirely reasonable to Duforth that the writing on the old posters underneath was runic or demotic, and the faces were ochre-stained skulls, but his impulse was to hurry past and not study them too closely. At last he found a long, steep ladder running up the outside of one of the legs of the control tower. Only huge, slowly circling birds and low-flying clouds came between him and the underside of the control house at the top of the structure. Before beginning the climb, he admonished himself not to look down and not to ponder what he was doing. In order to keep climbing, however, he had to keep admonishing himself, thereby only reminding himself to look down and to ponder, to the detriment of his equilibrium and confidence. Was it vertigo, or did the ladder of the tower itself sway in the singing wind? Who was to say that the earth itself did not heave like fermenting mash? Was any object inherently more solid than any other object? What was stability? When he looked down at the city, he could not pick out the building in which he had worked. There was nothing in any feature of the landscape, nothing. If his position, clinging to a girder high above the city, made no sense, it did not make less sense than the position of a man, or a do-forth, sitting in a blind cell among thousands of other blind cells down there drawing tiny lines. Nothing bound him to the drafting room, nor even to the do-forth of the drafting room not so much as a spider web or a shaft of light. The light pointed to itself. The wind got under his shirt and chilled his navel, a poignant reminder of disconnectedness. An eagle glided close and screamed at him. It was like the laughter of his wife. He resumed his climb, looking down no more. The last few yards of the climb were the worst. Some bolts holding the ladder in place were shapeless little masses of rust. The eleventh rung from the top broke under his weight, and for the last ten steps he had to lighten his body by means of a technique of auto-suggestion and will-projection which he invented on the spot, demonstrating what could be done under pressure of extreme necessity. He could see above his head a tiny balcony not more than a yard square, at which the latter terminated. The floor of this balcony appeared to be made of long, weather-beaten cigars, which reason told him were badly corroded iron bars. Reason also told him that there would be a door there. He could not see a door through the skeleton floor of the balcony, but the idea that there would not be a door there was, under circumstances, insupportable. There would be a door, he told himself as he made his way upwards by means of levitation and the most tentative of steps. It would probably have an inhospitable sign on it. No trespassing, authorized personnel only, danger, or perhaps high voltage. It might prove to be locked. If so, he would pound on it until someone opened it, he decided. There was even an outside possibility that no one would be inside. He had never considered that possibility before that time. He decided that it was not time to consider it now. When Duforth heaved himself up onto the small projecting platform, he felt the ladder give under his feet. It was not just another rung. He saw the entire ladder go curling away into the emptiness like a huge broken spring. Then he lay on the platform face down with his eyes closed, fingers clutching the sill of the door for a long time. New sounds invaded his personal darkness as he lay there. He heard bells, buzzers, klaxons, whistles, and slamming relays. There were voices from loudspeakers, imperious and hopeless, angry and feeble, impassioned and monotonous, arrogant and anguished, in a synthetic language made up of odd phonetics, long since discarded from a thousand other languages. When he looked up, he saw no door, but only a rectangle of darkness with erratic flashes of colored light. Having no choice... He entered on his hands and knees. 4. Duforth wandered in a labyrinth of control panels which reached almost to the ceiling, but did not entirely shut out the light. This light was like skimmed milk diffused in shadow. He reasoned that it came from windows, but when he tried to remember whether the control cab had windows, he could not be sure. He had no visual image of windows seen from the outside, but he had supposed that such an edifice would hardly be blind. Somewhere beyond this maze of control panels, he also reasoned, there must be an area like the bridge of an enormous ship, 
where the clamor of the bells, buzzers, klaxons, and whistles, and the silent warnings and importunings of dials, gauges, colored lights, ticker tapes which spewed from metal mouths, the palsied styles which scribbled on creeping scrolls were somehow collated and made meaningful, where the yammering loudspeakers could be answered, and where the operators could look out and down and see what they were doing. Where were the operators? The noise was deafening. Unlike the noise of machinery in a factory, it was not homogeneous. Each sound was intended to attract attention and to evoke a certain response. But what response and from whom? Long levers projecting from the steel deck wagged back and forth spastically like the legs of monstrous insects struggling on their backs. Several times, Duforth was temporarily blinded by an explosion of blue light as a fuse blew or something short-circuited among the rows of knife switches and rheostats on the panels. One would never really get used to the sporadic sound or to the lights. There was no knowable pattern about them, about what they did or said. When he closed his eyes and tried to compose himself, the words... Out of control flashed red against the back of his eyelids, but he told himself that this was foolish. How was one to adjudge a situation to be out of control when one did not know what constituted control, over what or by whom? Furthermore, he rebuked himself, if the panels, never mind how many or how forbidding, with their lights, bells, buzzers, switches, relays, dials, gauges, styles, tapes, pointers, rheostats, and buttons, had any meaning. And in fact, if the tower itself had any meaning at all, that meaning was control. How arrogant it had been of him to imagine even briefly that because he, a green intruder in that high place, had not immediately comprehended what it was all about, the situation must be out of control. Absurd. There were hundreds, perhaps thousands, of little labels attached to the control panels, presumably indicating the functions of the buttons, switches, and other controls. Duforth leaned close and studied these, but found only mute combinations of letters and numbers, joined by hyphens or separated by virgules. They made him feel somewhat more fragile, more round-shouldered and colder, but he resisted despair. It was getting a little darker, though. The skimmed milk light above him was taking on a bluish tint. He had no way of knowing how long he had wandered among the control panels. His time sense had always been dependent upon clocks and bells, and upon the arrivals and departures of trains. It was a sound which finally led Duforth out of the maze of control panels. It was not a louder sound, not more emphatic, imperative, or clear than the others. It was formless, feeble, and ineffably pathetic. It was its utter incongruity which reached Duforth through the robotic clamor, and which touched him, a mewing as of a kitten trapped in a closet. It came, as he discovered, from the operator. He was quite alone among his levers, wheels, switches, buttons, cranks, gauges, lights, bells, buzzers, horns, ticker tapes, creeping scrolls, barking loudspeakers, and cryptic dials. Duforth saw him sharply silhouetted against a long window through which bluish-gray light poured, but through which nothing could be clearly seen from where he stood. The operator sat on a high, one-legged stool. His head was drawn into his shoulders, which were crumpled things of bird-like bones. His head was bald on top, but the fringe was long and wild. He had big, simian ears sat at right angles to his head, and the light shone through them, not pink, but yellowish. There was an aureole of fine hairs about them which gave them the appearance of angel's wings. With enlarged hands at the ends of almost fleshless arms, he clutched at the knobs of rheostats and the cranks of transformers, hesitantly, spasmodically, and without ever quite reaching anything. Each time he withdrew his hands quickly, as though he had been on the point of touching something very hot. His arms might have been elongated by a lifetime of such aborted movement. Just as Duforth began to wonder how his sudden appearance there would affect the old man, feeble and distraught as he already was, the operator whirled on his stool and stared at Duforth with eyes so round, so huge, and so terrified that the rest of his face was not noticeable at all. He shouted something that sounded like huzzah, but almost certainly was not, then stiffened 
then fell to the steel deck with no more fuss than a bag of corn husks would have made, and died. One would think that a windowed control cab or wheelhouse atop the loftiest structure in a city, or an entire landscape, would afford a man an Olympian view of the world below, and of its people, and their activities. Dewforth must have believed this at one time, but he found that it was not so. The entire lower portion of the windows was covered with thin pages of typescript, mostly yellowed, dusty, and curled at the edges. Orders, instructions, directives, memoranda, all urgent, for immediate action, important, priority, on no account or at all costs. The texts of these orders, instructions, directives, or memoranda consisted of mute combinations of letters and numbers, joined by hyphens or separated by virgules. Through the upper portion of the windows, Dewforth could just make out the horizon and a narrow strip of darkening sky, which were silent and which demanded nothing of him. Amid the continuing clamor of all the signal devices, he tried to recapture the last utterance of the operator, the former operator. Huzzah was out of the question. Who's there, or who's that, were more likely, but, as he thought of it, weren't who's what, who's where, where's what, or even who's where, just as likely? Of these possible last words, who's where echoed most persistently in his memory. Dewforth might have torn away the pages of meaningless orders and looked down upon lights as darkness fell, but he did not. Opaque as they were in form and content alike, there was something reassuringly familiar in the lines of inane symbols, and they were all that stood between him and the approaching tidal wave of night, and beyond the night, the winter with its storms. End of In the Control Tower To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by N. R. Collard. To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Got a problem? Just pick up the phone. It solved them all, and all in the same way. Everything was perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. All diseases were conquered, so was old age. Death, barring accidents, was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilized at 40 million souls. One bright morning, in the Chicago Lying-In Hospital, a man named Edward K. Whaling, Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day any more. Whaling was fifty-six, a mere stripling in the population whose average age was one hundred and twenty-nine. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Young Whaling was hunched in his chair, his head in his hand. He was so rumpled, so still and colourless, as to be virtually invisible. His camouflage was perfect, since the waiting room had a disorderly and demoralised air too. Chairs and ashtrays had been moved away from the walls. The floor was paved with spattered drop cloths. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to a man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about two hundred years old, sat on a stepladder, painting a mural he did not like. Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at thirty-five or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, turned the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuse to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland nor old Japan, 
had a garden been more formal, been better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor, singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple, kiss this sad world toodaloo. If you don't want my loving, why should I take up all this space? I'll get off this whole planet, let some sweet baby have my place. The orderly looked in at the mural and the muralist. Looks so real, he said. I can practically imagine I'm standing in the middle of it. What makes you think you're not in it? said the painter. He gave a satiric smile. It's called the happy garden of life, you know. That's good of Dr. Hitz, said the orderly. He was referring to one of the male figures in white, whose head was a portrait of Dr. Benjamin Hitz, the hospital's chief obstetrician. Hitz was a blindingly handsome man, "'Lots of faces to fill in,' said the orderly. "'He meant that the faces of many of the figures in the mural were still blank. "'All blanks were to be filled with portraits of important people "'on either the hospital staff "'or from the Chicago office of the Federal Bureau of Termination. "'Must be nice to be able to make pictures that look like something,' said the orderly. "'The painter's face curdled with scorn. "'You think I'm proud of this daub?' he said. You think this is my idea of what life really looks like? What's your idea of what life looks like? said the orderly. The painter gestured at a foul drop cloth. There's a good picture of it, he said. Frame that, and you'll have a picture a damn sight more honest than this one. You're a gloomy old duck, aren't you? said the orderly. Is that a crime? said the painter. The orderly shrugged. If you don't like it here, Grandpa, he said, and he finished the thought with the trick telephone number that people who didn't want to live any more were supposed to call. The zero in the telephone number he pronounced naught. The number was 2BR, naught to be. It was the telephone number of an institution whose fanciful subacase included Automat, Birdland, Cannery, Catbox, Delouser, Easy Go, Goodbye, Mother, Happy Hooligan, Kiss Me Quick, Lucky Pierre, Sheep Dip, Wearing Blender, Weep No More, and Why Worry. To be or not to be was the telephone number of the municipal gas chambers of the Federal Bureau of Termination. The painter thumbed his nose at the orderly. When I decide it's time to go, he said, it won't be at the Sheep Dip. Oh, do it yourself, or eh? said the orderly. Messy business, Grandpa. Why don't you have a little consideration for the people who have to clean up after you? The painter expressed, with an obscenity, his lack of concern for the tribulations of his survivors. The world could do with a good deal more mess if you ask me, he said. The orderly laughed and moved on. Wailing, the waiting father mumbled something without raising his head and then he fell silent again. A coarse, formidable woman strode into the waiting room on Spike Hills. Her shoes, stockings, trench coat, bag and overseas cap were all purple, the purple the painter called the colour of grapes of judgment day. The medallion of her purple musette bag was the seal of the service division of the Federal Bureau of Termination, an eagle perched on a turnstile. The woman had a lot of facial hair, and an unmistakable moustache, in fact. A curious thing about gas chamber hostesses was that no matter how lovely and feminine they were when recruited, they all sprouted moustaches within five years or so. "'Is this where I'm supposed to come?' she said to the painter. "'A lot would depend on what your business was,' he said. "'You aren't about to have a baby, are you?' "'They told me I was supposed to pose for some picture,' she said. My name's Leora Duncan, she waited. And you dunk people, he said. What, she said. Skip it, he said. That sure is a beautiful picture, she said. Looks just like heaven or something. 
or something, said the painter. He took a list of names from his smock pocket. Duncan, 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 he said, scanning the list. Yes, here you are. You're entitled to be immortalised. See any faceless body here you'd like me to stick your head on? We've got a few choice ones left. She studied the mule obliquely. Gee, she said, they're all the same to me. I don't know anything about art. Body's a body, eh? he said. All righty. As a master of fine art, I recommend this body here. He indicated a faceless figure of a woman who was carrying dried stalks to a trash burner. Well, said Leo or Duncan, that's more the disposal people, isn't it? I mean, I'm in service. I don't do any disposing. The painter clapped his hands in mock delight. You say you don't know anything about art, and then you prove in the next breath that you know more about it than I do. Of course, the sheave carrier is wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her? he said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said, and she blushed and became humble. That... That puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upsets you, he said. Oh, good gravy, no, she said. It's it's, it's just such an honor. Ah, you, you admire him, eh, he said. Who doesn't admire him, she said, worshipping the portrait of Hitz. It was the portrait of a tanned, white-haired, omnipotent Zeus, 240 years old. Who doesn't admire him, she said again. He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago. Nothing would please me more, said the painter, than to put you next to him for all time. Sawing off a limb. That strikes you as appropriate? That is kind of like what I do, she said. She was demure about what she did. What she did was make people comfortable when she killed them. And while Leora Duncan was posing for her portrait... Into the waiting room bounded Dr. Hitz himself. He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan, he said, and he made a joke. What are you doing here, he said. This isn't where the people leave, this is where they come in. We're going to be in the same picture together, she said shyly. Good, said Dr. Hitz heartily, and say... "'Isn't that some picture? "'I sure am honoured to be in it with you,' she said. "'Let me tell you,' he said, "'I'm honoured to be in it with you. "'Without women like you, "'this wonderful world we've got wouldn't be possible.' "'He saluted her and moved toward the door "'that led to the delivery rooms. "'Guess what was just born?' he said. "'I can't,' she said. "'Triplets,' he said. "'Triplets,' she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets. The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to live, called for three volunteers. Do the parents have three volunteers? said Leora Duncan. Last I heard, said Dr. Hitz, they had one and were trying to scrape another two up. I don't think they made it, she said. Nobody made three appointments with us. Nothing but singles going through today, unless somebody called in after I left. What's the name? Wailing, said the waiting father, sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Wailing, Jr. is the name of the happy father-to-be. He raised his right hand, looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. Present, he said. Ah, Mr. Wailing, said Dr. Hitz, I didn't see you. The Invisible Man, said Wailing. They just phoned me that your triplets have been born, said Dr. Hitz. They're all fine, and so is the mother. I'm on my way in to see them now. Hooray, said Wailing emptily. You don't sound very happy, said Dr. Hitz. What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy, said Wailing. He gestured with his hands to symbolize carefree simplicity. All I have to do is pick out which one of the triplets is going to live, then deliver my maternal grandfather to the happy hooligan and come back here with a receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Wailing, towered over him. 
"'You don't believe in population control, Mr. Whaling?' he said. "'I think it's perfectly keen,' said Whaling tautly. "'Would you like to go back to the good old days "'when the population of the Earth was twenty billion, "'about to become forty billion, then eighty billion, then one hundred and sixty billion? "'Do you know what a druplet is, Mr. Whaling?' said Hitz. "'Nope,' said Whaling sulkily. "'A druplet, Mr. Whaling, is one of the little knobs "'on the little pulpy grains of a blackberry,' said Dr. Hitz. "'Without population control, human beings would now be packed on this surface of this old planet like druplets on a blackberry. Think of it! Whaling continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there wasn't even enough drinking water to go round, and nothing to eat but seaweed, and still people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits, and their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Whaling quietly, I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either, said Welling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz, gently, sympathetically. I wish people wouldn't call it that, said Leor Duncan. What? said Dr. Hitz. I wish people wouldn't call it the cat box and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. Oh, you're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me, he corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said Ethical Suicide Studios, he said. That sounds much better, said Leora Duncan. This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Whaling, said Dr. Hitz. He or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet thanks to population control in a garden like that mural there. He shook his head. Two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another twenty years. Now centuries of peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Welling had just drawn a revolver. Whaling shot Dr. Hitz dead. "'There's room for one, a great big one,' he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. "'It's only death,' he said to her as she fell. "'There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody seemingly heard the shots. The painter sat on the top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life demanding to be born, and, once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply, to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim, even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war, he thought of plague, he thought of starvation, he knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cloths below, and then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life too, and he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Welling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself, but he didn't have the nerve, and then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number, 2 B R naught to be. Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of a hostess. How soon could I get an appointment? he asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if you get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. And he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir said the hostess. Your city thanks you, your country thanks you, your planet thanks you, but the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. The End To Be or Not To Be by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. One Out of Ten by J. Anthony Furlane This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. There may be a town called Mars, Montana, but little Mrs. Frieda Dunny didn't come from there. One out of ten by J. Anthony Furlane. I watched Don Phillips, the commercial announcer, out of the corner of my eye. The camera in front of me swung around and lined up on my set. And now on with the show, Phillips was saying, and here, ready to test your wits, is your quizzing quizmaster, smiling Jim Parsons. I smiled into the camera and waited until the audience applauded. The camera tally light went on, and the stage manager brought his arm down and pointed at me. Good afternoon, I said to the camera. Here we go again with another half hour of fun and prizes on television's newest, most exciting game, Parlor Quiz. In a moment, I'll introduce you to our first contestant. But first, here's a special message for you mothers. The baby powder commercial appeared on the monitor, and I walked over to the next set. They had the first contestant lined up for me. I smiled and took her card from the floor man. She was a middle-aged woman with a faded print dress and old-style shoes. I never saw the contestants until they were on the air. They were screened before the show by the staff. They usually tried to pick contestants who would make good show material, an odd name or occupation, or somebody with twenty kids, something of that nature. I looked at the card for the tip-off. Mrs. Frieda Dunny, the card said. Ask her where she comes from. I smiled at the contestant again and took her by the hand. The tally light went on again, and I grinned into the camera. Well, now, we're all set to go, and our first contestant today is this charming little lady right here beside me, Miss Frieda Dunny. I looked at the card. How are you, Miss Dunny? Fine, just fine. All set to answer a lot of questions and win a lot of prizes? Oh, I'll win all right, said Miss Dunny, smiling around the audience. The audience tittered a bit at the remark. I looked at the card again. Where are you from, Miss Dunny? Mars, said Mrs. Dunny. Mars, I laughed, anticipating the answer. Mars, Montana? Mars, Peru? No, Mars, up there, she said, pointing up in the air. The planet Mars, the fourth planet out from the sun. My assistant looked unhappy. I smiled again, wondering what the gag was. I decided to play along. Well, well, I said, all the way from Mars, eh? And how long have you been on Earth, Miss Dunny? Oh, about thirty or forty years. I've been here nearly all my life. Came here when I was a wee bit of a girl. Well, I said, you're practically an Earth woman by now, aren't you? The audience laughed. Do you plan to go back some day, or have you made up your mind to stay here on Earth for the rest of your days? Oh, I'm just here for the invasion, said Mrs. Dunny. When it's over, I'll probably go back home again. The invasion? Yes, the invasion of Earth. As soon as enough of us are here, we'll get started. You mean there are others here, too? Oh, yes. There are several million of us here in the United States already. And more are on the way. There are only about a hundred and seventy million people in the United States, Miss Dunny, I said. If there are several million Martians among us, one out of every hundred would have to be a Martian? One out of every ten, said Miss Dunny. That's what the boss said just the other day. We're getting pretty close to the number we need to take over Earth. What do you need, I asked. One to one? One Martian for every Earthman? Oh, no, said Miss Dunny. One Martian is worth ten Earthmen. The only reason we're waiting is we don't want any trouble. You don't look any different from us Earth people, Miss Dunny. How does one tell the difference between a Martian and an Earthman when one sees one? Oh, we don't look any different, said Mrs. Dunny. 
Some of the kids don't even know they're Martians. Most mothers don't tell their children until they're grown up. And there are other children who are never told because they just don't develop their full powers. What powers? Oh, telepathy, thought control, that sort of thing. You mean that Martians can read people's thoughts? Sure, it's no trouble at all. It's very easy, really, once you get the hang of it. Can you read my mind? I asked, smiling. Sure, said Miss Dunny, smiling up at me. That's why I said I'd know the answers. I'll be able to read the answers from your mind when you look at the sheet of paper. Now, that's hardly sporting, is it, Miss Dunny? I said, turning to the camera. The audience laughed. Everybody else has to do it the hard way, and here you are reading it from my mind. All's fair in love and war, said Miss Dunny. Tell me, Mrs. Dunny, why are you telling me all about this? Isn't it supposed to be a secret? I have my reasons, said Miss Dunny. Nobody believes me anyhow. Oh, I believe you, Miss Dunny, I said gravely. And now, let's see how you do on the questions. Are you ready? She nodded. Name the one and only mammal that has the ability to fly, I asked, reading from the script. A bat, she said. Right. Did you read that from my mind? Oh, yes, you're coming over very clear, said Mrs. Dunny. Try this one, I said. A princess is any daughter of a sovereign. What is a princess royal? The elder daughter of a sovereign, she said. Correct. How about this one? Is a Kodiak a kind of simple box camera, a type of double-bowed boat, or a type of Alaskan bear? A bear, said Miss Dunny. Very good, I said. That was a hard one. I asked her seven more questions, and she got them all right. None of the other contestants had ever come close to her score, so I wound up giving her the gas range and a lot of other smaller prizes. After we were off the air, I followed the audience out into the hall. Mrs. Dunny was walking towards the lobby with an old paper shopping bag under her arm. An attendant was following her with an armful of prizes. I caught up to her before she reached the door. Mrs. Dunny, I said, and she turned around. I want to talk to you. When do I get the gas stove, she said. Your local dealer will send it out to you in a few days. Did you give them your address? Yes, I gave it to them. My Philadelphia address, that is. I don't even remember my address at home anymore. Come now, Miss Dunny. You don't have to keep up that Mars business now that we're off the air. It's the truth. I didn't come here just by accident, said Mrs. Dunny, looking over her shoulder toward the attendant, who was still holding the prizes. I came here to see you. Me? Mrs. Dunny set the paper bag down on the floor and dug down into her pocketbook. She took out a dog-eared piece of white paper and bent it up in her hand. Yes, she said finally. I came to see you, and you didn't follow me out here because you wanted to. I commanded you to come. Commanded me to come, I sputtered. What for? To prove something to you. Do you see this piece of paper? She held out the paper in her hand with the blank side toward me. My address is on this paper. I am reading the address. Concentrate on what I am reading. I looked at her. I concentrated. Suddenly I knew. 251 South 8th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, I said aloud. You see, it's very easy once you have the hang of it, she said. I nodded and smiled down at her. Now I understood. I picked up her bag and put my hand on her shoulder. Let's go, I said. We have a lot to talk about. The End of One Out of Ten by J. Anthony Furlane The Marquis and the Moon by Nicholas Longworth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
The Marquis and the Moon by Nicholas Longworth Chapter 1 Che sciocchezze! L'anima non esiste che in corpo sano, said the little Italian sculptor with a gesticulation. Altro, teatro mio, answered the tall German artist, who sat behind him, his great blond beard effective upon his black velvet coat. The anima does not exist at all, either in a well body or in an ill. And I doubt, my little friend, whether by l'anima you mean the spirit or the soul, a distinction made by the fool philosophers. Bah! Neither exists. This was in the dingy front room of the ancient Café Greco in Rome, where half a dozen artist friends of different nationalities sat around a little square table under the much-abused fresco of St. Mark's and the Grand Canal by Whitridge, pipes in their mouths and bottles of Castelli before them. "'Well, Fritz,' said an Englishman, I could tell by his face and figure that he was English. What do you mean by soul and spirit? I mean nothing, answered the Teuton. Or rather, I mean that they mean nothing, simply because there are no such things. They do not exist. It is the eye, my dear fellow, that sees. It is the ear that hears, the limbs that move. Not any intangible something behind them, which no one has yet ever been able to discover that does the seeing, hearing, and moving. What you call the spirit, soul, mind, or what you will, is but the harmony of a perfect mechanism, which straightway ceases to be when that perfection is destroyed. But spoke up a portrait painter from the other side of the table, has it not been through all time the almost unanimous testimony of mankind, the ignorant as well as the learned, that there is something in us beside the clay of which we are made? Who believes in the truth of the story of Pygmalion, that the mere perfection of form will of itself produce or create a soul? If this be true, it behooves us to be careful, Teodoro, lest some day your statues may take a notion to walk out of your studio and my portraits from their frames. All this time had been sitting at a neighboring table a little silent man, smoking a cigarette and sipping his black coffee and cognac, apparently paying the closest attention to the discussion of the artists. He was a man of slight and rather insignificant figure, respectably but by no means fashionably dressed, and with what I can best describe as a very intense expression of face. He might have been anywhere from thirty-five to fifty years of age, though his thick hair and the slight moustache which covered his thin upper lip were black as night. Over this latter a thin and very hooked nose hung, so closely it gave the impression that the two were fastened together and might be removed, such as clowns were in carnival time. But what struck me most of all, as I watched him from the other side of the room, where Count Piersanti and I were sitting, were his wonderful eyes. As he sat in the shadow, Intently watching the friendly disputants, they were, for all the world, like the eyes of a cat in semi-darkness. The light seemed to come out through them, from within, rather than to be a reflection from outside rays. My own eyes I could not take off him. I could not tell then, and cannot explain now, the peculiar fascination which this strange man had for me. Up to this time... His gaze had been fixed without turning upon the arguing artists, but now, for the first time, it wandered around the room to the corner where my friend and I sat. With the slightest glance of recognition, he nodded to Piersanti, who saluted him in return with effusive politeness almost universal among his countrymen. "'Who is that strange-looking man?' I asked. "'Don't you know him?' said he. That is the Marchese Carlo Mazza from Naples, a very eccentric fellow. He and I were friends as boys and went to school together. 
Then, for a time, he studied at the propaganda, was noted as a brilliant scholar, and at one time announced his intention of joining the Jesuit order. Suddenly, however, he threw up all his plans and returned to Naples, where he has since lived in utter seclusion. He comes here now, but at rare intervals, and, strange to say, repulses the advances of his old friends and schoolmates, and never recognizes anyone except with barely a nod of the head. He is sometimes seen by night about the fountain of Trevi, and they tell all manner of strange stories about him. The old women and the contadini believe him to be a wizard, though why, they cannot tell. There is certainly something uncanny in his appearance and actions, though, I think, the only trouble with poor Carlo is that his brain is unhinged and that he is no better or worse than a half-lunatic. I should not at least recommend him as a desirable acquaintance, although at one time he was a right good fellow. As if to give the lie to the Count's statement, the subject of our conversation arose from his seat and approaching us with a smile, more sweet and genial than I should have thought such a face capable of wearing, held out his hand and said, "'Why, my dear Pietro, I'm delighted to see you again. I hardly recognized you in the dim light of this room. Will not you introduce me to your American friend?' The Count shook him heartily with his left hand. I have omitted to say that Pier Santi's right arm was gone from the shoulder. From what cause I did not then know, and never had asked, he being very sensitive, concerning the mutilation or deformity. While making the request, those strange eyes and that sweet smile were fixed steadily upon me. He scarcely glanced at my companion. I could not explain the peculiar, the utterly indescribable effect they had upon me. How did he know that I was an American? Meanwhile, the discussion proceeded at the neighboring table. My friends, said the German artist, there can be nothing plainer than that thought is merely phosphorus. Fit the brain with phosphorus, and it will think. Stimulate it with opium or alcohol, and it will think in an entirely different way. Let someone strike the top of his head with a club, and it will cease to think at all. Bah, there is no such thing as thought, except it be the mere creaking of the machinery. Bah yourself, responded his English friend. There is no such thing as matter. The ancient philosophers from Aristotle down, except perhaps it be some of those de Epicureans, denied its existence, and all of your own German schools have joined them in proving irresistibly that your belief in the existence of matter or an outside world is but an illegitimate inference from the known existence of mind or soul. In fine, that the sum and substance of human knowledge is comprised in cogito ergo sum. Which one of those old fellows was it who said that the outward or ectypal world bears the same relation to the inward or archetypal world that shadow bears to substance? Our German friend yonder, said the Marchese, a slight sneer blending with his unchanging smile, seems to have been reading the Kraft und Stoff of his countryman, the illustrious Birchner. Is it not one of your English poets who makes a character say, What fools these mortals be? Though no admirer of Birchner, I could not help answering, still less a believer in his doctrines, I should hesitate long before calling him a fool. Will you pardon me, signore, if I ask what then your belief may be? I am as sure, replied I, of the existence of the soul, as I am of the existence of the body, and I believe that no possible proof can be given of the reality of the outward world, which cannot also be given of the real existence of the soul, and I do not think there is a child capable of understanding anything who may not understand this. My strange acquaintance smiled more sweetly than before, and courteously inclined his head. So far, caro signore, 
I am entirely with you, replied he, but I cannot by any means limit myself to one soul when it is manifest that each individual among us possesses fifty souls, or at least as many as the body possesses separate and distinct functions. With the death or destruction of one function of the body, the soul appertaining thereto perishes with it, or at least parts company with its fellow souls, who thereafter know it no more. This, I say, is capable not only of demonstration, but of ocular proof. What my friend the Count had said concerning the speaker's morbid mental condition now recurred to me. There was, however, in his expression, especially in his eyes, which grew more luminous as he spoke, and even in the tone of his voice, something that held me spellbound, and I could no more resist him than can the fluttering bird the charming snake. "'May I ask,' said I, "'what you mean by ocular proof?' If you will honor me with half an hour of your time, and walk with me as far as the fountain of Trevi, I will engage to furnish you with it. I deeply regret the impossibility, I answered, but the Count and myself are engaged to dine at the Molaro at seven, and it now lacks but ten minutes of that time. I will engage to bring you back at half past six. Half past six tomorrow morning would be rather late, laughed I. Pardon me, he said gravely. I refer to half past six this evening. I will bring you back twenty minutes ago. Count Piersanti looked very gravely at me and slightly shook his head. I then thought this action on his part had reference to his friend's supposed insanity, which at that time appeared to me beyond doubt. The Marchese rose, threw his long and somewhat threadbare black cloak about him, and, with his hat still in hand, and his eyes, which now looked more like stars than human organs of vision, said, "'Caro signore, will you go with me?' "'I could no more resist going than the magnetic needle can resist the pole.' We approached the door of exit. "'Are you not coming with us?' said my guide, turning toward Pier Santi, with his hand upon the latch. "'Not I, grazia,' the Count replied a strange expression on his face, almost like fear, and pointing with his left hand to the empty socket from which his right arm once hung. Not I. Buona notte, amici miei. Felice ritorno. We went out into the darkness of the narrow Via dei Condotti, thence across the noble Piazza di Spagna, glorious in the superb Italian moonlight, and then entered the cold shadows of the Via Due Machelle in the direction of the Fountain of Trevi. Chapter 2 Was anything more superb ever seen than that glorious moon shining from the clear Italian sky? It seemed ten times larger than I had ever seen it before. Its brilliant rays falling on the fountain changed all the moss-grown grotesque statues into figures of pure alabaster and the rushing cascade into a stream of molten silver. So intense were the rays of light, they seemed a solid stairway of gold, leading from the glittering basin up to their celestial source. Listen, I said, to yonder cascade and the splash of those tiny waves. They seem to be talking together in some unknown tongue. I am almost sure I heard a little mocking laugh just now. Could it have been a pixie or a kelpie? The Marchesa made no reply, but in another moment spoke with a little sarcasm in his laugh. I have heard that one of your countrymen claims to have invented a means of telegraphing messages along rays of light. Truly a poor and pitiful invention. I suppose, however, the only use to which the cold, dull rays of an American moon could be put. Here, however, under an Italian sky, by those skilled in the art, first taught by the priests of Iran, bodies, having considerable extension and weight, can be transmitted along the moon rays at the incredible rate of speed 
the motive power used being a preparation of green electricity in a highly concentrated form. And what may that be? said I. I will show you, answered my strange acquaintance, taking from his pocket a small vial which he held before me. It contained a pale green liquid, clear as crystal, which emitted a phosphorescent glow, just such as came from the eyes of him who held it. Would you like to try its effects? he said, smiling more strangely than ever. On my word, it is perfectly harmless. He took from his pocket a small silver cup, and, stooping, filled it with water from the sparkling basin. Into this he poured a small quantity of the glistening liquid and held it toward me. Just then we heard the sound of many feet, and a company of Bersaglieri came down the Via delle Stampierie on the double quick and crossed the square on the way to their barracks. Wait a moment until those animals have passed by, growled Matza. Up hobbled an old beggar woman and holding out her withered hand begged a soldo. Va via, canaia, hissed the Marchese in a towering rage. The crone, raising her eyes to his face, shivered from head to, to foot, and making the sign which avoids the evil eye, hurried away as fast as her feeble legs could carry her. Santa Vergine, muttered she, it is the stregone. We were alone, the piazza was silent and deserted, except by ourselves. The moon above shone with redoubled splendor. It was not quite at the full, though almost so. He again held the cup to me. But are you not also to drink? I asked. My own system, answered Matza, is so saturated and permeated with this divine fluid as to make it wholly unnecessary. Drink, and while doing so, keep your eyes fixed on mine. I drained the tiny cup. Instantly, I felt as though ten thousand little needles were pricking me gently, from crown to toe, and innumerable tiny sparks seemed scintillating from my body. Then a delicious, happy feeling came over me. I was light as air, able to do anything, and all doubts concerning Matza vanished from me. My faith in his power was complete. Now take my hand, he said, stepping upon the solid ray of light. I will help you up. Now recline yourself. It is soft as a couch of feathers. And the amo. As we shot upward, Rome lay at our feet, bathed in the divine rays upon which we were traveling. Trinita dei Monti, the Pincho, the Dome of St. Peter's, and towering Janiculum, with its white villas and the dark groves of the Villa Borghese, were glorified in its radiance. Thence, across the undulating Campania, we could see the beautiful Alban hills on the one hand, and on the other Civita Vecchia and the Silver Sea. A moment more, and all objects had become minute. Still, I could just discern the tiny Alps, the Atlas Range, and the glistening Mediterranean winding from the Pillars of Hercules to the Bosporus. Another instant, and all objects melted confusedly together into one shining golden ball, like another moon, though of infinitely greater size. We go slow, remarked my new acquaintance. Owing to the resistance of the Earth's atmosphere, we are about to leave it now. I fear you may suffer some inconvenience in passing through something over two hundred thousand miles of vacuum, but the journey will be accomplished in eighty seconds, so hold your breath, as I shall mine, and keep up a stout heart. I began to gasp for breath. We had left the air behind us. The time seemed endless. We were apparently stationary. I knew, however, this could not be so, and I vaguely remembered how, when once in a balloon, a windstorm striking us, the earth seemed to fly away beneath while the car remained stationary. I could bear it no more. I gasped convulsively once or twice and became unconscious. Chapter 3 I awoke outstretched upon a huge rock. 
Matze was chafing my temples. I opened my eyes and saw far above me an enormous golden crescent in the sky. Why, there is the moon, I cried. I thought I was in the moon. So you are, my dear fellow, he answered. Yonder planet is the earth. See how large it is and how luminous, although now but a thin crescent. I had supposed, said I, that the moon being full, the earth would be in shadow and invisible to us. So it would be, replied he, but you possibly remember that, as we watched this planet from the fountain, we observed that it was not quite at the full. This accounts for yonder thin crescent. I rubbed my eyes. My senses had completely returned. How is this? I exclaimed. Did I not faint for want of air? Yet here I am all right again, and there is no air surrounding the moon. A vulgar error, my dear sir, given currency by poor spyglass peepers, two hundred thousand miles away. True, the atmosphere here is much rarer and more subtle than the gross vapors which enfold our earth, but no less able to sustain animal life, indeed, more so. Even now, the more observant of those spy-glass men have seen reason to change their former opinion and to retract the ex-cathedra statements concerning which they were once so positive. Did not Monsieur Lanzaudet, when observing the total eclipse of the sun in 1860, discover that the horns of the solar crescent were truncated and rounded near the moon's limb? Is it not admitted by them all, moreover, that the apparent and visible diameter of the moon is two inches greater than its actual diameter? How, I ask you, can these things be accounted for, except upon the theory, which you now perceive to be the fact, that an atmosphere does surround the moon? This fact is openly acknowledged by Professor C. P. Boyle of New York, who maintains that the moon not only has a slight atmosphere, but that she also has water in the shape of small ponds, which for optical reasons are not always visible through the telescope, but have occasionally been seen by astronomers as bright sparkling points. As to this latter conclusion, he is in error. Is there then no water in the moon? I asked, not without apprehension. Plenty of it. Be not alarmed, amico mio, laughed Matza, seeing my troubled expression. It is, however, all below the surface. Listen. I placed my ear to the rock and distinctly heard the roar of a torrent far down below the surface. That, said my guide, is the mighty river Alf, the only lunar stream, the sound of whose waters inspired Coleridge, when he returned to earth, to pen those wondrous lines. In Xanadu did Kubna Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. Now turn your eyes to yonder sterile arid waste. That was once the plain and forest of Xanadu, more fertile and lovely than any vale upon earth. Yonder desolate peak and range of rock are Bullialdus. That, still further on, is Lubinieski. We stand on Tycho. Observe, beyond that second peak, two ridges or arcs of circles whose centers are not coincident and whose curvature is toward the north. These are glacial moraines and correctly pronounced to be such by the spyglass peepers. Now, how on earth do they, admitting the existence of these moraines, while denying to the moon both atmosphere and water, account for the departure of the vast glaciers or the water into which they must have melted? Without air it could not have evaporated. Did it flow away into space, into an absolute vacuum? and lose itself among the stars? Does not this, even to your untutored understanding, look very much like absurdity? No, my dear sir, it simply went below the surface, and now flows underground, just as the waters of the earth have begun to do. I remember once, reading an interesting treatise, written by one of your countrywomen, if I mistake not, 
upon the diminution of water upon the earth's surface, although I cannot perhaps agree in all its conclusions. Undoubtedly, after a time, the processes which have produced the results you see here will reduce the earth to the same condition, but not a drop of water will wander away into space. No created atom of matter ever did or ever shall cease to exist. The idea, my dear sir, is too absurd. Are you not yourself aware that near your own home, in the valley of Mill Creek, a river flows some hundreds of feet below the surface, which once watered the roots of trees along its beautiful course to join the then majestic Ohio? Great heavens! cried I, starting to my feet. Mysterious man, whoever or whatever you may be, what know you of my home or of that valley? The Marchese smiled, but made no answer. You may perhaps wonder, said he, how this subterranean river is supplied, in a world where rain never falls, and from which aqueous vapors never arise. Nothing can be more easy of explanation. The sunless sea of which Coleridge spoke, into which the Alf falls, is so far below the surface, and so near to the internal fires, which occupy the central portion of this globe, that its waters are converted into steam as fast as supplied. This steam, passing upward through the innumerable caverns of its rocky crust, is condensed again on approaching the surface, and appears in the form of countless brooks and springs, once more supplying the flood, which thus perennially flows onward to the lunar ocean. The process is, to all intents and purposes, the same as that which takes place by evaporation and condensation in an atmospheric medium by which yonder far-off planet, the Earth, is watered. But come, it is time we were going. Where? I asked. To the summit. I looked above. Towering over our heads for some thousand feet was an impassable, or what I took to be an impassable, wall of huge shapeless rocks. We can never climb there, I cried. Nothing more easy, believe me. And Matza lightly leaped into the air and stood upon a rock, thirty feet above me, laughing and holding out his hand. Come on. I braced myself for a supreme effort and leaped. To my utter surprise, I stood beside him upon the ragged mass of volcanic rock, feeling that I had exerted myself unnecessarily. What does this mean? I ask. Is it the effect of the green electricity, or is it the slight resistance of this attenuated atmosphere that renders such a feat possible? The effect of the electricity has passed away by this time, he replied. The other cause may have somewhat to do with it, but the real reason ought to have suggested itself to you. By the way, my dear sir, I find you much duller of comprehension than I had been led to suppose. Led to suppose? cried I. By whom? You have never seen me before tonight. The Marchesa smiled. Surely, said he, you must be aware that the moon is of very much smaller bulk and weight than the earth. I should think it ought to have suggested itself to you that the power or attraction of gravity would be less by the exact ratio of its weight. Oh, yes. Traveling here is easy enough, when up there at home, pointing to the gorgeous crescent in the sky, it is impossible. You say at home, Marchese. Which is your home, the earth or the moon? I pass much of my time in each, caro mio. Pier Santi is right when he says that I am only a half-lunatic. Let us go on. So we went on and up, until we stood breathless but not fatigued upon the dizzy edge of what seemed to be the crater of an extinct volcano. It was of vast extent, circular, or almost so in form. The surrounding walls were of precipitous black rock and some thousand feet in height. Below was a flat floor of smooth, white sand and pebbles, in the center of which arose a cone-shaped something, which I at first took to be the last work of the expiring volcano now extinct. I had seen in photographs of the moon, by Rutherford and others, 
and also through the larger telescopes such formations in most of the lunar craters, but of this one alone I can speak from actual observation near at hand. It was of the same form and about the same size as the Pyramid of Cheops, and as I observed it more closely, I clearly perceived it to be the work of human hands, and, unlike the pyramid, apparently erected at no distant day, and of perfectly polished black marble. That, said Matza, is the palace of the princess. What princess? Can we enter the palace? cried I. It was for that you were sent for, answered my strange guide. Forthwith I began to bound down the precipice, leaping from rock to rock like a mountain goat, having now learned how light I was. This time followed by my guide, instead of following him. In a few moments we stood at the base of the pyramid, before an enormous double gate of bronze, beside which hung a shield of some polished metal, and a huge hammer chained to the wall. Strike! I took the hammer, and whirling it around my head, struck the shield with my full strength. It emitted a rich, sweet musical sound, like that of the great bells in Chinese temples. Slowly the gates swung apart, disclosing a lofty, dimly lighted hall. Through this we passed and reached another door of hammered silver. This was covered with all manner of strange and, to me, undecipherable inscriptions and characters deeply cut into the metal. No shield hung before these doors, but as we approached, they slowly opened, and at the same time we heard the outer gates close behind us with a heavy clang. Awe-stricken, I entered the vast hall of the Princess of the Moon. Chapter 4 the hall was dimly illuminated by the earth light, which streamed in through many hundred narrow slits or loopholes cut through the great thickness of the walls, which I had not observed from without. So vast were its dimensions, and so faint the illumination, that I could but dimly discern the forms and faces of the innumerable silent throng that filled it. Nor indeed had I time or inclination to do so. All stretched away beyond the central point of light into blackness, a sea of heads and faces. That central point was a slightly raised dais, or platform, whereon was a chair of ivory. Behind this chair stood two tall, strange, motionless figures holding aloft torches, which gave out a wide, lambent light, making everything in their immediate neighborhood bright as day, but not penetrating far into the darkness of the vast hall. On either side of the chair stood a figure, Afrits, I think, such as I used to read of when a boy in the Arabian Nights. These were black, of great stature, and each held a double-handed sword, their blades gleaming blue in the torchlight. The floor was of beautifully polished tessellated marble, but in its center, about ten paces before the throne, yawned a black pit, perhaps ten feet in width, as though a portion of the foundation rock had lately given way, and carrying the pavement with it, fallen into the subterranean river, whose roaring could be faintly heard in the far depths below. Ah, how can I describe it? What hand could paint? What voice or pen portray the form that sat or half reclined in that ivory chair? The figure was slight, of exquisite grace and mould, clad in a clinging robe of some rich white web and a woof, but without ornament of any kind. Her tender cheek rested lightly upon her right hand, the delicate arm which supported it half showing through the rich drapery. Her left rested upon the arm of her chair. The torches above her head shone upon her dark hair, leaving the sweet and gentle face, almost a baby face in its sweetness and gentleness, in half shadow. One delicate foot rested upon a lion, carved from black marble, which served as her footstool. Her lips were parted as though to speak, and her dark eyes looked at me. Oh, those eyes, so deep and soft and tender, 
The reader must pardon my powerless pen. I only know, I cannot tell why, that, looking into their depths, I could have died for her. I felt Matthew's touch upon my shoulder. Advance and speak to the princess, but take care of that pit before you. I passed by the opening and dropped on one knee before her footstool. Arise, she said. These empty formalities have place only in the earth. They are unknown in the moon. Rise up and speak to me. Heaven, she spoke in my own dear native tongue, not in the bastard Latin of Rome, and, and great God, was not that voice strangely familiar to my ear? We poor mortals, stammered I. A smile came over that sweet face as she raised her finger to interrupt me. I am mortal like yourself, she said. Still more, I was born and lived upon the earth as you do. How or when I came hither, it matters not to say, and if I shall ever revisit my dear Terra, who can tell? It is long since I have seen it, and many of its ways and customs I have forgotten. Still more have doubtless changed. Tell me something of them. Tell me, is it still possible there to love at first sight? Sweet princess, I answered with difficulty restraining my earth-born instinct to drop again upon my knee. There is no other way but that. The so-called love which springs from acquaintance and knowledge of character is at best with us, but an exalted friendship, worth perhaps as much as love, many think worth more, not I. But it is not love. Real love bursts instantly into being, as its divine mother arose suddenly in her glory from the sea, and, like her, it is immortal. A soft smile, sad and tender, stole over that lovely face, she said. My servant has brought you hither to learn the true philosophy of life. Do you wish to learn the lesson? Perhaps, princess, I have learned it already. Did a faint tinge of color come into her cheek? I cannot be certain. The face was in half shadow. Have you courage, she asked, to go through the necessary ordeal? It may seem to you a frightful one. I have courage, sweet princess, to do anything and to go through anything you bid me. Nay, I do not bid you, she answered. It is for you to choose. I choose the ordeal, then, whatever it may be. She made a sign. The Afrit on her right approached and stood beside me. Raising his shining sword, he swung it three times around and, with a swift and sweeping stroke, severed my head from the shoulders. It fell to the floor and rolled to the prince's footstool. Strange as it may seem, I suffered no pain whatever. On the contrary, rather a languid sensation of dreamy pleasure. The power to think and reason remained strong and clear as before in my brain as it lay there in the dissevered head. I watched to see what would happen next. The gigantic Afrit again raised his sword. I observed that it was not bloody, and lopped off one arm, then another, one leg, and then another then flung the several members towards different quarters of the hall. Still, I felt no pain and saw no blood. Last he cleft my panting bosom and, drawing forth my heart, laid it with a deep reverence upon the prince's footstool and placed his delicate little foot upon it. I could see it palpitating under that light pressure. Then first I saw a few drops of blood. Mats advanced. Are you not now convinced, amico mio, of the truth of my psychological proposition? Is there not one soul that thinks in your brain over yonder, another loving and longing in the heart you see beating under a princess's foot? You can see from where you stand. I beg pardon, signore, from where you lie. Each separate soul in your several limbs, prompting them to writhe and crawl along the floor. Is it not so? I begin to think, replied I, that there may be some sense in what you say. 
I could only endeavor to articulate this. The motion of the lips was understood. The vocal organs were, for the time, useless. Enough, said the princess. She motioned the afrit on her left hand. He advanced, picked up the legs, and set the trunk upon them. They knit together instantly. He passed his hand over the gash in the breast. It closed and healed. Then he attached either arm. To my dismay, the body turned around and began to walk away. Stop, cried the princess. It continued to walk toward the door through which we had entered. Then it began to run. I became deeply, painfully interested. The afrit leaped forward and seized the body to bring it back. It resisted and struggled. I had been in my day a very muscular and active man, and from where I lay I watched with no small interest the struggle of my physical man with a gigantic afrit, spirit, demon, or whatever he might be. I was powerless in his grasp. He carried me back to where I lay. That is, he carried my body back to where my head lay. Then carefully, raising the latter, he placed it upon the severed neck. In an instant, I stood before the princess, sound and whole. Thank you, she said. Were you much terrified learning your lesson? Only a little, dear lady. What shall I do next? Ah, nothing more. You must go back to Italy now. Farewell. Her smile seemed sad, but inexpressibly tender and sweet. She bent slightly forward, half extending her hand, as though to permit me to kiss it. The Afrits stepped before her chair and interposed their swords, crossed between her and me. Involuntarily, I stepped back from those gleaming blades, too far. I made a desperate effort to regain my footing, and then, with a stifled cry, fell backward into the black chasm. Chapter 6 Down, 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 the rushing of waters came nearer, nearer, nearer. Then, with a dash and splash, I sank deep into the sacred river. Swift and strong, it carried me through its rocky chasms, down toward the sunless sea. No hope now, thought I. And yet, I cannot believe that she could send me thus to destruction. Then, to my astonishment, I found that I did not drown. Was the water air, or was I a fish? I breathed it with delight. It was more delicious and invigorating than atmosphere. It was warm and laved my limbs as though caressing them. Over cascades, through whirlpools, it carried me along. Laughing, I could not help myself, so great was the sensuous pleasure. How long this lasted, I cannot tell. Then I began to weary of the darkness and long for light. The wish had hardly formed itself when I perceived a dull grey light rapidly becoming paler. Then the current slackened, and at last, when I could see open sky above me, turned cold and ceased to flow. I could no longer breathe and began to choke. It was like earthly water now. I made a strong effort to rise to the light. Half drowned, raised my head above the surface, shook it, and looked around. I was standing waist-deep in the fountain of Trevi. On the margin stood Piersanti. Mio caro, cried he, what are you doing there? I don't know, I answered. What are you doing here? Immediately after you left the Café Greco, I determined to follow you and try to persuade you to have no more to do with my crazy schoolmate. It is not three minutes since. I ran all the way. I stepped ashore and shook the water from my dripping clothes. What time is it, Pier Santi? He looked at his watch, and his face became like ashes. Half past six. And I left the café at five minutes to seven. Something must be the matter with my watch. Just then the melodious bells of the Trinità dei Monti rang out half past six. I turned and looked aloft at the moon and kissed my hand. We reached the Molaro. The porter, gorgeous in gold braid, stood at the entrance door. 
She looked astonished at my dripping clothes, but, like a true Italian, was too polite to make any comment. "'By the way,' said I, addressing him, "'do you happen to know, for porters in Rome know everything, at what hotel the Marchese Carlo Mazza is staying?' "'Certainly, Excellency. He has been here for the last three days, but left this afternoon for Naples. I myself accompanied him to the station with his luggage and saw him safely off.' This, my dear Count, said I, may not be as wide as a barn door or as deep as a well, but it will do. It is too much for me. I feel a little cold. Will you allow me to change my wet clothes? I shall join you at dinner in twenty minutes. Certainly. Arrivederte. Chapter 7 Piersanti's face wore a troubled expression and he spoke little during dinner, but drank more wine than was his habit. When we had adjourned to the smoking-room for coffee, he said, "'My dear friend, I cannot tell how glad I am to see you returned here perfectly sound and well.' "'Why should I not be sound and well?' I asked. He leaned forward and whispered in my ear, "'This is in confidence, dear friend.' "'No one has yet returned from the journey you have just taken "'without leaving something behind him.' "'Then, in a lower whisper, "'that dear fiend who put me together "'forgot to give me my right arm, "'and in the confusion of the moment I failed to notice it. "'Santo diavolo! I shall never get it back. "'The English poet Coleridge left a portion of his brain. "'You are the only exception to this rule.' Not at all, Pietro. I have not returned by any means sound and whole. I left there the most important part of myself, my heart. Are you in earnest? Never more so in my life. Body of Bacchus, did you forget that? No. The Count started to his feet and pulled out his watch. Come, come. A train leaves at eight for Naples. We have just time to catch it. We may yet trace out that matzo. There is still a chance. Sit down, my dear boy, said I. Can't you see how those Englishmen are staring at you? Maledetta canaglia! They cannot understand us. These cigars are excellent, and the chartreuse is good. Have you ever been to the convent of the Carthusian monks who make it? It is near Florence. If you do not take this present chance, you will never recover your heart. Certainly not. The princess is in the moon. You can never see her again. Who knows? Your heart is lost forever. Undoubtedly. Yet you sit there as if you had no desire to regain it. None whatever. Well, said the excited Italian, resuming his seat, you Americans are the strangest race under the sun. Or under the moon, thought I. End of The Marquis and the Moon by Nicholas Longworth Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Richard Green Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley only a race as incredibly elastic as the Grom could have a single rule of war. Pid the pilot slowed the ship almost to a standstill and peered anxiously at the green planet below. Even without instruments, there was no mistaking it. Third from its sun, it was the only planet in this system capable of sustaining life. Peacefully, it swam beneath its gauze of clouds. It looked very innocent, and yet... Twenty previous Grom expeditions had set out to prepare this planet for invasion, and vanished utterly without a word. Pid hesitated only a moment before starting irrevocably down. There was no point in hovering and worrying. He and his two crewmen were as ready now as they ever would be. Their compact displacers were stored in body pouches, inactive but ready. Pid wanted to say something to his crew, but he wasn't sure how to put it. The crew waited. Ilg, the radio man, 
had sent the final message to the Grom planet. Gurr, the detector, read sixteen dials at once and reported, No sign of alien activity. His body surfaces flowed carelessly. Noticing the flow, Pid knew what to say to his crew. Ever since they had left Grom, shape discipline had been disgustingly lax. The invasion chief had warned him, but still, he had to do something about it. It was his duty, since lower castes such as radio men and detectors were notoriously prone to shapelessness. A lot of hopes are resting on this expedition, he began slowly. We're a long way from home now. Gurr the detector nodded. Ilg, the radio man, flowed out of his prescribed shape and molded himself comfortably to a wall. However, Pitt said sternly, distance is no excuse for promiscuous shapelessness. Ilg flowed hastily back into proper radio man's shape. Exotic forms will undoubtedly be called for, Pitt went on, and for that we have special dispensation. But remember... Any shape not assumed strictly in the line of duty is a foul, lawless device of the shapeless one. Gurr's body surface has abruptly stopped flowing. That's all, Pitt said, and flowed into his controls. The ship started down, so smoothly coordinated that Pid felt a glow of pride. They were good workers, he decided. He just couldn't expect them to be as shape-conscious as a high-caste pilot. Even the invasion chief had told him that. Pid, the invasion chief, had said in their last interview, We need this planet desperately. Yes, sir, Pid had said, standing at full attention, never quivering from optimum pilot shape. One of you, the chief said heavily, must get through and set up a displacer near an atomic power source. The army will be standing by at this end, ready to step through. We'll do it, sir, Pid said. This expedition has to succeed, the chief said and his features blurred momentarily from sheer fatigue. In strictest confidence, there is considerable unrest on Grom. The minor caste is on strike, for instance. They want a new digging shape. Say the old one is inefficient. Pid looked properly indignant. The mining shape had been set down by the ancients 50,000 years ago, together with the rest of the basic shapes. And now these upstarts wanted to change it. That's not all, the chief told him. We've uncovered a new cult of shapelessness. Picked up almost 8,000 grom, and I don't know how many more we missed. Pid knew that shapelessness was a lure of the shapeless one, the greatest evil that the grom mind could conceive of. But why, he wondered, did so many grom fall for his lures? The chief guessed his question. Pid, he said, I suppose it's difficult for you to understand. Do you enjoy piloting? Yes, sir, Pitt said simply. Enjoy piloting. It was his entire life. Without a ship, he was nothing. Not all Grom feel that way, the chief said. I don't understand it either. All of my ancestors have been invasion chiefs, back to the beginning of time. So, of course, I want to be an invasion chief. It's only natural, as well as lawful. But the lower castes don't feel that way. The chief shook his body sadly. I've told you this for a reason. We Grom need more room. This unrest is caused purely by crowding. All our psychologists say so. Another planet to expand into will cure everything. So we're counting on you, Pid. Yes, sir, Pid said with a glow of pride. The chief rose to end the interview. Then he changed his mind and sat down again. You'll have to watch your crew, he said. They're loyal, no doubt, but low caste. And you know the lower castes. Pid did indeed. Gur, your detector, is suspected of harboring alterationist tendencies. He was once fined for assuming a quasi-hunter shape. Ilg has never had any definite charge brought against him, but I hear that he remains immobile for suspiciously long periods of time. Possibly he fancies himself a thinker. But, sir, Pitt protested, if they are even slightly tainted with alterationism or shapelessness, why send them on this expedition? The chief hesitated before answering. There are plenty of Grom I could trust, he said slowly, but those two have certain qualities of 
resourcefulness and imagination that will be needed on this expedition. He sighed. I really don't understand why those qualities are usually linked with shapelessness. Yes, sir, Pid said. Just watch them. Yes, sir, Pid said again, and saluted, realizing that the interview was at an end. In his body pouch, he felt the dormant displacer ready to transform the enemy's power source into a bridge across space for the Grom hordes. Good luck, the chief said. I'm sure you'll need it. The ship dropped silently towards the surface of the enemy planet. Gur, the detector, analyzed the clouds below and fed data into the camouflage unit. The unit went to work. Soon the ship looked, to all outward appearances, like a cirrus formation. Pid allowed the ship to drift slowly towards the surface of the mystery planet. He was in optimum pilot shape now, the most efficient of the four shapes allotted to the pilot cast. Blind, deaf, and dumb, an extension of his controls, all his attention was directed towards matching the velocities of the high-flying clouds, staying among them, becoming part of them. Gur remained rigidly in one of the two shapes allotted to detectors. He fed data into the camouflage unit, and the descending ship slowly altered into an alto-cumulus. There was no sign of activity from the enemy planet. Ilg located an atomic power source and fed the data to Pid. The pilot altered course. He had reached the lowest level of clouds, barely a mile above the surface of the planet. Now his ship looked like a fat, fleecy cumulus. And still, there was no sign of alarm. The unknown fate that had overtaken twenty previous expeditions still had not showed itself. Dusk crept across the face of the planet as Pid maneuvered near the atomic power installation. He avoided the surrounding homes and hovered over a clump of woods. Darkness fell, and the green planet's lone moon was veiled in clouds. One cloud floated lower and landed. Quick, everyone out, Pid shouted, detaching himself from the ship's controls. He assumed the pilot's shape best suited for running and raced out the hatch. Gur and Ilg hurried after him. They stopped fifty yards from the ship and waited. Inside the ship, a little U-circuit closed. There was a silent shudder, and the ship began to melt. Plastic dissolved, metal crumpled. Soon the ship was a great pile of junk, and still the process went on. Big fragments broke into smaller fragments and split and split again. Pid felt suddenly helpless, watching his ship scuttle itself. He was a pilot of the pilot cast. His father had been a pilot, and his father before him, stretching back to the hazy past when the Grom had first constructed ships. He had spent his entire childhood around ships, his entire manhood flying them. Now, shipless, he was naked in an alien world. In a few minutes, there was only a mound of dust to show where the ship had been. The night wind scattered it through the forest, and then there was nothing at all. They waited. Nothing happened. The wind sighed and the trees creaked. Squirrels chirped and birds stirred in their nests. An acorn fell to the ground. Pid heaved a sigh of relief and sat down. The 21st Grom expedition had landed safely. There was nothing to be done until morning, so Pid began to make plans. They had landed as close to the atomic power installation as they dared. Now they would have to get closer. Somehow, one of them had to get very near the reactor room in order to activate the displacer. Difficult. But Pid felt certain of success. After all, the Grom were strong on ingenuity. Strong on ingenuity, he thought bitterly, but terribly short of radioactives. That was another reason why this expedition was so important. There was little radioactive fuel left on any of the Grom worlds. Ages ago, the Grom had spent their store of radioactives in spreading throughout their neighboring worlds, occupying the ones that they could live on. Now, colonization barely kept up with the mounting birth rate. New worlds were constantly needed. This particular world, discovered in a scouting expedition, was needed. It suited the Grom perfectly. But it was too far away. They didn't have enough fuel to mount a conquering space fleet. Luckily, there was another way. A better way. 
Over the centuries, the Grom scientists had developed the displacer, a triumph of identity engineering. The displacer allowed mass to be moved instantaneously between any two linked points. One end was set up at Grom's sole atomic energy plant. The other end had to be placed in proximity to another atomic power source and activated. Diverted power then flowed through both ends, was modified and modified again. Then, through the miracle of identity engineering, the Grom could step through from planet to planet, or pour through in a great overwhelming wave. It was quite simple. But twenty expeditions had failed to set up the Earth End Displacer. What had happened to them was not known for no Grom ship had ever returned to tell. Before dawn, they crept through the woods, taking on the coloration of the plants around them. Their displacers pulsed feebly, sensing the nearness of atomic energy. A tiny four-legged creature darted in front of them. Instantly, Gurr grew four legs in a long, streamlined body and gave chase. Gurr, come back here, Pid howled to the detector, throwing caution to the winds. Gurr overtook the animal and knocked it down. He tried to bite it, but he had neglected to grow teeth. The animal jumped free and vanished into the underbrush. Gurr thrust out a set of teeth and bunched his muscles for another leap. Gurr! Reluctantly, the detector turned away. He loped silently back to Pid. I was hungry, he said. You were not, Pid said sternly. Was, Gurr mumbled, writhing with embarrassment. Pid remembered what the chief had told him. Gurr certainly did have hunter tendencies. He would have to watch him more closely. We'll have no more of that, Pid said. Remember, the lure of exotic shapes is not sanctioned. Be content with the shape you were born to. Gurr nodded and melted back into the underbrush. They moved on. At the extreme edge of the woods, they could observe the atomic energy installation. Pid disguised himself as a clump of shrubbery, and Gurr formed himself into an old log. Ilg, after a moment's thought, became a young oak. The installation was in the form of a long, low building, surrounded by a metal fence. There was a gate and guards in front of it. The first job, Pid thought, was to get past that gate. He began to consider ways and means. From the fragmentary reports of the survey parties, Pid knew that, in some ways, this race of men were like the Grom. They had pets, as the Grom did, and homes and children and a culture. The inhabitants were skilled mechanically, as were the Grom. But there were terrific differences also. The men were of fixed and immutable form, like stones or trees. And to compensate, their planet boasted a fantastic array of species, types, and kinds— this was completely unlike Grom, which had only eight distinct forms of animal life. And evidently, the men were skilled at detecting invaders, Pid thought. He wished he knew how the other expeditions had failed. It would make his job much easier. A man lurched past them on two incredibly stiff legs. Rigidity was evident in his every move. Without looking, he hurried past. I know, Gurr said, after the creature had moved away. I'll disguise myself as a man, walk through the gate of the reactor room, and activate my displacer. You can't speak their language, Pid pointed out. I won't speak at all. I'll ignore them. Look, Gurr quickly shaped himself into a man. That's not bad, Pid said. Gurr tried a few practice steps, copying the bumpy walk of the man. But I'm afraid it won't work, Pid said. It's perfectly logical, Gurr pointed out. I know, therefore the other expeditions must have tried it, and none of them came back. There was no arguing that. Gurr flowed back into the shape of a log. What then, he asked. Let me think, Pid said. Another creature lurched past on four legs instead of two. Pid recognized it as a dog, a pet of man. He watched it carefully. The dog ambled to the gate, head down, in no particular hurry. It walked through, unchallenged, and lay down in the grass. Hmm, Pid said. They watched. One of the men walked past and touched the dog on the head. The dog stuck out its tongue and rolled over on its side. I can do that, Gurr said excitedly. He started to flow into the shape of a dog. No, wait, Pid said. We'll spend the rest of the day thinking it over. This is too important to rush into. 
Gurr subsided sulkily. Come on, let's move back, Pid said. He and Gurr started into the woods. Then he remembered Ilg. Ilg, he called softly. There was no answer. Ilg. What? Oh, yes, an oak tree said, and melted into a bush. Sorry, what were you saying? We're moving back, Pid said. Were you by any chance thinking? Uh, no, Ilg assured him, just resting. Pid let it go at that. There was too much else to worry about. They discussed it for the rest of the day, hidden in the deepest part of the woods. The only alternative seemed to be man or dog. A tree couldn't walk past the gate, since it was not in the nature of trees, nor could anything else and escape notice. Going as a man seemed too risky. They decided that Gurr would sally out in the morning as a dog. Now get some sleep, Pid said. Obediently, his two crewmen flattened out, going immediately shapeless. But Pid had a more difficult time. Everything looked too easy. Why wasn't the atomic installation better guarded? Certainly the men must have learned something from the expeditions they had captured in the past. Or had they killed them without asking any questions? You couldn't tell what an alien would do. Was that open gate a trap? Wearily he flowed into a comfortable position on the lumpy ground. Then he pulled himself together hastily. He had gone shapeless. Comfort was not in the line of duty, he reminded himself, and firmly took a pilot shape. But a pilot shape wasn't constructed for sleeping on damp, bumpy ground. Pid spent a restless night thinking of ships and wishing he were flying one. He awoke in the morning tired and ill-tempered. He nudged Gurr. Let's get this over with, he said. Gurr flowed gaily to his feet. Come on, Ilg, Pid said angrily, looking around. Wake up. There was no reply. Ilg, he called. Still, there was no reply. Help me look for him, Pid said to Gurr. He must be around here somewhere. Together they tested every bush, tree, log, and shrub in the vicinity, but none of them was Ilg. Pid began to feel a cold panic run through him. What could have happened to the radio man? Perhaps he decided to go through the gate on his own, Gurr suggested. Pid considered the possibility. It seemed unlikely. Ilk had never shown much initiative. He had always been content to follow orders. They waited. But midday came, and there was still no sign of Ilg. We can't wait any longer, Pid said, and they started through the woods. Pid wondered if Ilg had tried to get through the gates on his own. Those quiet types often concealed a foolhardy streak. But there was nothing to show that Ilg had been successful. He would have to assume that the radioman was dead or captured by the men. That left two of them to activate a displacer. And he still didn't know what had happened to the other expeditions. At the edge of the woods, Gurr turned himself into a facsimile of a dog. Pitt inspected him carefully. A little less tail, he said. Gurr shortened his tail. More ears. Gurr lengthened his ears. Now even them up. They became even. Pid inspected the finished product. As far as he could tell, Gurr was perfect from the tip of his tail to his wet black nose. Good luck, Pid said. Thanks. Cautiously, Gurr moved out of the woods walking in the lurching style of dogs and men. A at the gate, the guard called to him. Pid held his breath. Gurr walked past the man, ignoring him. The man started to walk over. Gurr broke into a run. Pid shaped a pair of strong legs for himself, ready to dash if Gurr was caught. But the guard turned back to his gate. Gurr stopped running immediately and strolled quietly towards the main door of the building. Pid dissolved his legs with a sigh of relief, and then tensed again. The main door was closed. Pid hoped the radioman wouldn't try to open it. That was not in the nature of dogs. As he watched, another dog came running toward Gurr. Gurr backed away from him. The dog approached and sniffed. Gurr sniffed back. Then both of them ran around the building. That was clever, Pid thought. There was bound to be a door in the rear. He glanced up at the afternoon sun. As soon as the displacer was activated, the Grom armies would begin to pour through. 
By the time the men recovered from the shock, a million or more Grom troops would be here, weapons and all, with more following. The day passed slowly, and nothing happened. Nervously, Pid watched the front of the plant. It shouldn't be taking so long if Gur was successful. Late into the night, he waited. Men walked in and out of the installation, and dogs barked around the gates, but Gur did not appear. Gur had failed. Ilg was gone. Only he was left, and still he didn't know what had happened. By morning, Pid was in complete despair. He knew that the 21st Grom expedition to this planet was near the point of complete failure. Now it was all up to him. He saw that workers were arriving in great number, rushing through the gates. He decided to take advantage of the apparent confusion and started to shape himself into a man. A dog walked past the woods where he was hiding. Hello, the dog said. It was Gurr. What happened? Pitt asked with a sigh of relief. Why were you so long? Couldn't you get in? I don't know, Gurr said, wagging his tail. I didn't try. Pid was speechless. I went hunting, Gurr said complacently. This form is ideal for hunting, you know. I went out the rear gate with another dog. But the expedition, your duty, I changed my mind, Gurr told him. You know, pilot, I never wanted to be a detector. But you were born a detector. That's true, Gurr said, but it doesn't help. I always wanted to be a hunter. Pid shook his entire body in annoyance. You can't, he said very slowly, as one would explain to a grumbling. The hunter shape is forbidden to you. Not here it isn't, Gurr said, still wagging his tail. Let's have no more of this, Pid said angrily. Get into that installation and set up your displacer. I'll try to overlook this heresy. No, Gurr said. I don't want the Grom here. They'd ruin it for the rest of us. He's right, a nearby oak tree said. Ilg, Pid gasped. Where are you? Branches stirred. I'm right here, Ilg said. I've been thinking. But you're cast. Pilot, Gurr said sadly, why don't you wake up? Most of the people on Grom are miserable. Only custom makes us take the cast shape of our ancestors. Pilot, Ilg said, all Grom are born shapeless. And being born shapeless, all Grom should have the freedom of shape, Gurr said. Exactly, Ilg said. But he'll never understand. Now excuse me, I want to think and the oak tree was silent. Pid laughed humorously. The men will kill you off, he said, just as they killed off all the other expeditions. No one from Grom has been killed, Gurr told him. The other expeditions are right here. Alive? Certainly. The men don't even know we exist. That dog I was hunting with is a Grom from the Twelfth Expedition. There are hundreds of us here, pilot. We like it. Pid tried to absorb it all. He'd always known that the lower castes were lax in caste consciousness, but this was preposterous. This planet's secret menace was freedom. Join us, pilot, Gurr said. We've got a paradise here. Do you know how many species there are on this planet? An uncountable number. There's a shape to suit every need. Pid ignored them. Traitors. He'd do the job all by himself. So men were unaware of the presence of Grom. Getting near the reactor might not be so difficult after all. The others had failed in their duty because they were of lower castes, weak and irresponsible. Even the pilots among them must be secretly sympathetic to the cult of shapelessness the chief had mentioned, or the alien planet could never have swayed them. What shape to assume for this attempt? Pid considered. A dog might be best. Evidently, dogs could wander pretty much where they wished. If something went wrong, Pid could change his shape to meet the occasion. The Supreme Council will take care of all of you, he snarled, and shaped himself into a small brown dog. I'm going to set up the displacer myself. He studied himself for a moment, bared his teeth at Gurr, and loped towards the gate. He loped for about ten feet and stopped in utter horror. 
The smells rushed at him from all directions, smells in a profusion and variety he had never dreamed existed, smells that were harsh, sweet, sharp, heavy, mysterious, overpowering, smells that terrified, alien and repulsive and inescapable. The odors of earth struck him like a blow. He curled his lips and held his breath. He ran on for a few steps and had to breathe again. He almost choked. He tried to remold his dog nostrils to be less sensitive. It didn't work. It wouldn't, so long as he kept the dog's shape. An attempt to modify his metabolism didn't work either. All this in the space of two or three seconds. He was rooted in his tracks, fighting the smells, wondering what to do. Then the noises hit him. They were a constant and staggering roar through which every tiniest whisper of sound stood out clearly and distinct. Sounds upon sounds, more noise than he had ever heard before at one time in his life. The woods behind him had suddenly become a madhouse. Utterly confused, he lost control and became shapeless. He half ran, half flowed into a nearby bush. There he reshaped, obliterating the offending dog ears and nostrils with vicious strokes of his thoughts. The dog shape was out, absolutely. Such appalling sharpness of senses might be fine for a hunter, such as Gurr. He probably gloried in them. But another moment of such impressions would have driven Pid the pilot mad. What now? He lay in the bush and thought about it, while gradually his mind threw off the last effects of the dizzying sensory assault. He looked at the gate. The men standing there evidently hadn't noticed his fiasco. They were looking in another direction. A man? Well, it was worth a try. Studying the men at the gate, Pid carefully shaped himself into a facsimile, a synthesis, actually, embodying one characteristic of that, another of this. He emerged from the side of the bush opposite the gate, on his hands and knees. He sniffed the air noting that the smells the man nostrils picked up weren't unpleasant at all. In fact, some of them were decidedly otherwise. It had just been the acuity of the dog nostrils, the number of smells they had detected, and the near brilliance with which they had done so, that had shocked him. Also, the sounds weren't half so devastating. Only relatively close sounds stood out. All else was an undetailed whispering. Evidently, Pid thought, it had been a long time since men had been hunters. He tested his legs, standing up and taking a few clumsy steps. Thud of foot on ground, dragged the other leg forward in a heavy arc, thud. Rocking from side to side, he marched back and forth behind the bush. His arms flapped as he sought balance, his head wobbled on its neck until he remembered to hold it up. Head up, eyes down, he missed... Seeing a small rock, his heel turned on it. He sat down hard. The ankle hurt. Pid curled his man lips and crawled back into the bush. The man's shape was too unspeakably clumsy. It was offensive to plod one step at a time, body held rigidly upright, arms wobbling. There had been a deluge of sense impressions in the dog shape, and there was a dull, stiff, half-alive inadequacy to the man shape. Besides, it was dangerous, now that Pid thought it over, as well as distasteful. He couldn't control it properly. It wouldn't look right. Someone might question him. There was too much about men he didn't, couldn't know. The planting of the displacer was too important a thing for him to fumble again. Only luck had kept him from being seen during the sensory onslaught. The displacer in his body pouch pulsed and tugged, urging him to be on his way towards the distant reactor room. Grimly, Pid let out the last breath he had taken with his man lungs and dissolved the lungs. What shape to take? Again, he studied the gate, the men standing beside it, the building beyond in which was the all-important reactor. A small shape was needed, a fast one, an unobtrusive one. He lay and thought. The bush rustled above him. A small brown shape had fluttered down to light on a twig. 
It hopped to another twig, twittering. Then it fluttered off in a flash and was gone. That, Pitt thought, was it. A sparrow that was not a sparrow rose from the bush a few moments later. An observer would have seen it circle the bush, diving, hedge-hopping, even looping, as if practicing all maneuvers possible to sparrows. Pid tensed his shoulder muscles, inclined his wings. He slipped off to the right, approached the bush at what seemed breakneck speed, though he knew this was only because of his small size. At the last second, he lifted his tail, not quite quickly enough. He swooped up and over the top of the bush, but his legs brushed the top leaves. His beak went down, and he stumbled in the air for a few feet, back, forward. He blinked beady eyes, as if at a challenge. Back towards the bush at a fine clip again, up and over, this time cleanly. He chose a tree, zoomed into its network of branches, wove a web of flight, working his way around and around the trunk, over and under branches that flashed before him, through crotches with no more than a feather's breath to spare. At last, he rested on a low branch and found himself chirping in delight. The tree extruded a feeler from the branch he sat on and touched his wings and tail. Interesting, said the tree. I'll have to try that shape sometime. Ilg, traitor, hissed Pid, growing a mouth in his chest to hiss it. And then he did something that caused Ilg to exclaim in outrage. Pid flew out of the woods, over the underbrush and across the open space towards the gate. This body would do the trick. This body would do anything. He rose, in a matter of a few sparrow heartbeats, to an altitude of a hundred feet. From here, the gate, the men, the building were small, sharp shapes against a green-brown mat. Pid found that he could see not only with unaccustomed clarity, but with a range of vision that astonished him. To right and to left he could see far into the hazy blue of the sky, and the higher he rose, the further he could see. He rose higher, the displacer pulsed, reminding him of the job he had to do. He stiffened his wings and glided regretfully, putting aside his desires to experiment with this wonderful shape, at least for the present. After he planted the displacer, he would go off by himself for a while and do it just a little more, somewhere where Ilg and Gur would not see him, before the Grom army arrived and the invasion began. He felt a tiny twinge of guilt as he circled. It was evil to want to keep this alien flying shape any longer than was absolutely necessary to the performance of his duty. It was a device of the shapeless one. But what had Ilg said? All Grom are born shapeless. It was true. Grom children were amorphous until old enough to be instructed in the cast shape of their ancestors. Maybe it wasn't too great a sin to alter your shape, then. Just once in a long while. After all, one must be fully aware of the nature of evil in order to meaningfully reject it. He had fallen lower in circling. The displacer pulse had strengthened. For some reason it irritated him. He drove higher on strong wings, circled again. Air rushed past him, a smooth, whispering flow pierced by his beak, streaming invisibly past his sharp eyes, moving along his body in tiny turbulences that moved his feathers against his skin. It occurred to him, or rather struck him with considerable force, that he was satisfying a longing of his pilot cast that went far deeper than piloting. He drove powerfully with his wings, felt tonus across his back, shot forward and up. He thought of the controls of his ship, he imagined flowing into them, becoming part of them, as he had so often done. And for the first time in his life, the thought failed to excite him. No machine could compare with this. What he would give to have wings of his own. Get from my sight, shapeless one. The displacer must be planted, activated. All Grom depended on him. He eyed the building far below. He would pass over it. The displacer would tell him which window to enter, which window was so near the reactor that he could do his job before the men even knew he was about. He started to drop lower. 
and the hawk struck. It had been above him. His first inkling of danger was the sharp pain of talons in his back and the stunning blow of a beak across his head. Dazed, he let his back go shapeless. His body substance flowed from the grasp of the talons. He dropped a dozen feet and resumed sparrow shape, hearing an astonished squawk from the attacker. He banked and looked up. The hawk was eyeing him. Talons spread again. The sharp beak gaped. The hawk swooped. Pid had to fight as a bird, naturally. He was four hundred feet above the ground. So he became an impossibly deadly bird. He grew to twice the size of the hawk. He grew a foot-long beak with a double razor's edge. He grew talons like six-inch scimitars. His eyes gleamed a red challenge. The hawk broke flight, squalling in alarm. Frantically, tail down and widespread, it thundered its wings and came to a dead stop six feet from Pid. Looking thoughtfully at Pid, it allowed itself to plummet. It fell a hundred feet, spread its wings, stretched its neck, and flew off so hastily that its wings became blurs. Pid saw no reason to pursue it. Then, after a moment, he did. He glided, keeping the hawk in sight, thoughts racing, feeling the newness, the power, the wonder of freedom of shape. Freedom. He did not want to give it up. The bird's shape was wondrous. He would experiment with it. Later he might tire of it for a time and assume another, a crawling or running shape or even a swimming one. The possibilities for excitement, for adventure, for fulfillment and simple sensual pleasures were endless. Freedom of shape was, obviously, now that you thought on it, the Grom birthright. And the caste system was artificial, obviously, a device for political and priestly benefit, obviously. Go away, shapeless one, this does not concern you. He rose to a thousand feet, two thousand, three. The displacer's pulse grew feebler and finally vanished. At four thousand feet, he released it and watched it spin downward, vanish into a cloud. Then he set out after the hawk, which was now only a dot on the horizon. He would find out how the hawk had broken flight as it had, skidded on the air. He wanted to do that too. There were so many things he wanted to learn about flying. In a week, he thought, he should be able to duplicate all the skill that millennia had evolved into birds. Then his new life would really begin. He became a torpedo shape with huge wings and sped after the hawk. End of Keep Your Shape by Robert Sheckley Recording by Richard Green www.richardgreenmagic.com The Venus Trap by Evelyn E. Smith This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What's the matter, darling? James asked anxiously. Don't you like the planet? Oh, I love the planet, Phyllis said. It's beautiful. It was. The blue, really blue grass, blue-violet shrubbery, and loveliest of all, the great golden tree with sapphire leaves and pale pink blossoms, instead of looking alien, resembled nothing so much as a fairy tale version of Earth. Even the fragrance that filled the atmosphere was completely delightful to terrestrial nostrils, which was unusual for most other planets, no matter how well adapted for colonization otherwise, tended, from the human viewpoint anyway, to stink. Not that they were not colonized, nevertheless— for the population of Earth was expanding at too great a rate to permit merely olfactory considerations to rule out an otherwise suitable planet. This particular group of settlers had been lucky, indeed, to have drawn a planet as pleasing to the nose as to the eye, and moreover free from hostile aborigines. As a matter of fact, the only apparent evidence of animate life were the small, bright-hued creatures winging back and forth through the clear air, and which resembled terrestrial birds so closely, there had seemed no point in giving them any other name. 
There were insects, too, although not immediately perceptible, but the ones like bees were devoid of stings, and the butterflies never had to pass through the grub stage but were born in the fullness of their beauty. However fairest of all creatures on the planet to James Hout, just then, anyhow, was his wife, and the expression on her face was not a lovely one. "'You do feel all right, don't you?' he asked. "'The light gravity gets some people at first. "'Yes, I guess I'm all right. I'm still a little shaken, though, and you know it's not the gravity.' He would have liked to take her in his arms and say something comforting, reassuring, but the constraint between them had not yet been worn off. Although he had sent her an ethergram nearly every day of the voyage, the necessary public nature of the messages had kept them from achieving communication in the deeper sense of the word. "'Well, I suppose you did have a bit of a shock,' he said lamely. "'Somehow I thought I had told you in my grams.' "'You told me plenty in the grams, but not quite enough, it seems.' Her words didn't seem to make sense. The strain had evidently been a little too much. "'Maybe you ought to go inside and lie down for a while.' "'I will, just as soon as I feel less wobbly.' She brushed back the long, light-brown hair, which had got tumbled when she fainted. He remembered a golden rather than a reddish tinge in it, but that had been under the yellow sun of earth. Under the scarlet sun of this planet, it took on a different beauty. "'How come the preliminary team didn't include it in their report?' she asked, avoiding his appreciative eye. "'They didn't know. We didn't find out ourselves until we'd sent that first message to Earth. I suppose by the time we did relay the news, you were on your way. Yes, that must have been it.' The preliminary exploration team had established the fact that the planet was more or less Earth-type— that its air was breathable, its temperature agreeably spring-like, its mineral composition very similar to Earth's, with only slight traces of unknown elements, that there was plenty of drinkable water and no threatening life-forms. Human beings could, therefore, live on it. It remained for the scout team to determine whether human beings would want to live on it, whether, in fact, they themselves would want to, because, if so, they had the option of becoming the first settlers— that was the way the system worked, and in the main it worked well enough. After less than two weeks, the scout team had beamed back to Earth the message that the planet was suitable for colonization. So suitable, they would like to give it the name of Elysium, if there was no objection. There would be none, Earth had replied, so long as the pioneers bore in mind that six other planets had previously been given that name, and a human colony currently existed on only one of those. No need to worry about a conflict of nomenclature, however, because the name of that other planet, Elysium, had subsequently been changed by unanimous vote of settlers to Hades. After this somewhat sinister piece of information, Earth had added the more cheerful news that the wives and families of the scouts would soon be on their way, bringing with them the tools and implements necessary to transform the wilderness of the frontier into another Earth. In the meantime, the men were to set up the packaged buildings with which all scout ships were equipped, so that when the women came, homes would be ready for them. The men set to work, and before the month was out, they discovered that Elysium was neither a wilderness nor a frontier. It was populated by an intelligent race, which had developed its culture to the limit of its physical abilities— actually well beyond the limit of what the astounded terrestrials could have conceived its physical abilities to be then, owing to unavoidable disaster, had started to die out. The remaining natives were perspicacious enough to see in the terrestrials coming not a threat, but a last hope of revivifying their own moribund species. Accordingly, the earthmen were encouraged to go ahead and build on the sites originally selected, the only ban being on the type of construction materials used, and a perfectly reasonable one under the circumstances. James had built his cottage near the largest, handsomest tree in the area allotted to him. Since there were no hostile life forms, there was no need for a closely knit community. Everyone who had seen it agreed that his house was the most attractive one of all, for, although it was only a standard prefab, he had used taste and ingenuity to make it a little different from the other unimaginative homes. And now Phyllis, for whom he had performed all this labor of love, for whom he had waited five long months, 
the tedium of which had been broken only by the intellectual pleasure of teaching English to a sympathetic native neighbor, Phyllis seemed unappreciative. She had hardly looked at the inside of the cottage when he had shown her through, and now she was staring at the outside in a blank sort of way. The indoctrination courses had not, he reflected, reconciled her to the frontiersman's necessarily simple mode of living— which was ironic, considering that one of her original attractions for him had been her apparent suitability for the pioneer life. She was a big girl, radiantly healthy, even though a little green at the moment. He just managed to keep his voice steady. You don't like the house, is that it? But I do like it, honestly I do, she touched his arm diffidently. Everything would be perfect if only— If only what? Is it the curtains? I'm sorry if you don't like them. I brought them all the way from Earth in case the planet turned out to be habitable. I thought blue was your favorite color. Oh, it is. It is. I'm mad about the curtains. Perhaps it wasn't the house that disappointed her. Perhaps it was he himself who hadn't lived up to the dim memory and ardent expectation. If you want to know what is bothering me, she glanced up apprehensively, lowering her voice as she did. It's that tree. It's stuck on you. I just know it is. He laughed. <laughs> Where did you get a preposterous idea like that, Phil? You've been on the planet exactly twenty-four hours, and, and I have in my luggage one hundred and thirty-two ethergrams talking about practically nothing but magnolia this, magnolia that. Oh, I had my suspicions even before I landed, James. The only thing I didn't suspect was that she was a tree— what are you talking about, honey? Magnolia and I were just friends. Purely a platonic relationship, I assure you, the tree herself agreed. It would have been silly for her to pretend not to have overheard, since the two were still standing almost directly underneath her. Purely platonic. She's more like a sister to me, James tried to explain. Phyllis stiffened. Frankly, if I had imagined I was going to have a tree for a sister-in-law, I would have thought before I married you, James. Bursting into tears, she ran inside the cottage. Sorry, he said miserably to Magnolia. It's a long trip out from Earth and an uncomfortable one. I don't suppose the other women were especially nice to her either. Faculty wives mostly, and you know how they are. Well, no, I don't suspect you would. But she shouldn't have acted that way toward you. Not your fault, Magnolia told him, sighing with such intensity that he could feel the humidity rise. I know how you've been looking forward to her arrival. Rather a letdown, isn't it? Oh, I'm sure it'll be all right, he tried to sound confident. And I know you'll like Phyllis when you get to know her. Possibly. But so far, I'm afraid I must admit, since there never has been any pretense between us, that she is a bit of a disappointment. I and my sisters also had expected your females when they came— to be as upright and true blue as you. Instead, what are they? Shrubs? The door to the cottage flew open. A shrub, am I? Phyllis brandished an axe, which Jane winced to recall was an item of equipment he'd ordered from Earth before the scout team had learned that the trees were intelligent. I'll shrub you! Phyllis! He wrested the axe from her grip. That would be murder! Woodsman, as the terrestrial poem goes, the tree remarked, spare that tree, touch not a single bow, in youth it sheltered me, and I'll protect it now. Good of her to take the whole thing so calmly, rather to pretend to take it so calmly, for he knew how sensitive Magnolia really was, but he was afraid this show of moral courage would not diminish Phyllis's dislike for her. Those without self-control seldom appreciate those who have it. If you'll excuse us, he said, putting his arm around his wife's heaving shoulders, I'd better see to Phyllis. She's a little upset. Hold over from space sickness, I expect. Poor girl, she's a long way from home and frightened. I understand, Jim, Magnolia told him. And remember, whatever happens, you can always count on me. I must say you're not a very... "'Admirable representative of terrestrial womanhood,' James snapped, as soon as the door had slammed behind him and his wife, leaving them alone together in the principal room of the cottage. "'Insulting the very first native you meet. 
I did not either insult her. All I said was, what beautiful flowers. Do you suppose the fruit is edible? How was I to know it? She could understand. Naturally, I wouldn't dream of eating her fruit now. It would probably taste nasty anyway. And how do you think I felt when a tree answered me back? You don't care that I fainted dead away, and I've never fainted before in my life. All you care about is that old vegetable's feelings. It was bad enough feeling for five months that someone had come between us. But to find out it wasn't someone but something— Phyllis, he said coldly, I'll thank you to keep a civil tongue in your head. Dropping into the overstuffed chair, his wife dabbed at her eyes with a handkerchief. She wasn't so very polite to me. Look, Phyllis, he strove to make his voice calm, adult, reasonable. You happen to have hit on a rather touchy point with her. Those trees are dioecious, you know, like us, and she isn't mated. And, well, she has rather a lot of xylem zones, rings, you know. Are you trying to tell me she's old? Well, she's no sapling any more. And, consideration aside, you know it's government's policy for us to establish good relations with any intelligent life form we have to share a planet with. You weren't in there, trying. Phyllis put away her handkerchief with what he hoped would be a final sniff. I suppose I shouldn't have acted that way, she conceded. Now you're talking like my own dear Phyllis, James said tenderly, though, as a matter of fact, he had a very remote idea of what his own dear Phyllis was like. He had met her only a couple of months before the scout mission was scheduled, and so their courtship had been brief, and the actual weeks of marriage even briefer. He had remembered Phyllis's beautiful— and she was beautiful. He had not, however, remembered her as pig-headed, and pig-headed she was, too. How come she hasn't a mate? I didn't think trees were choosy. He wouldn't take exception to that statement, uncharitable though it was. After all, someone whose only acquaintance with trees had been with the terrestrial variety would naturally be incapable of appreciating the total tree at its highest development. It's a great tragedy— he told her in hushed tone. There was a blight some years back, and most of the male trees died off, except for a few on the other side of the planet well out of bee-shot, even if the females there would let the females here have any pollen, which they absolutely won't. I don't blame them, Phyllis said coldly. Of course she would identify at once with the trees whose domestic lives seemed to be threatened. It's not that so much. It's that the male trees produce so little pollen— this would be a good place for people with hay fever, then, wouldn't it? And even when there is fruit, so much of it tends to be parthenocarpus, no seeds, he sighed. The entire race is dying out. How is it you know so much about botany? she asked suspiciously. It's not your field. I don't know so very much, really, he smiled. I had to learn a little if I wanted to work the land. So I borrowed an elementary text from Cutler. Had he been a trifle idealistic in quitting his snug, if uninspiring, job on the faculty to join in this utopian venture? So many of the other men at the university had enrolled, it had seemed a splendid idea, until Phyllis's arrival. Daddy never had any trouble working his land, and he doesn't know a thing about botany. You've been boning up on it just to please her. Phyllis, how can you jump to conclusions without a shred of evidence? Not that she wouldn't be able to collect such evidence later, because the allegation happened to be correct. If instead of coming to Elysium, I had merely gone to China, would she have thought it so odd that I studied Chinese? Then why, where the natives are trees, shouldn't I study botany? This woman is unreasonable. And will her people let you farm? Now he could show her how cogently and comprehensively he could answer a logical question. That aspect of the situation will be all right, dear, because only the trees are an intelligent species, and even of them some aren't so bright. They won't have any more objection to our eating the other fruit and vegetables than we would have to an extraterrestrial's eating our eggs and chickens, for example. We're going to try to introduce some earth plants here, though as the higher forms of vegetation are dying out, and we're afraid the lower might follow— Pity it's too late for a sound conservation program, Phyllis said grimly. She doesn't think it's too late for a sound conservation program. 
She still has hoped. Far-fetched, maybe, and I'm not so sure they are. Mark my word, James, she's got designs on you. Don't be idiotic, he protested. That would be... He attempted to introduce a light note. It would be miscegenation. These foreigners can't be expected to have our standards. And she burst into tears again. A fine thing to go through that miserable five-month trip only to find out a tree has alienated my husband's affections. <sighs> oh, come on, Phil. He was still trying for a smile. What would a tree see in me? I'm beginning to wonder what I saw in you. You never loved me. You just wanted a wife to come out and colonize with you and breed. What could he say? It was almost true. Phyllis was a beautiful girl, and he loved that, but if he had planned to remain as an instructor with the Romance Languages Department instead of joining the scout mission, he knew he would never have asked her to be his wife, for her sake, of course, as well as his own. He should say something to reassure her, but the words wouldn't come. I don't like it here, Phyllis sobbed. I don't like blue leaves. I don't like blue grass. I like them green the way they're supposed to be. I hate this nasty planet. It's all wrong. I want to go home. She was very young, less than eight years younger than he, true, but he was mature for his age. They didn't know each other very well. And finally, there were more men than women on the planet, and he had noticed that the bachelors had seemed readily disposed, upon her arrival the day before, to overlook the fact that she had no college degree. So he must be patient with her. There's nothing wrong about it, dear. The plants here synthesize cyanophyll instead of chlorophyll. That's why the leaves are blue instead of green. And, of course, there are different mineral constitutes of the soil, more aluminum and copper, for instance, than on Earth, and some elements we haven't quite isolated yet. So, you see, they're bound to be a little different from terrestrial trees— a little different, I wouldn't mind, she said sulkily. They're a lot different without being nearly alien enough. Look, Phyllis, dear, those trees have been very hospitable, very kind. We owe them a lot. They themselves suggested that we come here and live with them in, so to speak, symbiosis. That's a fine idea, he beamed. I knew you'd understand after I'd explained it to you. We provide the brains, and they provide the furniture. Phyllis, what a thing to say. I've heard of man-eating trees before. I suppose there could be man-loving ones, too. Phyllis, these trees are as gentle and sweet as... as... He didn't know how to, he could explain it to her. No one who had never been friends with a tree could appreciate the true beauty of the xylemic character. Why, we even offered to go over to the other side of the planet and fetch some pollen for them. But they wouldn't hear of it. Unfortunately, they'd rather die than be mated to anyone they had never met. What a perfectly disgusting idea. I don't think so. Trees can be idealistic. You fetching pollen for her, I mean. Naturally, she wouldn't want pollen from a tree on the other side of the planet. She wants you. Don't be silly. Incompatibility usually exists between the pollen of one species and the stigmata of another. Besides, he added patiently, I haven't got pollen. You better not, or it won't be her who will have the stigmata. Phyllis. He sat down on the arm of her chair and tried to embrace her. You know that you're the only life form I love. Please, James, she pushed him away. I guess I love you, too, in spite of everything. But I don't want to make a public spectacle of myself. What do you mean now? That tree would know everything that goes on. She's telepathic. Where did you get a ridiculous idea like that? What kind of rubbish have you been reading? All right, tell me, how else did she learn to speak such good English? It's because she's of a very high order of intelligence. And I suppose, <laughs> he laughed modestly, because I'm such a good teacher. I don't care how good a teacher you are. A tree couldn't learn to speak a language so well in five months. She must be telepathic. It's the only explanation. Give her time, the tree advised later as James came out on the lawn to talk to his only friend on the planet. He hadn't seen much of the other scouts since the house-building frenzy had started, and visits among the men had decreased. 
The base camp, where the bachelors and the older married couples lived, was located a good distance away from his land, for he had raised his honeymoon cottage far from the rest. He had wanted to have his Phyllis all to himself. In the idol he had visualized for the two of them, she would need no company but his. Little had he imagined that within twenty-four hours of her arrival he would be looking for company himself. "'I suppose so,' he said, kicking at a root. "'Oh, I'm sorry, Maggie, I didn't think.' "'That's all right,' Magnolia said bravely. "'It didn't really hurt. "'That female has got you all upset, you poor boy.' "'James muttered a feeble defense of his wife. "'Jim, forgive me if I speak frankly,' the tree went on in a low rustle. "'But do you think she's really worthy of you?' "'Of course she is.' "'Surely on your planet you could have found a maid more admirable, high-minded, exemplary, more, in short, like yourself. Or are all the human females inferior specimens like Phyllis? There, she suits me,' James said doggedly. "'Of course, of course, it's very noble of you to defend her. You would have disappointed me if you had said anything else, and I honor you for it, James.' He kicked at one of the pebbles. "'The tree meant well.' He knew, yet, like so many well-meaning friends, she succeeded only in dispiriting him. It was almost like being back at the faculty club. "'I don't suppose a clod like her would have brought any more books along,' the tree changed the subject. James' own library had been insufficient to slake the tree's intellectual thirst, so he had gone all over the planet to borrow books for Magnolia. Dr. Lakin, at base— who had formerly taught English literature, possessed a fine collection which he had been reluctant to lend until he had learned that they were not for James, but for a tree. At that he had fetched the books himself, since he was anxious to meet her. "'A lot of the trees here have learned the English language,' he had told James, "'but none seems to have developed a taste for its literature. Your magnolia is undoubtedly a superior specimen. Excellent natural taste, too.' perhaps a little unformed when it comes to poetry and the more sophisticated aspects of life, but she'll learn. She'll learn. Unfortunately, the same, James knew, could hardly be said of his wife. Phyllis did bring some books, he told Magnolia. For you, no doubt. That was kind of her. I'm sure she has many good qualities which will unfold one by one as her meristems start differentiating. I hope you don't feel I've been too, well, personal, Jim. I was only trying to help. If I've gone too far, of course not, Maggie, after all, he laughed bitterly. I do know you better than I know her. We have been good friends, haven't we, Jim? It was rather nice, those five months we spent alone together. For the first time in my life, I have never regretted being so far from my sisters. And this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Her blue leaves shone violet in the scarlet rays of the setting sun. The gold of her trunk was lit with red radiance. She was the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. But she was a tree, not a woman. "'I'm sure she'll fit in after a while,' Magnolia continued. "'Perhaps she isn't well. She seems to guttate an awful lot.' Do you suppose she's been overwatered? That wasn't gutation, James said heavily. It was tears. It means she's unhappy. Unhappy? Perhaps she won't fit in on this planet, in which case she should by all means go back to Earth. It's cruel and unfair to keep an intelligent, loosely speaking, life form anywhere against her will, don't you think? She'll be happy here, James vowed. I'll make her happy. Well... I certainly hope you can manage it. By the way, do you suppose you'll have a chance to read me the books she brought, or will she be keeping you too busy? I'll never be too busy to read to you, Magnolia. That's very nitrogenous of you, Jim. Our intellectual communions have meant a lot to me. I hate to have to give them up. So would I, he said. But there won't be any need to. Phyllis will understand. I certainly hope so. I so admire your English literature. It's so deeply cognizant of the really meaningful things in life. And if your coming to this planet has served only to add poetry to our cultural heritage, it would be reason enough to welcome you with open limbs. 
for it was a truly perceptive versifier who wrote the immortally simple lines, Poems are made by fools like me, but only God can make a tree. And such a charming tune to go with it, too, Magnolia went on. We have always sung the music that the wind and the rain have taught us, but until you came we never thought of putting words and music together to form a glorious whole. A tree that may in summer wear, she caroled in a pleasing contralto, a nest of robins in her hair. By the way, Jim, ever since reading that poem, I've been meaning to ask you precisely what are robins, and do you think they'd look well in my hair? I suppose the bard refers, in a somewhat pedestrian flight of fancy, to leaves. They're a kind of bird, he said drearily. Birds nesting in my hair. I wouldn't think of allowing it, but then I suppose terrestrial birds are quite different from ours. More housebroken, shall we say? Everything's different, James said, and for an irrational moment he hated everything that was blue, that should have been green, everything sweet, that should have been vicious, everything intelligent, that should have been mindless. Since matters could not grow much worse, they improved to a degree— after a day or two had passed, Phyllis, being a conscientious girl, came to realize how wrong it had been for her as a terrestrial immigrant to show overt hostility toward a native of the planet that had welcomed her. But how can she be a, a person, Phyllis wanted to know, when they were inside the cottage, for she had learned to hold her tongue when they were near Magnolia, or any of her sisters, who, though they could not speak the language as fluently as she, understood it very well and eavesdropped at every possible opportunity in order, they said, to improve their accents. She's a tree, a plant, and plants are just vegetables, she stabbed her needle energetically through the tablecloth she was embroidering. You mustn't project terrestrial attitudes upon Elysian ones, James said, patiently looking up from his books, and don't underestimate Maggie's capabilities. She has sense organs and motor organs, too. She can't move from where she is because she's rooted to the ground. But she's capable of turgor movements, like certain terrestrial forms of vegetation, for example, the sensitive plant or bluegrass. Bluegrass, Phyllis exclaimed. I'm sick of bluegrass. I want green grass. However, these trees have conscious control of their pulvini, whereas the Earth's plants don't, and so they can do a lot of things that Earth plants can't. It sounds like a dirty word to me. Polini merely means motor organs. Oh. He closed his book, which was a more advanced botany text covered with the jacket of a French novel in order to spare Phyllis's feelings. Darling, can't you get it through your pretty head that they're intelligent life forms? If it'll make it easier for you to think of them as human beings who happen to look like trees, then do that. That's exactly what I am doing and I'm quite sure she thinks of you as a tree who happens to look like a human being. Phyllis, sometimes I think you're being deliberately difficult. Do you know one of the reasons why I took such pains to teach Magnolia English? It was that I hoped she would be a companion for you, that you could talk to each other when I had to be away from home. Why do you call her Magnolia? She isn't a lot like one. Isn't she? I thought she was. You see... I don't know so much about botany after all. Actually, he had picked that name for the tree because it expressed both the arboreal and the feminine at the same time, and also because it was one of the loveliest names he knew. But he couldn't tell Phyllis that. There would be further misunderstanding. Of course she has a name in her own language, but I can't pronounce it. They have a language of their own, then. Naturally, though they don't get much chance to speak it since they've grown so few and so far apart that verbal communication has become difficult. They communicate by a network of roots that they've developed. I don't think that's so clever. I merely said, what's the use of trying to explain everything to you? You just don't want to understand. Phyllis put down her needlework and closed her eyes. James, she said, opening them again. It's no use pretending. I've been trying to be sympathetic and understanding, but I can't do it. That tree, I forced myself to be nice to her, but the more I see of her, the more convinced I am that she's trying to steal you from me. Phyllis was beginning to poison his mind, he thought, 
because it had seemed to him also in his last conversation with Magnolia that he had discerned a more than ordinary warmth in her attitude towards him, and perhaps a trace of spite towards his wife? Preposterous! The tree had only been trying to cheer him up as any friend might reasonably do. After all, a tree and a man. Nonsense! One had an anabolic metabolism, and one a catabolic. But this was a different kind of tree. She spoke, she read, she was capable of conscious turgor movements. And he, he had often thought secretly, was a different kind of man. Whereas Phyllis, but that was disloyalty. To the type as well as the individual. The tree could be a companion to him, but she could not give him sons to work his land. She could not give him daughters to populate his planet. Moreover, she did not, could not possibly know what human love meant, while Phyllis could at least learn. Look, dear, he said, sitting down beside his wife on the couch and taking her hand in his. She didn't draw away this time. Suppose that what you say is true. Not that it is, of course. Just because the tree has a crush on me doesn't mean I necessarily have a crush on her, does it? His wife looked up at him, her rose-red lips parted, her moss-gray eyes shining. Oh, if only I could believe that, James. Anyhow, she doesn't know what the whole thing's about, poor kid. Poor kid. Phyllis, you know you're prettier than any tree. That was not literally true, but reason was useless. He had to make his point in terms she could understand. And remember, she's got a lot of rings. She must be centuries old, while you are only nineteen. Twenty, Phyllis corrected. I had a birthday on the ship. Well, you certainly must allow me to wish you a happy birthday, darling. She was in his arms at last. He was about to kiss her, and the tree seemed very remote when she drew back. But are you sure she doesn't? She isn't? She can't be watching us? Darling, I swear it. Lady, by yonder blessed moon, I swear that tips with silver all these fruit tree tops. But he had sense enough not to say it aloud, and Elysium had not one blessed moon but three, and everything was all right, for a while, anyway. I see your wife is developing a corm, the tree remarked, as James paused for a chat. He hadn't much time to be sociable those days, for there was such a lot of work to be done, so many preparations to be made, so many things to be requisitioned from Earth. The supply ships were beginning to come now, bringing necessities and an occasional luxury for those who could afford it. She's pregnant, James explained. Happened before I left Earth. How do you mean? She's about to fruit. Didn't I read that zoology book to you? Yes, but, oh, James, it all seems so vulgar. To fruit without ever having bloomed? How squalid. Well, it all depends on how you look at it, he said. I... That is, we had hoped that when the baby came, you would be a godmother to it. You know what that is, don't you? Of course I do. You read Cinderella to me. I know it's a great honor, but I'm afraid I must decline. Why? I thought you were my... our friend. Jim, there is something I must confess. My feelings toward you are not merely those of a friend. Although Phyllis doesn't have too many rings of intellect... She is a female, so she knew all along. Magnolia's leaves rustled diffidently. I feel toward you the way I never felt toward any intelligent life form, but only toward the sun, the soil, the rain. I sense a tropism that seems to incline me towards you. In fact, I'm afraid, Jim, in your own terms, I love you. But you're a tree! You can't love me in my own terms, because trees can't love in the way people can. And, of course, people can't love like trees. We belong to two entirely different species, Maggie. You can't have listened to that zoology book very attentively. Our race is a singularly adaptable one, or we wouldn't have survived so long, Jim, or gone so far in our particular direction. It's lack of fertility, not lack of enterprise, that's responsible for our decline. And I think your species must be an adaptable one, too. You just haven't really tried. 
Oh, James, let us reverse the classical roles. Let me be the Apollo to your Daphne. Don't let Phyllis stand in our way. The Greek gods never let a little thing like marriage interfere with their plans. But I love Phyllis, he said in confusion. I love you too, he added, but in a different way. Yes, I know, more like a sister. However, I have plenty of sisters, and I don't need a brother. We're starting a conservation program, he tried to comfort her. We have every hope of getting some pollen from the other side of the planet once we have explained it to the trees there how far we can make a little go. And you've got to accept it. You mustn't be silly about it. It isn't the same thing, Jim, and you know it. One of the penalties of intelligence is a diffusiveness of the natural instincts. I would rather not fruit at all, then. Magnolia, you just don't understand. No matter how much you... Well, pursue me. I can never turn into a laurel tree. I didn't, or any kind of a tree. Look, some more books were just sent over from base. Magnolia gave a rueful rustle. Just were sent? Didn't they come over a month ago? James flushed. I know I haven't had a chance to do much reading to you in the last few weeks, Maggie. Or any at all, in fact. But I've been so busy. After the baby's born, things will be much less hectic and we'll be able to catch up. Of course, James, I understand. Naturally, your family comes first. One of the books that came was an advanced zoology text that might make things a little clearer. I should very much like to hear it, when you have the time to spare, that is. Tell you what, he said, I'll get the book and read you the chapter on the reproductive system in mammals. Won't take more than an hour or so. If you're in a hurry, I can wait. Nope. He told her this will make me feel a little less guilty about having neglected you. Whereupon the umbilical cord is severed, he concluded, and the human infant is ready to take its place in the world as a separate entity. Now do you understand, Magnolia? No, she said. Where do the bees come in? I thought you were in a hurry to get back to base, James, Phyllis remarked sweetly from the doorway, wiping her reddening hands on a dish towel. I am, dear. He slipped the book behind his back. It was possible that in her present state of mind, induced, of course, by her delicate condition, Phyllis might misunderstand his motive in reading that particular chapter of that particular book to that particular tree. I just stopped by for a chat with Magnolia. She's agreed to be godmother to the baby. How very nice of her. Earth government will be so pleased it's such a fine example of rapport with the natives. You might even get a medal. Wouldn't that be nice, James? She hurried on before he could speak. You still haven't found any green-leafed plants on the planet, have you? Have you looked everywhere? Have you looked hard? Haven't I told you time and time again, Mrs. Hout, the tree said, that there aren't any, that there can't be any. It's impossible to synthesize chlorophyll from the light rays given off by our sun. Only cyanophyll. What do you want with a green leaf plant anyway? Phyllis's voice broke. I think I'd lose my mind if I was convinced that I'd never see a green leaf again. All this awful blue, blue, blue all the time, and the leaves never fall, or if they do, there are new ones right away to take their place. They're always there, always blue. We're ever blue, Magnolia explained. Sorry, but that's the way it is. James? Jim, I hate to hurt your feelings, but I just have to take down those curtains. The colors, I can't stand it. Pregnant women sometimes get fanciful notion, James said to the tree. It's part of the pregnancy syndrome. Try not to pay any attention. Kindly don't explain me to a tree, Phyllis cried. I have a perfect right to prefer green, don't I? There is, as your proverb says, no accounting for strange tastes the tree murmured. However, we're going to have a formal christening, James interrupted, for the sake of peace. We thought we should, since ours be the first baby born on the planet. Everybody on Elysium will come, that is, all the human beings, only because they can come, you know. Uh, we'd love to have the trees that they were capable of locomotor movement. You'll get to widen your social contacts, Maggie. Dr. Lakin and Dr. Cutler will probably be here. I know you'll be glad to see Dr. Lakin again. And you've been anxious to meet Dr. Cutler. 
They've been asking after you, too. I think Dr. Lakin is planning to write a monograph on you for the Journal of American Association of Professors of English Literature, with your permission, of course. Christening. That's one of your native festivals, isn't it? It should be most interesting. That's right, Phyllis murmured. It will be Christmas soon. I'd almost forgotten. It'll be the first Christmas I've ever spent away from home. And there won't be any snow or anything. She started to guttate, to cry again. Cheer up, honey, Jim said. It won't be as bad as you think, because I didn't forget Christmas was coming. There is something specially nice for you on its way from Earth. I only hope it gets here on time, Phyllis sniffled. Maybe we'll have a Christmas party, too. Would you like that? But she remained unresponsive. He turned to the tree. Christening's entirely different, though, he explained. It's, I guess, naming the fruit would be the best way to describe it. Is that so? Magnolia said. What kind of fruit do you expect to have, Mrs. Hout? Oranges? Bananas? As your good St. Luke says, the tree is known by its fruit. You look as if yours might be a watermelon. Why, the idea, Phyllis choked. Are you going to stand there, James, and let that vegetable insult me? I'm sure she didn't mean to, he protested. She got confused by that zoology book I read her. The door slammed behind his weeping wife. I don't think you quite understand, Maggie, he said. In fact, sometimes I almost think you, too, don't want to understand. I know what kind of fruit it's going to be, the tree concluded triumphantly. Sour apples. Ouch! exclaimed Magnolia. That tickles. There's more to acting as a Christmas tree than I'd anticipated from your glowing descriptions, Jim. Here, dear, Phyllis said. Maybe you'd better let me put the decorations on her. You can't get on the ladder in your condition, he said, apprehensive not only for her welfare, but for the trees. Phyllis had not taken kindly to the idea of having Magnolia as official Christmas tree, suggesting that if she must participate in the ceremonies, it might be better in the capacity of Yule Log. However, James knew Magnolia would be offended if any other tree were chosen to be decorated. I'll manage all right, he assured his wife. If you want to be useful, you might put on some coffee and make sandwiches or something. The bachelors are coming over from base with that equipment that arrived yesterday, and they'll probably be glad of a snack before turning in. The coffee's already on and the canapes made, Phyllis smiled, and I've baked cookies, too, and whipped up a batch of penouche. What kind of Christmas party do you think it would be without refreshments? Very efficient, isn't she? Magnolia remarked as the battery-powered lights that James had affixed to her began to wink on, for the deep red-violet dusk had already fallen and the first moon was rising. Have you thought, Mrs. Hout, that if you fruit today it will save the expense of another festival? I don't expect to fruit for another two months, Phyllis said coldly, and why shouldn't we have another festival? We can afford it, and I like parties. I haven't been to one since the day I landed. Is the life out here getting a little quiet for you, Petiole? The tree asked solicitously. It must be hard when one has no intellectual resources upon which to draw. Phyllis held her peace for ten seconds then. I wonder where those boys can be, she said. I hope they'll bring some pickles along. I asked to have some scent, but I'm accustomed to having no attention paid to what I want. There's a surprise coming for you, Phyllis. James could not help telling her again, hoping to arouse some semblance of interest. Something I know you'll love, and for you too, he said courteously to Magnolia. You mean the same surprise for both, or a surprise apiece? the tree asked. Oh, one for each, of course. I see the lights of the copter now, Phyllis cried, and running out into the middle of the lawn, began waving her handkerchief. He hadn't seen her so pleasantly excited for a long time. I don't suppose I'll need to turn on the landing lights, he said to Magnolia. You should do the trick. Am I all finished? She rustled anxiously. I do wish I could see myself. How do I look? Splendid. I've never had as beautiful a Christmas tree as you, Maggie he told her with complete honesty, not even on earth. I'm glad, Jim, but I still wish I could be more to you than just a Christmas tree. Shh, the others might hear. For the helicopters had landed and the visitors were pouring out with shouts of admiration. Not only the bachelors had come 
and in full force, but some of the older men from base who apparently felt they could manage to do without their wives for twelve hours, even if those hours included Christmas Eve. He wondered where he and Phyllis could put them all, but some could sleep outside if need be, for it was never cold on Elysium. The winds were gentle and the rains light and fragrant. While the visitors were crowding around Phyllis in the tree, James rooted eagerly through the packages they had brought until he found what he wanted. Then he rushed over to the group. I know I should wait until tomorrow, but I want to give the girls their presents now. The other men smiled sympathetically, almost as joyful as he. Merry Christmas, Magnolia. He hoped Phyllis would understand that it was etiquette which dictated the alien life form should get her gift first. Thank you, the tree said. I'm deeply touched. I don't believe anyone ever gave me a present before. What is it? Liquid plant food. Vitamins and minerals, you know, for you to drink. What fun! She exclaimed in pretty excitement. Pour some over me right now. Not so fast, Jim boy. Dr. Cutler, the biologist, snatched the jug from James' hand. First, you all better let me take a sample of this here and stuff back to base to test on a lower life form so as I can make sure it won't do anything bad to Miss Magnolia. Might have iron in it, and I have a theory that iron may not be beneficial for the local vegetation. Oh, thank you, the tree wrestled. It's so very thoughtful of you, doctor, but I'm sure Jim would never give me anything that would injure me. I'm sure he isn't fixing to do a thing like that, ma'am, but he's no botanist. And for you, Phyllis, James handed his wife an awkward bundle to unwrap for herself. She tore the papers off slowly. Oh, Jim, darling, it's... You wanted a bit of green, so I ordered a plant from Earth. You like it? Oh, I hope you do. Oh, Jim. She embraced him and the pot simultaneously, more than anything. It won't stay green, Magnolia observed. Either it'll turn blue or it'll die. Puny-looking specimen, isn't it? Well, said James, it, it's only a youngster. I guess this Christmas is too early, but next Christmas there ought to be berries. It's a holly plant, Phil. Holly, she repeated, her voice shaking a little. Holly, she and Dr. Cutler exchanged glances. I told you, Miss Phyllis, ma'am. He may know first thing about botany, but he doesn't know anything after that. "'Jim,' Phyllis said, linking her free arm through his, "'I misjudged you. Dr. Cutler is right. You don't know so very much about botany after all.' He looked at her blankly. Her voice was trembling, and not with tears this time. "'I love this little plant. It's just what I wanted. But there aren't ever going to be any berries, because to have berries you have to have two plants, and the right two. Holly's di—di—it's just like us.' Oh, James said, feeling thoroughly inadequate, I'm sorry. Oh, but you mustn't be sorry. I'm going to plant it here on Elysium, and I hope it will stay green in spite of what she says, and it'll have blossoms anyway. And it was very, very sweet of you, dear. She kissed his cheek. Is this one a boy or a girl? Magnolia asked. You can't tell until it blooms, Miss Magnolia, ma'am, Dr. Cutler informed her. Maybe I can hand it up here, please. Phyllis paused for an irresolute moment, then, smilingly nervously at her guests, obliged. It's a boy, Magnolia announced after a minute. A boy. She gave back the pot reluctantly. Phyllis, she said, you and I have never been friends, and I admit that it's been my fault just as much as yours. As much as mine? Phyllis echoed. I like that and was going to go on where she obviously recollected that they had company and stopped. So I know it's presumptuous of me to ask for a favor. Yes, Magnolia, Phyllis said, her fine coarse silk eyebrows arched a trifle. What is this favor? When you plant the little fellow, you said you were going to anyhow, would you plant him near me? Phyllis looked down at the plant she held cradled in her arms and then up at the tree. "'Of course, Magnolia,' she said, frowning slightly. "'I didn't realize—' Her voice began to tremble. "'I have been pretty rotten, haven't I?' She looked toward James, but he turned his glance away. "'Just because you were a plant,' Phyllis continued, "'didn't mean that I had to be a beast. "'It must have been awful for you seeing me like this. 
practically crowing over you and knowing that you yourself would never have the chance to be a mother. Full many a flower is born to blush unseen, Magnolia said sadly, and waste its sweetness on the desert air. Phyllis was crying unashamedly now. I'll plant him right next to you, Maggie. I want you to have him. He can be your baby. Thank you, Phil, Maggie said softly. That's very blue of you. Although I think that's a Jim Dandy idea, the biologist said, and I'm sure wouldn't want to do anything to discourage it, being real interested in the results of an experiment like that my own self. I don't think you ought to feel so mean about it, Miss Phyllis. If all she wanted, begging your pardon, Miss Magnolia, ma'am, was a baby, why didn't she take an interest in the holly until she found out it was a male? Why wouldn't a little old girl holly have done as well? Why, are you scheming vegetable? Phyllis exploded at Magnolia, clutching the holly plant to her protective bosom. He's much too young for you, and I'm going to plant him far away where he can't possibly fall into your clutches. But now, Miss Phyllis, we all mustn't look at things out of their proper perspective. Then why did you take your hat off when you were introduced to Miss Magnolia Cutler? Dr. Lakin asked interestedly. Well, sir, where I come from, we respect femininity, whether it be animal, vegetable, or mineral. Nevertheless, we all got to remember, though Miss Magnolia is unquestionably a lady, she is not a woman. Phyllis began to laugh hysterically. <laughs> You're right, she gasped. I'd almost forgotten she was only a tree, and that it is only a little Christmas holly plant that's probably going to die anyway. They almost always do. That's cruel, Phyllis, James said, and you know it is. Do you really think I'm cruel? Are you going to tell the Society of the Prevention of Cruelty of Vegetables on me? But why am I cruel? I'm giving her the holly. That's what she wants, isn't it? Do you hear that, Miss Magnolia, ma'am? He's all yours. We'll plant him next to you right away. And I hope he doesn't die. I hope he grows up to make you a good husband. She's really quite remarkable, Dr. Lakin said to James later that same evening, after the planting ceremonies were over, and the rest of the party had gone into the cottage for fresh coffee and more sandwiches and cookie and penouche. Quite remarkable. You're a lucky man, Hout. Thank you, sir. "'James replied abstractedly. "'I'm sure Phyllis will be pleased, too. "'Phyllis! Oh, Mrs. Hout is a very remarkable woman, of course. "'A handsome, strong girl. "'She'll make a splendid mother, I'm sure. "'But I was referring to Miss Magnolia. "'She's a credit to you, my boy. "'If for no other reason, "'your name will go down in the history of our colony "'as that of the guide and mentor of Miss Magnolia. "'That's quite a tree you have there.' James looked at the dark form of the tree, for the lights had been turned out, silhouetted against the three pale moons in the violet night. "'Yes, she is,' he said. "'You're fortunate to be her neighbor and her friend.' "'Yes, I am. "'Well, I expect I'd better join the rest. "'Are you coming on in, Jim?' "'In a little while, sir. "'I thought I'd wanted to have a word with Magnolia. "'I won't be long.' "'Of course, of course. "'I'm delighted to see there is such an excellent relationship between you.' "'Good night, Miss Magnolia,' he called. "'Good night, Dr. Lakin,' the tree replied politely enough. But it was obvious that she was preoccupied with her new charge, who stood as close to her as it was possible to plant him and yet allow room for him to grow. The door closed. James walked across the lawn until he was quite near Magnolia. "'Maggie,' he whispered, reaching out to touch her trunk, smooth as it was, and hard, but he could feel the vibrant life pulsing inside it. Certainly she was not a plant, not just a plant, even though she was a tree. She was a native of Elysium, neither animal nor vegetable, unique unto the planet, unique unto herself. Maggie. Yes, Jim. Don't you think his silhouette is so graceful there in the moonlight? He isn't really puny, just frail. Maggie, you're not serious about this, Holly. What do you mean? And still he didn't have her full attention. Would he ever have it again? Serious about raising him to be your... your... Why not, Jim? It's impossible. Is it? It certainly is far more possible with him, isn't it? That much I understood from your zoology books. I suppose so. 
Besides, I have nothing to lose, have I? But even if it were possible, wouldn't it be humiliating for you? The creature's mindless. Magnolia's leaves rustled in the darkness. She was laughing a little bitterly. Your Phyllis isn't your intellectual equal, Jim, and yet you say you love her. And I suppose you do. Am I not entitled to my follies also? But she couldn't compare Phyllis to a holly plant. It was unreasonable. He may die, of course, Magnolia said. I've got to be prepared for that. The soil is different. The air is different. The sun is different. But the chances are, if he survives, he'll turn blue. And if he turns blue, who knows what other changes might be brought about? Maybe the plants on your earth aren't inherently mindless, Jim. Maybe they just didn't have a chance. Know ye the land where the cypress and myrtle are emblems of deeds that are done in their clime. That land isn't earth, Jim, so it might possibly be Elysium. Again, he didn't say anything. What he wanted to say, he had no right to say, so he kept silent. It'll be a chance for me, too, Jim. At least we're both plants, he and I. That gives us a head start. Yes, I suppose it does. Intellect doesn't count for much in the propagation of the species. Life goes on without regard for reason, and that's mainly what we're here for, to make sure that life goes on, if we're here for anything at all. Thanks to your kind, Jim, life will continue on this planet. It will certainly be your kind of life, and I hope it can be ours as well. Yes, he said, I hope so, too. And he did, but he wished it didn't have to continue in quite that way. Perhaps it was a trick of the three moons, but the hollies plantly seemed to have changed color. They were no longer green, but almost blue, powder blue. You'd best be getting on to your party, Jim, Magnolia said. You wouldn't want to be remiss in your duties as host. And please close the door gently when you go inside. The little holly plant's asleep. As he closed the door carefully behind him, he heard a burst of laughter coming from the kitchen, where the guests apparently had assembled. A raucous animal laughter, and rising shrill and noisy above it, Phyllis's company laugh. End of the Venus Trap by Evelyn E. Smith Read and recorded by Shelley Raffle Duel on Certus by Paul Anderson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Carcamo Duel on Certus by Paul Anderson The night whispered the message. Over the many miles of loneliness it was born, carried on the wind, rustled by the half-sentient lichens and the dwarf trees murmured from one to another of the little creatures that huddled under crags, in caves, by shadowy dunes. In no words, but in a dim pulsing of dread which echoed through Kriega's brain, the warning ran, They are hunting again. Kriega shuddered in a sudden blast of wind. The night was enormous around him, above him, from the iron bitterness of the hills to the wheeling, glittering constellations light years over his head, he reached out with his trembling perceptions, tuning himself to the brush and the wind and the small burrowing things underfoot, letting the night speak to him. Alone. Alone. There was not another Martian for a hundred miles of emptiness. There were only the tiny animals and the shivering brush and the thin, sad blowing of the wind. The voiceless scream of dying traveled through the brush, from plant to plant, echoed by the fear pulses of the animals and the ringingly reflecting cliffs. They were curling, shriveling and blackening as the rocket poured the glowing death down on them and the withering veins and nerves cried to the stars. 
Krieger huddled against a tall, gaunt crag. His eyes were like yellow moons in the darkness, cold with terror and hate and a slowly gathering resolution. Grimly, he estimated that the death was being sprayed in a circle some ten miles across, and he was trapped in it. And soon, the hunter would come after him. He looked up to the indifferent glitter of stars, and a shudder went along his body. Then he sat down and began to think. It had started a few days before, in the private office of the trader Wisby. I came to Mars, said Riordan, to get me an owlie. Wisby had learned the value of a poker face. He peered across the rim of his glass at the other man, estimating him. Even in godforsaken holes like Port Armstrong, one had heard of Riordan. Heir to a million-dollar shipping firm which he himself had pyramided into a system-wide monster. He was equally well known as a big-game hunter, from the fire drakes of Mercury to the ice crawlers of Pluto. He'd bag them all. Except, of course, a Martian. That particular game was forbidden now. He sprawled in his chair, big and strong and ruthless, still a young man. He dwarfed the unkempt room with his size and the hard-held dynamo strength in him, and his cold, green gaze dominated the traitor. It's illegal, you know, said Wisby. It's a twenty-year sentence if you're caught at it. Bah, the Martian commissioner is at Ares, halfway round the planet. If we go at it right, who's ever to know? Riordan gulped at his drink. I'm well aware that in another year or so, they'll have tightened up enough to make it impossible. This is the last chance for any man to get an owlie. That's why I'm here. Wisby hesitated, looking out the window. Port Armstrong was no more than a dusty huddle of domes interconnected by tunnels, in a red waste of sand stretching to the near horizon. An earthman in an airsuit and transparent helmet was walking down the street, and a couple of Martians were lounging against a wall. Otherwise, nothing. A silent, deadly monotony brooding under the shrunken sun. Life on Mars was not especially pleasant for a human. You're not falling into this owly loving that's corrupted all Earth, demanded Riordan contemptuously. Oh, no, said Wisby. I keep them in their place around my post. But times are changing. It can't be helped. There was a time when they were slaves, said Riordan. Now those old women on Earth want to give them the vote, he snorted. Well, times are changing, repeated Wisby mildly. When the first humans landed on Mars a hundred years ago, Earth had just gone through the hemispheric wars, the worst wars a man had ever known. They damned near wrecked the old ideas of liberty and equality. People were suspicious and tough. They had to be, to survive. They weren't able to... to empathize the Martians. Or whatever you call it. Not able to think of them as anything but intelligent animals. And Martians made such useful slaves. They need so little food or heat or oxygen. They can even live fifteen minutes or so without breathing at all. And the wild Martians made a fine sport. Intelligent game that could get away as often as not, or even manage to kill the hunter. I know, said Riordan. That's why I want to hunt one. It's no fun if the game doesn't have a chance. It's different now, went on Wisby. Earth has been at peace for a long time. The liberals have gotten the upper hand. Naturally, one of their first reforms was to end Martian slavery. Riordan swore, 
The forced repatriation of Martians working on his spaceships had cost him plenty. I haven't time for your philosophizing, he said. If you can arrange for me to get a Martian, I'll make it worth your while. How much worth it? asked Wisby. They haggled for a while before settling on a figure. Riordan had brought guns in a small rocket boat, but Wisby would have to supply radioactive material, a hawk, and a rock hound. Then he had to be paid for the risk of legal action, though that was small. The final price came high. Now, where do I get my Martian? inquired Riordan. He gestured at the two in the street. Catch one of them and release him in the desert? It was Wisby's turn to be contemptuous. One of them? Ha! Town loungers. A city dweller from Earth would give you a better fight. The Martians didn't look impressive. They stood only some four feet high on skinny, claw-footed legs. And the arms, ending in bony four-fingered hands, were stringy. The chests were broad and deep, but the waists were ridiculously narrow. They were viviparous, warm-blooded, and suckled their young, but gray feathers covered their hides. The round, hook-beaked heads with huge amber eyes and tufted feather ears showed the origin of the name Owly. They wore only pouched belts and carried sheath knives. Even the liberals of Earth weren't ready to allow the natives modern tools and weapons. There were too many old grudges. The Martians always were good fighters, said Riordan. They wiped out quite a few Earth settlements in the old days. The wild ones, agreed Wisby, but not these. They're just stupid laborers, as dependent on our civilization as we are. You want a real old timer, and I know where one's to be found. He spread a map on the desk. See? Here in the Hrefnian Hills, about a hundred miles from here. These Martians live a long time, maybe two centuries. And this fellow Kriga has been around since the first Earthmen came. He led a lot of Martian raids in the early days. But since the general amnesty and peace, he's lived all alone up there, in one of the old ruined towers. A real old-time warrior who hates Earthmen's guts. He comes here once in a while with furs and minerals to trade, so I know a little about him. Wisby's eyes gleamed savagely. You'll be doing us all a favor by shooting the arrogant bastard. He struts around here as if the place belonged to him. And he'll give you a run for your money. Riordan's massive dark head nodded in satisfaction. The man had a bird and a rock hound. That was bad. Without them, Kriga could lose himself in the labyrinth of caves and canyons and scrubby thickets. But the hound could follow his scent, and the bird could spot him from above. To make matters worse, the man had landed near Kriega's tower. The weapons were all there. Now, he was cut off, unarmed and alone save for what feeble help the desert life could give, unless he could double back to the place somehow. But meanwhile, he had to survive. He sat in a cave, looking down past a tortured wilderness of sand and bush and wind-carved rock miles in the thin, clear air to the glitter of metal where the rocket lay. The man was a tiny speck in the huge, barren landscape, a lonely insect crawling under the deep blue sky. Even by day, the stars glistened in the tenuous atmosphere. Weak, pallid sunlight spilled over rocks, tawny and ochreous and rust-red over the low, dusty thorn bushes and the gnarled little trees and the sand that blew faintly between them. Equatorial Mars. Lonely or not, the man had a gun that could spang death clear to the horizon. And he had his beasts. 
and there would be a radio in the rocket boat for calling his fellows. And the glowing death ringed them in, a charmed circle which Krieger could not cross without bringing a worse death on himself than the rifle would give. Or was there a worse death than that? To be shot by a monster and have his stuffed hide carried back as a trophy for fools to gape at. The old iron pride of his race rose in Krieger, hard and bitter and unrelenting. He didn't ask much of life these days. Solitude in his tower to think the long thoughts of a Martian and create the small exquisite artworks which he loved. The company of his kind at the gathering season. Grave ancient ceremony and acrid merriment and the chance to beget and rear sons. An occasional trip to the earthling settling for the metal goods and the wine, which were the only valuable things they had brought to Mars. A vague dream of raising his folk to a place where they could stand as equals before all the universe. No more. And now? They would take even this from him. He rasped a curse on the human and resumed his patient work, chipping a spearhead for what puny help it could give him. The brush rustled dryly in alarm. Tiny, hidden animals squeaked their terror. The desert shouted to him of the monster that strode toward his cave. But he didn't have to flee right away. Riordan sprayed the heavy metal isotope in a ten-mile circle around the old tower. He did that by night, just in case patrol craft might be snooping around. But once he had landed, he was safe. He could always claim to be peacefully exploring, hunting leapers or some such thing. The radioactive had a half-life of about four days, which meant that it would be unsafe to approach for some three weeks, two at the minimum. That was time enough, when the Martian was boxed in so small an area. There was no danger that he would try to cross it. The Owlies had learned what radioactivity meant back when they fought the humans. And their vision, extending well into ultraviolet, made it directly visible to them through its fluorescence, to say nothing of the holy, unhuman extra senses they had. No. Krieger would try to hide. And perhaps to fight. And eventually... He'd be cornered. Still, there was no use taking chances. Riordan set a timer on the boat's radio. If he didn't come back within two weeks to turn it off, it would emit a signal which Wisby would hear, and he'd be rescued. He checked his other equipment. He had an air suit designed for Martian conditions, with a small pump operated by a power beam from the boat to compress the atmosphere sufficiently for him to breathe it. The same unit recovered enough water from his breath, so that the weight of supplies for several days was, in Martian gravity, not too great for him to bear. He had a forty-five rifle built to shoot in Martian air. That was heavy enough for his purposes. And, of course, compass and binoculars and sleeping bag. Pretty light equipment, but he preferred a minimum anyway. For ultimate emergencies, there was a little tank of suspensine. By turning a valve, he could release it into his air system. The gas didn't exactly induce suspended animation, but it paralyzed efferent nerves and slowed the overall metabolism to a point where a man could live for weeks on one lungful of air. It was useful in surgery and had saved the life of more than one interplanetary explorer whose oxygen system went awry, but Riordan didn't expect to have to use it. He certainly hoped he wouldn't. It would be tedious to lie fully conscious for days waiting for the automatic signal to call Wisby. He stepped out of the boat and locked it. No danger that the Owly would break in if he should double back. It would take Tordenite to crack that hole. He whistled to his animals. They were native beasts, long ago domesticated by the Martians and later by man. The rockhound was like a gaunt wolf, but huge-breasted and feathered, a tracker as good as any terrestrial bloodhound. 
The hawk had less resemblance to its counterpart of earth. It was a bird of prey, but in the tenuous atmosphere it needed a six-foot wing spread to lift its small body. Riordan was pleased with their training. The hound bayed, a low, quavering note which would have been muffled almost to inaudibility by the thin air and the man's plastic helmet had the suit not included microphones and amplifiers. It circled, sniffing, while the hawk rose into the alien sky. Riordan did not look closely at the tower. It was a crumbling stump atop a rusty hill, unhuman and grotesque. Once, perhaps ten thousand years ago, the Martians had had a civilization of sorts, cities and agriculture and a Neolithic technology. But according to their own traditions, they had achieved a union or symbiosis with the wildlife of the planet and had abandoned such mechanical aids as unnecessary. Riordan snorted. The hound bayed again. The noise seemed to hang eerily in the still, cold air, to shiver from cliff and crag and die reluctantly under the enormous silence. But it was a bugle call, a haughty challenge to a world grown old. Stand aside, make way. Here comes the conqueror. The animal suddenly loped forward. He had a scent. Riordan swung into a long, easy, low-gravity stride. His eyes gleamed like green ice. The hunt was begun. Breath sobbed in Krieger's lungs, hard and quick and raw. His legs felt weak and heavy, and the thudding of his heart seemed to shake his whole body. Still he ran, while the frightful clamor rose behind him and the padding of feet grew ever nearer. Leaping, twisting, bounding from crag to crag, sliding down shaly ravines and slipping through clumps of trees, Krieger fled. The hound was behind him, and the hawk soaring overhead. In a day and a night, they had driven him to this, running like a crazed leaper with death baying at his heels. He had not imagined that a human could move so fast or with such endurance. The desert fought for him. The plants with their queer, blind life that no earthling would ever understand were on his side. Their thorny branches twisted away as he darted through, and then came back to rake the flanks of the hound, slow him but they could not stop his brutal rush. He ripped past their strengthless, clutching fingers and yammered on the trail of the Martian. The human was toiling a good mile behind, but showed no sign of tiring. Still, Krieger ran. He had to reach the cliff edge before the hunter saw him through his rifle sights. Had to. Had to, and the hound was snarling a yard behind now. Up the long slope he went. The hawk fluttered, striking at him, seeking to lay beak and talons in his head. He batted at the creature with his spear and dodged around a tree. The tree snaked out a branch from which the hound rebounded, yelling till the rocks rang. The Martian burst onto the edge of the cliff. It fell sheer to the canyon floor, five hundred feet of iron streak rock tumbling into windy depths. Beyond... The lowering sun glared in his eyes. He paused only an instant, etched black against the sky, a perfect shot if the human should come into view. And then he sprang over the edge. He had hoped the rockhound would go shooting past, but the animal braked itself barely in time. Krieger went down the cliff face, clawing into every tiny crevice, shuddering as the age-worn rock crumbled under his fingers. The hawk swept close, hacking at him and screaming for its master. He couldn't fight it, not with every finger and toe needed to hang against shattering death, but he slid along the face of the precipice into a gray-green glump of vines. His nerves thrilled forth the appeal of the ancient symbiosis. The hawk swooped again, and he lay unmoving, rigid as if dead, until it cried in shrill triumph 
and settled on his shoulder to pluck out his eyes. Then the vines stirred. They weren't strong, but their thorns sank into the flesh, and it couldn't pull loose. Kriga toiled on down into the canyon, while the vines pulled the hawk apart. Riordan loomed hugely against the darkening sky. He fired once, twice, the bullets humming wickedly close. But as shadows swept up from the depths, the Martian was covered. The man turned up his speech amplifier, and his voice rolled and boomed monstrously through the gathering night. Thunder, such as dry Mars had not heard for millennia. Score one for you. But it isn't enough. I'll find you. The sun slipped below the horizon, and night came down like a falling curtain. Through the darkness, Krieger heard the man laughing. The old rocks trembled with his laughter. Riordan was tired with the long chase and the niggling insufficiency of his oxygen supply. He wanted a smoke and hot food, and neither was to be had. Now oh well. He'd appreciate the luxuries of life all the more when he got home. With the Martian skin. He grinned as he made camp. The little fellow was a worthwhile quarry, that was for damn sure. He'd held out for two days now, in a little ten-mile circle of ground. And he'd even killed the hawk. But Riordan was close enough to him now so that the hound could follow his spoor. For Mars had no watercourses to break a trail, so it didn't matter. He lay watching the splendid night of stars. It would get cold before long, unmercifully cold. But his sleeping bag was a good enough insulator to keep him warm with the help of solar energy stored during the day by its gurgan cells. Mars was dark at night, its moons of little help. Phobos a hurtling speck. Deimos, merely a bright star. Dark and cold and empty. The rockhound had burrowed into the loose sand nearby, but it would raise the alarm if the Martian should come sneaking near the camp. Not that that was likely. He'd have to find shelter somewhere, too, if he didn't want to freeze. The bushes and the trees and the little furtive animals whispered a word he could not hear, chattered and gossiped on the wind about the Martian who kept himself warm with work. But he didn't understand that language which was no language. Drowsily, Riordan thought of past hunts. The big game of Earth. Lion and tiger and elephant and buffalo and sheep on the high sun-blazing peaks of the Rockies. Rainforests of Venus and the coughing roar of many-legged swamp monster crashing through the trees to the place where he stood waiting. Primitive throb of drums in a hot, wet night. Chant of beaters dancing around a fire, scramble along the hell plains of Mercury, with a swollen sun licking against his puny, insulating suit. The grandeur and desolation of Neptune's liquid gas swamps, and the huge blind thing that screamed and blundered after him. But this was the loneliest and strangest and perhaps most dangerous hunt of all, and on that account, the best. He had no malice towards the Martian. He respected the little being's courage, as he respected the bravery of the other animals he had fought. Whatever trophy he brought home from this chase would be well earned. The fact that his success would have to be treated discreetly didn't matter. He hunted less for the glory of it, though he had to admit he didn't mind the publicity, than for love. His ancestors had fought under one name or another. Viking, crusader, mercenary, rebel, patriot, whatever was fashionable at the moment. Struggle was in his blood. And in these degenerate days, there was little to struggle against, save what he hunted. Well, tomorrow, he drifted off to sleep. He woke in the short, gray dawn made a quick breakfast, and whistled his hound to heel. His nostrils dilated with excitement, 
a high keen drunkenness that sang wonderfully within him. Today, maybe today. They had to take a roundabout way down into the canyon, and the hound cast about for an hour before he picked up the scent. Then the deep-voiced cry rose again, and they were off, more slowly now, for it was a cruel stony trail. The sun climbed high as they worked along the ancient riverbed. Its pale chill light washed needle-sharp crags and fantastically painted cliffs, shale and sand, and the wreck of geological ages. The low, harsh brush crunched under the man's feet, writhing and crackling its impotent protest. Otherwise, it was still. A deep and taut and somehow waiting stillness. The hound shattered the quiet with an eager yelp and plunged forward. Hot scent! Riordan dashed after him, trampling through the dense bush, panting and swearing and grinning with excitement. Suddenly the brush opened underfoot. With a howl of dismay, the hound slid down the sloping wall of the pit it had covered. Riordan flung himself forward with tigerish swiftness, flat down on his belly with one hand barely catching the animal's tail. The shock almost pulled him into the hole, too. He wrapped one arm around a bush that clawed at his helmet and pulled the hound back. Shaking, he peered into the trap. It had been well made, about twenty feet deep, with walls as straight and narrow as the sand would allow, and skillfully covered with brush. Planted in the bottom were three wicked-looking flint spears. Had he been a shade less quick with his reactions, he would have lost the hound, and perhaps himself. He skinned his teeth in a wolf grin and looked around. The Owley must have worked all night on it. Then he couldn't be far away, and he'd be tired. As if to answer his thoughts, a boulder crashed down from the nearer cliff wall. It was a monster, but a falling object on Mars had less than half the acceleration it does on Earth. Riordan scrambled aside as it boomed onto the place where he had been lying. Come on, he yelled and plunged towards the cliff. For an instant, a gray form loomed over the edge, hurled a spear at him. Riordan snapped a shot at it, and it vanished. The spear glanced off the tough fabric of his suit, and he scrambled up a narrow ledge to the top of the precipice. The Martian was nowhere in sight, but a faint red trail led into the rugged hill country. Winged him, by God! The hound was slower in negotiating the shale-covered trail. His own feet were bleeding when he came up. Riordan cursed him, and they set out again. They followed the trail for a mile or two, and then it ended. Riordan looked around the wilderness of trees and needles which blocked view in any direction. Obviously, the Owley had backtracked and climbed up one of those rocks, from which he could take a flying leap to some other point. But which one? Sweat? which he couldn't wipe off, ran down the man's face and body. He itched intolerably, and his lungs were raw from gasping at his dole of air. But still he laughed in gusty delight. What a chase! What a chase! Kriega lay in the shadow of a tall rock and shuddered with weariness. Beyond the shade, the sunlight danced in what to him was a blinding, intolerable dazzle, hot and cruel and life-hungry, hard and bright as the metal of the conquerors. It had been a mistake to spend priceless hours when he might have been resting working on that trap. It hadn't worked, and he might have known that it wouldn't, and now he was hungry, and thirst was like a wild beast in his mouth and throat. And still they followed him. They weren't far behind now. All this day they had been dogging him. He had never been more than a half an hour ahead. No rest. No rest. A devil's hunt through a tormented wilderness of stone and sand, and now he could only wait for the battle with an iron burden of exhaustion laid on him. The wound in his side burned. It wasn't deep, 
but it had cost him blood and pain, and the few minutes of catnapping he might have snatched. For a moment the warrior Kriega was gone, and a lonely, frightened infant sobbed in the desert silence. Why can't they leave me alone? A low, dusty green bush rustled. A sand runner piped in one of the ravines. They were getting close. Wearily, Kriega scrambled up on top of the rock and crouched low. He had backtracked to it. They should by rights go past him toward his tower. He could only see it from here. A low yellow ruin worn by the winds of millennia. There had only been time to dart in, snatch a bow and a few arrows and an axe. Pitiful weapons. The arrow could not penetrate the Earthman's suit when there was only a Martian's thin grasp to draw the bow. And even with a steel head, the axe was a small and feeble thing. But it was all he had. He and his few little allies of a desert which fought only to keep its solitude. Repatriated slaves had told him of the Earthlings' power. Their roaring machines filled the silence of their own deserts, gouged the quiet face of their own moon, shook the planet with a senseless fury of meaningless energy. They were the conquerors, and it never occurred to them that an ancient peace and stillness could be worth preserving. Well, he fitted an arrow to the string and crouched in the silent, flimmering sunlight, waiting. The hound came first, yelping and howling. Kriega drew the bow as far as he could, but the human had to come near first. There he came, running and bounding over the rocks, rifle in hand and restless eyes shining with taut green light. Closing in for the death, Kriega swung softly around. The beast was beyond the rock now, the earthman almost below it. The bow twanged. With a savage thrill, Kriega saw the arrow go through the hound, saw the creature leap in the air and then roll over and over, howling and biting at the thing in its breast. Like a gray thunderbolt, the Martian launched himself off the rock, down at the human. If his axe could shatter the helmet, he struck the man and they went down together. Wildly, the Martian hewed. The axe glanced off the plastic. He hadn't had room for a swing. Riordan roared and lashed out with a fist, retching. Kriega rolled backward. Riordan snapped a shot at him. Kriega turned and fled. The man got to one knee, siding carefully on the gray form that streaked up the nearest slope. A little sand snake darted up the man's leg and wrapped about his wrist. Its small strength was just enough to pull the gun aside. The bullet screamed past Kriega's ear as he vanished into a cleft. He felt the thin death agony of the snake as the man pulled it loose and crushed it underfoot. Somewhat later, he heard a dull boom echoing between the hills. The man had gotten explosives from his boat and blown up the tower. He had lost axe and bow. Now he was utterly weaponless, without even a place to retire for a last stand. And the hunter would not give up. Even without his animals, he would follow. More slowly, but as relentlessly as before. Kriega collapsed on a shelf of rock. Dry sobbing racked his thin body. And the sunset wind cried with him. Presently he looked up across a red and yellow immensity to the low sun. Long shadows were creeping over the land, peace and stillness for a brief moment before the iron cold of night closed down. Somewhere, the soft trill of a sand runner echoed between low, wind-worn cliffs, and the brush began to speak, whispering back and forth in its ancient, wordless tongue. The desert, the planet and its wind, and sand under the high cold stars, the clean open land of silence and loneliness and destiny which was not man's, spoke to him. The enormous oneness of life on Mars, drawn together against the cruel environment stirred in his blood, 
as the sun went down and the stars blossomed forth in an awesome frosty glory, Kriega began to think again. He did not hate his persecutor, but the grimness of Mars was in him. He fought the war of all which was old and primitive and lost in its own dreams against the alien and the desecrator. It was as ancient and pitiless as life, that war, and each battle won or lost meant something, even if no one ever heard of it. You do not fight alone, whispered the desert. You fight for all of Mars, and we are with you. Something moved in the darkness, a tiny, warm form running across his hand a little feathered mouse-like thing that burrowed under the sand and lived its small fugitive life and was glad in its own way of living. But it was a part of a world, and Mars has no pity in its voice. Still, a tenderness was within Kriega's heart, and he whispered gently in the language that was not a language, You will do this for us. You will do it, little brother. Riordan was too tired to sleep well. He had lain awake for a long time, thinking. And that is not good for a man alone in the Martian hills. So now the rock hound was dead, too. It didn't matter. The owlie wouldn't escape. But somehow the incident had brought home to him the immensity and the age and the loneliness of the desert. It whispered to him. The brush rustled and something wailed in the darkness, and the wind blew a wild, mournful sound over faintly starlit cliffs, and it was as if they all somehow had a voice, as if the whole world muttered and threatened him in the night. Dimly, he wondered if man would ever subdue Mars if the human race had not finally run across something bigger than itself. But that was nonsense. Mars was old and worn out and barren, dreaming itself into slow death. The tramp of human feet, shouts of men, and roar of sky-storming rockets were waking it, but to a new destiny, to man's. When Ares lifted its hard spires above the hills of Sirtis, where, then, were the ancient gods of Mars? It was cold, and the cold deepened as the night wore on. The stars were fire and ice, glittering diamonds in the deep crystal dark. Now and then, he could hear a faint snapping borne through the earth as rock or tree split open. The wind laid itself to rest. Sound froze to death. There was only the hard, clear starlight falling through space to shatter on the ground. Once, something stirred. He woke from a restless sleep and saw a small thing skittering toward him. He groped for the rifle beside his sleeping bag, then laughed harshly. It was only a sand mouse. But it proved that the Martian had no chance of sneaking up on him while he rested. He didn't laugh again. The sound had echoed too hollowly in his helmet. With the clear, bitter dawn, he was up. He wanted to get the hunt over with. He was dirty and unshaven inside the unit. Sick of iron rations pushed through the airlock. Stiff and sore with exertion. Lacking the hound, which he'd had to shoot, tracking would be slow. But he didn't want to go back to Port Armstrong for another. No. Hell take that Martian. He'd have that devil's skin soon. Breakfast and a little moving made him feel better. He looked with practiced eye for the Martian's trail. There was sand and brush over everything. Even the rocks had a thin coating of their own erosion. The Owly couldn't cover his tracks perfectly. If he tried, it would slow him too much. Riordan fell into a steady jog. Noon found him on higher ground, rough hills with gaunt needles of rock reaching yards into the sky. He kept going, confident in his own ability to wear down the quarry. 
he'd run deer to earth back home. Day after day until the animal's heart broke, and it waited quivering for him to come. The trail looked clear and fresh now. He tensed with the knowledge that the Martian couldn't be far away. Too clear. Could this be bait for another trap? He hefted the rifle and proceeded more warily. But no, there wouldn't have been time. He mounted a high ridge and looked over the grim, fantastic landscape. Near the horizon, he saw a blackened strip, the border of his radioactive barrier. The Martian couldn't go further, and if he doubled back, Riordan would have an excellent chance of spotting him. He tuned up his speaker and let his voice roar into the stillness. Come out, Owly. I'm going to get you. You might as well come out now and be done with it. The echoes took it up, flying back and forth between the naked crags, trembling and shivering under the brassy arch of sky. Come out. Come out. Come out. The Martian seemed to appear from thin air, a gray ghost rising out of the jumbled stones and standing poised not twenty feet away. For an instant, the shock of it was too much. Riordan gaped in disbelief. Kriega waited, quivering ever so faintly as if he were a mirage. The man shouted and lifted his rifle. Still the Martian stood there as if carved in gray stone, and with a shock of disappointment, Riordan thought that he had, after all, decided to give himself to an inevitable death. Well, it had been a good hunt. So long, whispered Riordan, and squeezed the trigger. Since the sand mouse had crawled into the barrel, the gun exploded. Riordan heard the roar and saw the barrel peel open like a rotten banana. He wasn't hurt, but as he staggered back from the shock, Kriega lunged at him. The Martian was four feet tall and skinny and weaponless, but he hit the earthling like a small tornado. His legs wrapped around the man's waist and his hands got to work on the air hose. Riordan went down under the impact. He snarled tigerishly and fastened his hands on the Martian's narrow throat. Briga snapped futilely at him with his beak. They rolled over in a cloud of dust. The brush began to chatter excitedly. Riordan tried to break Kriega's neck. The Martian twisted away. Bored in again. With a shock of horror, the man heard the hiss of escaping air as Kriega's beak and fingers finally worried the air hose loose. An automatic valve clamped shut but there was no connection with the pump now. Riordan cursed and got his hands about the Martian's throat again. He simply lay there, squeezing, and not all Kriega's writhing and twistings could break that grip. Riordan smiled sleepily and held his hands in place. After five minutes or so, Kriega was still. Riordan kept right on throttling him for another five minutes just to make sure. Then he let go and fumbled at his back, trying to reach the pump. The air in his suit was hot and foul. He couldn't quite reach around to connect the hose to the pump. Poor design, he thought vaguely. But then, these air suits weren't meant for battle armor. He looked at the slight, silent form of the Martian. A faint breeze ruffled the gray feathers. What a fighter the little guy had been. He'd be the pride of the trophy room back on Earth. Let's see now. He unrolled his sleeping bag and spread it carefully out. He'd never make it to the rocket with what air he had, so it was necessary to let the suspense scene into his suit. But he'd have to get inside the bag, lest the knights freeze his blood solid. He crawled in, fastening the flaps carefully, and opened the valve on the suspense scene tank. Luckily he had it, but then, a good hunter thinks of everything. He'd get awfully bored lying here till Wisby caught the signal in ten days or so and came to find him. But he'd last. It would be an experience to remember. In this dry air, 
the Martian skin would keep perfectly well. He felt the paralysis creep up on him, the waning of heartbeat and lung action. His senses and mind were still alive, and he grew aware that complete relaxation had its unpleasant aspects. Oh well, he'd won. He'd killed the wiliest game with his own hands. Presently, Kriega sat up. He felt himself gingerly. There seemed to be a rib broken. Well, that could be fixed. He was still alive. He'd been choked for a good ten minutes, but a Martian can last fifteen without air. He opened the sleeping bag and got Riordan's keys. Then he limped slowly back to the rocket. A day or two of experimentation taught him how to fly it. He'd go to his kinsmen near Sirtis. Now that they had an earthly machine and earthly weapons to copy. But there was other business first. He didn't hate Riordan. But Mars is a hard world. He went back and dragged the Earthling into a cave and hid him beyond all possibility of human search parties finding him. For a while, he looked into the man's eyes. Horror stared dumbly back at him. He spoke slowly, in halting English. For those you killed, and for being a stranger on a world that does not want you, and against the day... When Mars is free, I leave you. Before departing, he got several oxygen tanks from the boat and hooked them into the man's air supply. There was quite a bit of air for one in suspended animation. Enough to keep him alive for a thousand years. End of Duel on Certus by Paul Anderson Recording by Sam Carcamo Nothing But the Best by Alan Cogan This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman If he took the high road, and also the low road, he'd be in the same place afore himself. Nothing But the Best by Alan Cogan Charles Meade stood on top of Hobson's Hill and stared at the town below, as though trying to imprint a permanent impression of the view on his memory. He paid particular attention to a wood and corrugated iron construction at the bottom of the hill by the railroad tracks, which bore a sign, Finley's Lumber Company. Well concealed in the bushes behind him, and humming mutely, were four black metal boxes, forming a small square. Antennae sprouted from each box, curving upward to form an arch in which the light seemed to vibrate and shimmer. Charles Meade made an adjustment on one of the boxes, then stepped quickly into the shimmering arch. Darkness smothered him immediately. There was a sudden, terrifying sensation of weightlessness, of falling. He kept pushing and pushing, although there seemed to be nothing to push against except swirling, spinning blackness. Then, suddenly, he was standing on another Hobson's Hill. The four black boxes had gone, but the blurred arch of light was still there. He fell to his knees, clutching in terror at the grass, trembling and breathless. The switch from one world to another was always unnerving. Immediately between worlds the sensation of being in no world, of stepping into a bottomless abyss, always left him ragged with panic. He had not made the trip many times before, but he doubted if he would ever get used to it. The town looked substantially the same as the one he just left, though he was pleased to note that Finley's Lumber Company was no longer in sight. It was proof that he had made the switch successfully. For some reason, Finley never seemed to have established his business anywhere but in Charles Meade's world. There were similar changes in every world, some large changes, 
some small. But at least Hobson's Hill was always there, which is why he chose it as his jumping-off point. Charles Meade set off down the hill and along the highway into town. In a telephone booth he searched the directory, and then began walking again, with a new eagerness in his step. Ten minutes later he turned into the front porch of a small, neat, brick bungalow. He was about to press the bell button when he paused, listening. From inside the house he heard voices yelling, a man and a woman, strident with anger. Charles Meade smiled faintly and rather smugly and put his fingers on the button. A moment later the front door opened and, at the same time, he heard a woman's high heels stamping through to the back of the house. Then a door slammed. The man in the doorway wore moccasins, jeans, and a red plaid shirt. Except for the general sloppiness of his dress, compared with the unwrinkled neatness of Charles Meade's expensive gray slacks and sport jacket, the pair could have been twins. Both were slim and tall, with the slightly stooped appearance of tall men. Their short, sandy hair and wide blue eyes gave them both a boyish look. "'Chuck Meade?' Charles Meade asked. This one was sure to be called Chuck, he thought. The man nodded, frowning slightly. "'Good,' said Charles. "'That's my name, too. May I come in?' He pushed his way past the bewildered Chuck Meade, went into the living room, and sat down. He began the speech he had prepared. It was the first time he had said it out loud to anyone, and, as he talked, he became painfully aware of how foolish it sounded. He knew that Chuck Meade was smiling behind the hand he had so casually cupped over his chin and mouth. In the tiny living room with its fading furnishings, its old mahogany piano, and the new TV, its old wedding pictures on the newly redecorated walls, talk of other worlds than this was hopelessly out of place. "'Look, I'm wasting my time trying to explain,' Charles Meade said. "'I want you to come with me. Don't ask questions. What I have to show you will save hours of explanation.' "'What are you going to show me?' Chuck Meade asked. "'Just come along with me,' Charles persisted. He knew it was only a matter of time. The bewildering similarity between them had definitely aroused the other's curiosity. He noticed that, although Chuck Meade still smiled, it was an uneasy smile. Okay, Chuck said. Anything for a laugh. Where do we go? Hobson's Hill. I suppose you call it that in this world, too? That's what we call it, Chuck said, suppressing another grin. In this world. Let's go, then, Charles urged, relieved that the toughest part was over. There's nothing to worry about. You'll be completely safe. Who's worrying? challenged his counterpart, pugnaciously. Charles pulled Chuck Meade, fighting and struggling all the way, into his own world, and together they stood on Hobson's Hill, overlooking the town. Scares me silly every time I make the crossing, Charles confessed breathlessly. Chuck's fingers still clutched his arm, digging painfully into the flesh as though he expected the ground to crumble away at any moment. "'You're okay now,' Charles assured him. He pressed the switches on the square of black boxes, and the humming noise ceased. The arch collapsed. "'Just look around you and see if this isn't a different world. You'll notice we have a Finley's Lumber Company here, which you don't have in your world.' That's only one minor difference. Come on home with me, and I'll give you all the proof you could want. Charles Meade's home was a spacious villa set well back from the road, in pleasant, handsomely kept grounds. They went inside, and Charles led the way upstairs to the den, a bright paneled room at the back of the house. Nice place, Chuck said, awed. I suppose it is, Charles agreed. Sit down. We've got a lot to talk about. He poured drinks from a well-stocked cabinet and settled in an easy chair. Now, then, I want to know if you're really convinced of this business of other worlds. Sure, Chuck said. 
unless you've got me doped or hypnotized, or I'm dreaming or something. It all seems real enough. It is real. Ice cubes clinked as Charles tilted his glass and drank. Now let's get down to business. Just listen to what I have to say, and don't interrupt. I want you to think for a moment about those times in your life when you had to make a decision or choose between two alternative courses of action, which would have affected your whole life. Have you ever wondered, when you made your choice, what would have happened if you'd chosen the other alternative? For instance, if you arrived at a situation where two jobs were available, and you chose one, wouldn't you sometimes wonder how things would have been if you had chosen the other job? I think I can show you, he continued, that when we reach such situations and finally select a course of action, we also take the other course at the same time. I'm going to try to prove to you that an alternative world somehow comes into existence in which you live your other life. As a matter of fact, you and I sprang from one of those decisive moments. I'm pretty sure I know which one, too. He cut short his guest's protest with a quick wave of his hand. You really can't argue with me about it. You've seen two worlds already. Surely you don't think it ends there. After all, we live in an infinite universe. Why shouldn't we be infinite creatures living out the infinite possibilities of our lives? Still, to return to you and me, your wife's name is Kathy, isn't it? Yeah, is yours? My wife is called Estelle. Does that mean anything to you? Chuck put down his drink and straightened suddenly. You mean Estelle Defoe? That's right. If you want to make sure we're talking about the same girl, go look out the window. Chuck stood up and leaned over the sill. Outside, surrounded by close-trimmed green lawn, was a swimming pool. Beside the pool, a shapely blonde was stretched out, face down on a red towel, like some bright, beautiful calendar girl. She wore the bottom half of a green-striped bikini. The top half lay on the grass beside her. "'My God! That's Estelle, all right!' Chuck exclaimed. "'I'd know her anywhere. Still got that terrific figure, too.' I suppose she is hard to forget after how long? Just over seven years, isn't it? Isn't that how long you've been married? How do you know? Can't you guess? Remember seven or eight years ago how you tortured yourself choosing between two girls, Estelle or Kathy? Remember how hard it was to arrive at a decision? It wasn't too difficult. I chose Kathy. I know, Charles said, smiling. I was left with Estelle. Or perhaps it was the other way around. Don't you see? I am you and you are me. If there's any difference between us, it's only what the last seven years have done to us. It was one of those decisions I spoke of, when one of us followed one path, leaving the other to explore the other path. That's crazy. I happen to know Estelle married a major in the army years ago and went out west to live. In your world, maybe, Charles said, but the one in this world married me. Chuck looked enviously out the window. Lucky you. He made a gesture that took in the room, the girl, the magnificent house, the beautiful garden. Did Estelle make you rich, too? Not the way you seem to be figuring. Her father gave me a job in his electronics business, and I did some profitable research for him. Now I'm a partner in the firm. We have a big plant on the other side of town. As a matter of fact, it was while I was in the lab out there that I stumbled on these alternative worlds. By sheer accident, I crossed into another world and almost scared myself to death. By the way, he went on, what happened to you after you married Kathy? I often wondered what it would have been like being married to her. It's all right, I guess, Chuck said. We got married and bought a house. A couple of years ago, I went into business on my own. Hi-fi and TV repairs. Business isn't too bad. He flashed another look at the golden girl sunning herself by the pool. Estelle hasn't changed much in all these years, he said nostalgically. 
She's still as beautiful as ever. Then he banged his glass down hard on the windowsill. You must be trying to put something over on me. What's the gag? There's no gag, Charles assured him. Besides, there's more to come. Like what? I mentioned earlier about this being an infinite universe. There must be more than just the world you live in and the world I live in. Think it over. Millions of everybody making decisions all the time, following one path and discarding another. There must be millions of worlds, an infinite number of them. Chuck drained his glass and went back to the cabinet to help himself. It's not just theory, Charles insisted. I know there's more than just our two worlds. I've seen a couple of them. I could take you to them. And every time anyone makes a decision, new ones spring into existence. Do you follow me? I guess so, Chuck said. As much as anyone can follow a thing like that. I'm still not finished. Hold it, Charles cut in abruptly. Before we get tangled up any further, what am I doing here? I had to tell someone, Charles said. I couldn't keep a thing like this to myself. Yet who could I tell? I thought it over and said nothing to anyone in this world, because it suddenly occurred to me that the best person to confide in was one of my hundreds of selves. Quit it, Chuck begged. You'll drive me nuts, you and your hundreds of selves. You're one of them, Charles reminded him. The others all exist somewhere. I just happened to reach you by accident. When I started down Hobson's Hill, I didn't know which Charles Meade would be in the town. After all, I've made dozens of big decisions in the past few years. There must be plenty of other Charles Meads in existence. That still doesn't explain why you brought me here. Don't tell me you intend to round up all the different versions of yourself. If so, count me out. You're getting warm, Charles said. If you'll bear with me a little longer... I'll stretch your imagination again. Chuck groaned and settled down resignedly in the armchair. If there really are all these worlds, Charles began, and I can't see why there shouldn't be, then a world must exist where there's a Charles Meade who never made a wrong decision. A Charles Meade who did everything right, who never made a wrong move in his life. Of course, there must also be one of us who never made a right decision to say nothing of all the endless varieties between the two extreme cases. But, of course, I'm not concerned with them. Chuck stood watching the sleeping girl by the ornamental pool, looking back, thinking back, over seven years. Then he went over to the cabinet and poured himself another drink, a strong one. So what if there is a perfect Charles Meade somewhere? What about him? I'd like to see him, Charles said. I'd like to see such a world. Wouldn't you? In your place? Not a chance. What's wrong with the world you're in now? It looks pretty good to me. A lot better than mine. Beautiful wife, big house, big shot in the company. It's a matter of what you're used to, Charles said dryly. I hope you don't mind me saying this. We are brothers, more rather than less. When I called on you, I'm sure I heard you fighting with Kathy. Do you fight often? I guess we do, Charles said, from time to time. Estelle and I fight all the time. I still regret marrying her, even though I got rich because of it. Anyway, we don't get along. We don't even try to manage. There were plenty of times when I regret not marrying Kathy. She seems to me to be a nice, homey, comfortable sort of kid. I hope you're not suggesting we trade places, Chuck said. Of course not. I told you, I'm searching for the perfect world. Charles Meade's Utopia. He raised his glass in a mock toast. Want to come along? Chuck Meade was silent, looking out of the window onto the lawn. The girl by the pool stirred briefly in her sunny slumber. Weren't you ever happy with Estelle? he asked. Charles shrugged. I suppose I was at first, 
but we soon grew tired of each other. I was tied up with business, and Estelle wanted a good time. That's funny, Chuck said wistfully. But when Kathy and I started to drift apart, I began to have Estelle on my mind all the time. I used to imagine how much better things would have been if I'd married her instead. I guess we both made a poor choice. Probably the perfect Charles Mead didn't choose either girl. If I failed with Kathy and you failed with Estelle, I wouldn't be surprised if the Charles Mead who, um, got away didn't fail in some other world. Kathy and Estelle were a couple of nice kids. Maybe it wasn't their fault entirely. Maybe it was the fault of Charles and Chuck Mead. Possibly, said Charles a little warily. But that sort of argument gets us nowhere. You still can't disprove that there is a perfect Charles Meade somewhere. I doubt if he's perfect, Chuck said. Making the correct decisions all the time doesn't necessarily make him perfect. Besides, even if you did meet him, it wouldn't alter you in any way. You'd be the same person you are now. I'd still like to find him. I'll bet you wouldn't know him if you saw him, and you might waste a whole lifetime looking. Then, if you did find him, what makes you think he'd want to hang around? At least, if he did kick me out, I'd know he'd made the absolutely correct decision, Charles said, smiling. Well, don't count me in on your search. If you take my advice, you'll smash your invention, or whatever it is, and stay in your own world. There's nothing to be gained by exploring the paths you might have followed. What's to be gained by not going? That's up to you. You can stay and make the best of your own world. You're a fine one to talk. Are you going back to your own life, to Kathy, even though you don't get along with her? Nodding empathetically, Chuck said, Of course. Your utopia is as removed from me as heaven or hell. The important thing is not the hundreds of lives you could have led, or all the possibilities that occurred in your lifetime. The thing that counts is what you do with the one lifetime that's given to you. You're not happy with Estelle, so you blame Estelle, thinking you'd be happier with Kathy, or someone else. I felt the same way about Kathy, and thought I'd be happier with Estelle. Now that you've given us both the opportunity to see ourselves ruining both lives, we can see that it's possibly us at fault. If you want to find the perfect Charles Meade, you have to find him inside yourself, not in some untouchable world. You should have been a minister, Charles told him. You preach a good sermon. Chuck's boyish face reddened suddenly. It still goes anyway. Perhaps I've spent more time than you lately wondering why my marriage is breaking up. Maybe I have the answer now. So you're going back to the little woman, filled with love and kisses and a heart full of hope. Forget it, Chuck said. Forget I said anything at all. Don't worry about it. No hard feelings. You're perfectly free to do or say what you like. He suddenly smiled and then began to laugh aloud. What's funny? Chuck asked. Plenty said Charles. I just realized we both made decisions a few minutes ago. We both chose between two alternatives. You decided to go home to Kathy instead of going with me. I decided to go on with my quest instead of going back to Estelle. What about it? Remember what I told you? Every time you choose one of two alternative courses of action, another world comes into existence in which you follow the other course of action. Don't you see what that means? Charles Meade said goodbye to Chuck as they stood on top of Hobson's Hill. Then, when Chuck had vanished, he switched off his equipment and set about camouflaging the black boxes in the bushes. It was too late in the day to make a second attempt at crossing into another world, and he decided to wait until tomorrow. When a man is seeking perfection, he told himself, it paid to be patient and cautious and not to rush headlong into things. Presently, when he was satisfied with his work of concealing the apparatus, he set off down the hill. 
Chuck Mead came through the harrowing experience of crossing worlds and stood once more on the top of Hobson's Hill in his own world. He glanced all around him, nervously, reassuring himself that he was in his own world again. Then he took a crumpled cigarette from his shirt pocket and inhaled hungrily while he waited for his heart to stop its frantic hammering. Had he really been in another world, he wondered? And had he really seen Estelle? Presently, as he recalled events, his train of thought brought him around to Kathy, and his decision. She would still be mad at him after the fight they had had when Charles arrived. Funny, now he couldn't remember what they had been quarreling about. It seemed any little thing would start them off these days. But it wasn't too late. He was sure of that now. The situation could be repaired. There was still time. With a quick, determined gesture, he flung the cigarette away from him, and with a new spring in his stride, he set off down the hill. Somewhere in the infinite universe among the myriad worlds and possibilities was a world born of a decision. In this world, Charles Meade stood on top of Hobson's Hill, dismantling his apparatus. He was finished with it, was going to destroy it as soon as he got home. Chuck had been right. He was a fool to think of leaving Estelle for a mad dream. Strange, he thought, the way he had neglected her all these years. A girl like Estelle needed warmth and gaiety and affection not the boorish neglect of an idiot who wished he was in another world. He was lucky. He realized that she was still there to go home to. With the act of making his decision, he felt a new peace of mind he had not experienced in years. At least he was about to tackle a problem within his grasp, not some ridiculous and impossible hunt through the infinity of alien worlds. He shook his head, genuinely puzzled. How on earth could he have considered such an absurd notion, he wondered as he shouldered his equipment and set off down the hill. In yet another world, also born of a decision, Charles and Chuck Mead emerged on top of Hobson's Hill. They looked about them eagerly, pointing out the landmarks in the town below. This one's really different, Charles said excitedly. Look, there's no lumber yard, and not even the railroad tracks. And that tall gray building downtown is new, too. Let's go, Chuck urged. Let's take a look. Take it easy, Charles cautioned, his hand on Chuck's arm. We'll have to be careful about this. Remember, we're looking for the best, the perfect world. Okay, Chuck said. Even if it takes a lifetime, we settle for nothing but the best. And together, like two wise men off to seek the truth itself, and, at the same time, like two schoolboys on some youthful adventure, they set off down the hill. The End of Nothing But the Best by Alan Cogan Yesterday House by Fritz Leiber This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Green Yesterday House by Fritz Leiber Meeting someone who's been dead for twenty years is shocking enough for anyone with a belief in ghosts. Worse for one with none. Part 1 the narrow cove was quiet as the face of an expectant child, yet so near the ruffled Atlantic that the last push of wind carried the Anio its full length. The man in gray flannels and sweatshirt let the sail come crumpling down and hurried past its white folds at a gait made comically awkward by his cramped muscles. Slowly the rocky ledge came nearer. Slowly the blue V inscribed on the cove's surface by the sloop's prow died. Sloop and Ledge kissed so gently that he hardly had to reach out his hand. He scrambled ashore, dipping a sneaker in the icy water, and threw the line around a boulder. Unkinking himself, he looked back through the cove's high and rocky mouth at the gray-green scattering of islands and the faint dark line that was the coast of Maine. 
He almost laughed in satisfaction at having disregarded vague warnings and done the thing every man yearns to do once in his lifetime. Gone to the farthest island out. He must have looked longer than he realized, because by the time he dropped his gaze, the cove was again as glassy as if the Annie O had always been there, and the splotches made by his sneaker on the rock had faded in the hot sun. There was something very unusual about the quietness of this place, as if time, elsewhere hurrying frantically, paused here to rest, as if all changes were erased on this one bit of earth. The man's lean, melancholy face crinkled into a grin at the banal fancy. He turned his back on his new friend, the little green sloop, without one thought for his nets and specimen bottles, and set out to explore. The ground rose steeply at first, and the oaks were close— but after a little way, things went downhill, and the leaves thinned, and he came out on more rocks, and realized he hadn't quite gone to the furthest one out. Joined to this island by a rocky spine, which at the present low tide would have been dry but for the spray, was another green high island that the first had masked from him all the while he had been sailing. He felt the thrill of discovery— just as he'd wondered back in the woods whether his might not be the first human feet to kick through the underbrush. After all, there were thousands of these islands. Then he was dropping down the rocks, his lanky limbs now moving smoothly enough. To the landward side of the spine, the water was fairly still. It even began with another deep cove in which he glimpsed the spiny spheres of sea urchins. But from seaward, the waves chopped in sprinkling his trousers to the knees and making him wince pleasurably at the thought of what vast wings of spray and towers of solid water must crash up from here in a storm. He crossed the rocks at a trot, ran up a short grassy slope, raced through a fringe of trees, and came straight up against an eight-foot fence of heavy mesh topped with barbed wire and backed at a short distance with high, heavy shrubbery. Without pausing for surprise, in fact, in his holiday mood, using surprise as a goad, he jumped for the branch of an oak whose trunk touched the fence, scorning the easier lower branch on the other side of the tree. He then drew himself up, worked his way to some higher branches that crossed the fence, and dropped it down inside. Suddenly cautious, he gently parted the shrubbery, and before the first surprise could really sink in, had another. A closely mown lawn dotted with more shrubbery ran up to a snug white Cape Cod cottage. The single strand of a radio aerial stretched the length of the roof. Parked on a neat gravel driveway that crossed just in front of the cottage was a short, square-lined touring car that he recognized from remembered pictures as an ancient Essex. The whole scene had about it the same odd quietness as the cove. Then, with the air of a clockwork toy coming to life, the white door opened, and an elderly woman came out, dressed in a long, lace-edged dress and wide, lazy hat. She climbed into the driver's seat of the Essex, sitting there very stiff and tall. The motor began to chug bravely, gravel skittered, and the car rolled off between the trees. The door of the house opened again, and a slim girl emerged. She wore a white silk dress that fell straight from the square neckline to hip-height waistline making the skirt seem very short. Her dark hair was bound with a white bandeau so that it curved close to her cheeks. A dark necklace dangled against the white of the dress. A newspaper was tucked under her arm. She crossed the driveway and tossed the paper down on a rattan table between three rattan chairs and stood watching a squirrel zigzag across the lawn. The man stepped through the wall of shrubbery, called hello, and walked toward her. She whirled around and stared at him as still as if her heart had stopped beating. Then she darted behind the table and waited for him there. Granting the surprise of his appearance, her alarm seemed not so much excessive as eerie, as if, the man thought, he were not an ordinary stranger, but a visitor from another planet. Approaching closer, he saw that she was trembling, and that her breath was coming in rapid, irregular gasps. Yet the slim, sweet, patrician face that stared into his had an underlying expression of expectancy that reminded him of the cove. She couldn't have been more than eighteen. He stopped short of the table. Before he could speak, she stammered out, "'Are you he?' "'What do you mean?' he asked, smiling puzzledly. 
the one who sends me the little boxes. I was out sailing, and I happened to land in the far cove. I didn't dream that anyone lived on this island or even came here. No one ever does come here, she replied. Her manner had changed, becoming at once more wary and less agitated, though still eerily curious. It startled me tremendously to find this place, he blundered on. Especially the road and the car. Why, this island can't be more than a quarter of a mile wide. The road goes down to the wharf, she explained, and up to the top of the island where my aunts have a tree house. He tore his mind away from the picture of a woman dressed like Queen Mary clambering up a tree. Was that your aunt I saw driving off? One of them. The others taken the motorboat in for supplies. She looked at him doubtfully. I'm not sure they'd like it if they find someone here. There are just the three of you, he cut in quickly, looking down the empty road that vanished among the oaks. She nodded. I suppose you go into the mainland with your aunts quite often. She shook her head. It must get pretty dull for you. Not very, she said, smiling. My aunts bring me the papers and other things, even movies. We've got a projector. My favorite stars are Antonio Marino and Alice Terry. I like her better even than Clara Bow. He looked at her hard for a moment. I suppose you read a lot? She nodded. Fitzgerald's my favorite author. She started around the table, hesitated, suddenly grew shy. Would you like some lemonade? He noticed the dude's silver pitcher, but only now realized his thirst. Yet when she handed him a glass, he held it untasted and said awkwardly, I haven't introduced myself. I'm Jack Barry. She stared at his outstretched right hand, slowly extended her own toward it, shook it up and down exactly once, then quickly dropped it. He chuckled and gulped some lemonade. I'm a biology student, been working at Woods Hole the first part of the summer, but now I'm here to do research in marine ecology. That sort of sea life patterns. Of the inshore islands. Under the direction of Professor Kesserich. You know about him, of course. She shook her head. Probably the greatest living biologist, he was proud to inform her. Human physiology as well. Tremendous geneticists in a class with Carlson and Jacques Loeb. Martin Kesserich, he lives over there at town. I'm staying with him. You ought to have heard of him. He grinned. Matter of fact, I'd never have met you if it hadn't been for Mrs. Kesserich. The girl looked puzzled. Jack explained. The old boy's been off to Europe on some conferences. Won't be back for a couple more days, but I was to get started anyhow. When I went out this morning, Mrs. Kesserich, who's a drab sort of person, said to me, Don't try to sail to the farther islands. So, of course, I had to. By the way, you still haven't told me your name. Mary Alice Pope, she said, speaking slowly with an odd wonder, as if she were saying it for the first time. You're pretty shy, aren't you? How would I know? The question stopped Jack. He couldn't think of anything to say to this strangely attractive girl dressed almost like a flapper. Will you sit down? she asked him gravely. The rattan chair sighed under his weight. He made another effort to talk. I'll bet you'll be glad when summer's over. Why? So you'll be able to go back to the mainland. But I never go to the mainland. You mean you stay out here all winter? He asked incredulously, his mind filled with a vision of snow and frozen spray and great gray waves. Oh, yes, we get all our supplies on hand before winter. My aunts are very capable. They don't always wear long lace dresses. And now I help them. But that's impossible, he said with sudden sympathetic anger. You can't be shut off this way from people your own age. You're the first one I ever met. She hesitated. I never saw a boy or a man before, except in movies. You're joking. No, it's true. But why are they doing it to you, he demanded, leaning forward. Why are they inflicting this loneliness on you, Mary? She seemed to have gained poise from his loss of it. I don't know why. I'm to find out soon, but actually, I'm not lonely. May I tell you a secret? She touched his hand, this time with only the faintest trembling. Every night the loneliness gathers in around me. You're right about that. 
But then every morning, new life comes to me in a little box. What's that? He said sharply. Sometimes there's a poem in the box, sometimes a book or pictures or flowers or a ring, but always a note. Next to the notes, I like the poems best. My favorite is the one by Matthew Arnold that ends, Ah, love, let us be true to one another. For the world, which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy nor love, nor light, no certitude. Wait a minute, he interrupted. Who sends you those boxes? I don't know. But how are the notes signed? They're wonderful notes, she said. So wise, so gay, so tender, you'd imagine them being written by John Barrymore or Lindbergh. Yes, but how are they signed? She hesitated. Never anything but your lover. And so when you first saw me, you thought... He began and then stopped because she was blushing. How long have you been getting them? Ever since I can remember, I have two closets of the boxes. The new ones are either by my bed when I wake or at my place at breakfast. But how does this person get these boxes to you out here? Does he give them to your aunts and do they put them there? I'm not sure. But how can they get them in winter? I don't know. Look here, he said, pouring himself more lemonade. How long is it since you've been to the mainland? Almost 18 years. My aunts tell me I was born there in the middle of the war. What war? he asked startledly, spilling some lemonade. The World War, of course. What's the matter? Jack Barr was staring down at the spilled lemonade and feeling a kind of terror he'd never experienced in his waking life. Nothing around him had changed. He could still feel the same hot sun on his shoulders, the same icy glass in his hand, sent the same lemon acid odor in his nostrils. He could still hear the faint chop-chop of the waves. And yet everything had changed, gone dark and dizzy as a landscape glimpsed just before a faint. All the little false notes had come to a sudden focus. For the lemonade had spilled on the headline of the newspaper the girl had tossed down, and the headline read, Hitler in New Defiance. Under the big black banner of that head swam smaller ones. Foes of Machado Riot in Havana. Big NRA parade planned. Balbo speaks in New York. Suddenly he felt a surge of relief. He had noticed that the paper was yellow and brittle-edged. Why are you so interested in old newspapers, he asked. I wouldn't call day before yesterday's paper old, the girl objected, pointing to the dateline, July 20, 1933. You're trying to joke, Jack told her. No, I'm not. But it's 1953. Now it's you who are joking. But the paper's yellow. The paper's always yellow. He laughed uneasily. Well, if you actually think it's 1933... Perhaps you're to be envied, he said, with a sardonic humor he didn't quite feel. Then you can't know anything about the Second World War or television or the V2s or bikini bathing suits or the atomic bomb or stop. She had sprung up and retreated around her chair, white-faced. I don't like what you're saying. But no, please. Jokes that may be quite harmless on the mainland sound different here. I'm really not joking, he said after a moment. She grew quite frantic at that. I can show you all last week's papers. I can show you magazines and other things. I can prove it. She started toward the house. He followed. He felt his heart begin to pound. At the white door, she paused, looking worriedly down the road. Jack thought he could hear the faint chug of a motorboat. She pushed open the door, and he followed her inside. The small windowed room was dark after the sunlight. Jack got an impression of solid old furniture, a fireplace with brass andirons. Jack, croaked a gritty voice. After their disastrous break day before yesterday, stocks are recovering, bleeding issues. Jack realized that he had started and had involuntarily put his arm around the girl's shoulders. 
At the same time, he noticed that the voice was coming from the curved brown trumpet of an old-fashioned radio loudspeaker. The girl didn't pull away from him. He turned toward her. Although her gray eyes were on him, her attention had gone elsewhere. I can hear the car. They're coming back. They won't like it that you're here. All right, they won't like it. Her agitation grew. No, you must go. I'll come back tomorrow, he heard himself saying. Flash, it looks like the World Economic Conference may soon adjourn, mouthing jeers at old Uncle Sam, who's generally referred to as Uncle Shylock. Jack felt a numbness on his neck. The room seemed to be darkening. The girl growing stranger still. You must go before they see you. Flash, Wiley Post has just completed his solo circuit of the globe after a record-breaking flight of seven days, 18 hours, and 45 minutes. Asked how he felt after the energy jamming feet. Post-trip. He was halfway across the lawn before he realized the terror into which the grating radio voice had thrown him. He leaped for the branch overhanging the fence, vaulted up with the risky help of a foot on the barbed top. A surprised squirrel, lacking time to make its escape up the trunk, sprang to the ground ahead of him. With terrible suddenness... Two steel-jawed semicircles clanked together just over the squirrel's head. Jack landed with one foot to either side of the sprung trap, while the squirrel darted off with a squeak. Jack plunged down the slope to the rocky spine and ran across it, spray from the rising waves spattering him to the waist. Panting now, he stumbled up into the oaks and undergrowth of the first island, fought his way through it, finally reached the silent cove. He loosed the line of the anio, dragged it as near to the cove's mouth as he could, plunged knee-deep into freezing water to give it a final shove, scrambled aboard, snatched up the boat hook, and punched at the rocks. As soon as the Anio was nosing out of the cove into the crosswaves, he yanked up the sail. The refreshing wind filled it and sent the sloop heeling over with inches of white water over the lee rail and plunging ahead. For a long while, Jack was satisfied to think of nothing but the wind and the waves and the sail and speed and danger, to have all his attention taken up balancing one against the other so that he wouldn't have to ask himself what year it was and whether time was an illusion and wonder about flappers and hidden traps. When he finally looked back at the island, he was amazed to see how tiny it had grown, as distant as the mainland. Then he saw a gray motorboat astern. He watched it as it slowly overtook him. It was built like a lifeboat with a sturdy low cabin in the bow and wheel amidship. Whoever was at the wheel had long gray hair that whipped in the wind. The longer he looked, the surer he was it was a woman wearing a lace dress. Something that stuck up inches over the cabin flashed darkly beside her. Only when she lifted it to the roof of the cabin did it occur to him that it might be a rifle. But just then the motorboat swung around in a turn that sent waves drenching over it and headed back towards the island. He watched it for a minute in wonder. Then his attention was jolted by an angry hail. Three fishing smacks, also headed towards town, were about to cross his bow. He came around into the wind and waited with shaking sail, watching a man in a lumpy sweater shake a fist at him. Then he turned and gratefully followed the dark, wide, fan-like sterns and age-yellowed sails. Part 2 the exterior of Martin Kusserich's home, a weathered white cube with narrow, sharp-paned windows topped by a cupola, was nothing like its lavish interior. In much the same way, Mrs. Kusserich classed with the darkly gleaming furniture, Persian rugs, and bronze vases around her. Her shapeless black form, poised awkwardly on the edge of a huge sofa, made Jack think of a cow that had strayed into the drawing room. He wondered again how a man like Kusserich had come to marry such a creature. Yet, when she lifted up her little eyes from the shadows, he had an uneasy feeling that she knew a great deal about him. The eyes were still those of a domestic animal, but of a wise one, that has been watching the house a long, long while from the barnyard. He asked abruptly, Do you know anything of a girl around here named Mary Alice Pope? The silence lasted so long that he began to think she had gone into some bovine trance, then, without a word, she got up and went over to a tall cabinet. Feeling on a ledge behind it for a key, she opened a panel, opened a cardboard box inside it, took something from the box and handed him a photograph. He held it up to the failing light. 
and sucked in his breath with surprise. It was a picture of the girl he had met that afternoon. Same flat-bosomed dress, flowered rather than white, no bandeau, same beads, same proud, demure expression, perhaps a bit happier. That is Mary Alice Pope, Mrs. Kesserich said in a strangely flat voice. She was Martin's fiancée. She was killed in a railway accident in 1933. The small sound of the cabinet door closing brought Jack back to reality. He realized that he no longer had the photograph. Against the gloom by the cabinet, Mrs. Kesserich's white face looked at him with what seemed a malicious eagerness. Sit down, she said, and I'll tell you about it. Without a thought as to why she hadn't asked him a single question, he was much too dazed for that. He obeyed. Mrs. Kesserich resumed her position on the edge of the sofa. You must understand, Mr. Barr, that Mary Alice Pope was the one love of Martin's life. He is a man of very deep and strong feelings, yet, as you probably know, anything but kindly or demonstrative. Even when he first came here from Hungary with his older sisters, Hani and Hilda, there was a cloak of loneliness about him, or rather about the three of them. Hani and Hilda were athletic outdoor women, yet fiercely proud. I don't imagine they ever spoke to anyone in America except as to a servant, and with a seething distaste for all men except Martin. They showered all their devotion on him. So, of course, though Martin didn't realize it, they were consumed with jealousy when he fell in love with Mary Alice Pope. They thought that since he'd reached forty without marrying, he was safe. Mary Alice came from a purebred, or as a biologist would say, inbred, British stock. She was very young, but very sweet, and up to a point very wise. She sensed Tani and Hilda's feelings right away and did everything she could to win them over. For instance, though she was afraid of horses, she took up horseback riding, because that was Hani and Hilda's favorite pastime. Naturally, Martin knew nothing of her fear, and naturally his sisters knew about it from the first. But, and here's where Mary's wisdom fell short, her brave gesture did not pacify them. It only increased their hatred. Except for his research, Martin was blind to everything but his love. It was a beautiful and yet frightening passion, an insane cherishing as narrow and intense as his sister's hatred. With a start, Jack remembered that it was Mrs. Kesserich telling him all this. She went on. Martin's love directed his every move. He was building a home for himself and Mary, and in his mind, he was building a wonderful future for them as well. Not vaguely, if you know Martin, but year by year, month by month. This winter, he'd planned, they would visit Buenos Aires. Next summer, they would sail down the Inland Passage, and he would teach Mary Hungarian for their trip to Budapest the year after, where he would occupy a chair at the university for a few months, and so on. Finally, the time for their marriage drew near. Martin had been away. His research was keeping him very busy. Jack broke in with, wasn't that about the time he did his definitive work on growth and fertilization? Mrs. Kesserich nodded with solemn appreciation in the gathering darkness. But now he was coming home, his work done. It was early evening, very chilly, but Hani and Hilda felt they had to ride down to the station to meet their brother. And although she dreaded it, Mary rode with them, for she knew how delighted he would be at her cantering up to the puffing train and his running up to lift her down from the saddle to welcome him home. Of course there was Martin's luggage to be considered, so the station wagon had to be sent down for that. She looked defiantly at Jack. I drove the station wagon. I was Martin's laboratory assistant. She paused. It was almost dark, but there was still a white cold line of sky to the west. Hani and Hilda, with Mary between them, were waiting on their horses at the top of the hill that led down to the station. The train had whistled and its headlight was graying the gravel of the crossing. Suddenly Mary's horse squealed and plunged down the hill. Hani and Hilda followed, to try to catch her, they said, but they didn't manage that, only kept her horse from veering off. Mary never screamed, but as her horse reared on the tracks, I saw her face in the headlights glare. Martin must have guessed, or at least feared, what had happened, for he was out of the train and running along the track before it stopped. 
In fact, he was the first to kneel down beside Mary. I mean what had been Mary, and was holding her all bloody and shattered in his arms. A door slammed. There were steps in the hall. Mrs. Keserich stiffened and was silent. Jack turned. The blur of a face hung in the doorway to the hall, a seemingly young, sensitive, suavely handsome face with aristocratic jaw. Then there was a click, and the lights flared up, and Jack saw the close-cropped gray hair and the lines around the eyes and nostrils, while the sensitive mouth grew sardonic. Yet the handsomeness stayed, and somehow the youth too, or at least a tremendous inner vibrancy. Hello, Bar, Martin Keserich said, ignoring his wife. The great biologist had come home. Part 3 Oh, yes, and Jameson had a feeble paper on what he called individualization in marine worms. Barr, have you ever thought much about the larger aspects of the problem of individuality? Jack jumped slightly. He had let his thoughts wander very far. Not especially, sir, he mumbled. The house was still. A few minutes after the professor's arrival, Mrs. Keserich had gone off with an anxious glance at Jack. He knew why, and wished he could reassure her that he would not mention their conversation to the professor. Keserich had spent perhaps half an hour briefing him on the more important papers delivered at the conferences. Then, almost as if it were a teacher's trick to show up a pupil's inattention, he had suddenly posed this question about individuality. "'You know what I mean, of course,' Keserich pressed. "'The factors that make you, you, and me, me.' "'Heredity and environment,' Jack parroted like a freshman." Keserich nodded. Suppose, this is just speculation, that we could control heredity and environment. Then we could recreate the same individual at will. Jack felt a shiver go through him. To get exactly the same pattern of hereditary traits, that'd be far beyond us. What about identical twins, Keserich pointed out. And then there's parthenogenesis to be considered. One might produce a duplicate of the mother without the intervention of the male. Although his voice had grown more idly speculative, Keserich seemed to Jack to be smiling secretly. There are many examples in the lower animal forms to say nothing of the technique by which Loeb caused a sea urchin to reproduce with no more stimulus than a salt solution. Jack felt the hair rising on his neck. Even then you wouldn't get exactly the same pattern of hereditary traits. Not if the parent were a very pure stock? Not if there was some special technique for selecting ova that would reproduce all the mother's traits? But environment would change things, Jack objected. The duplicate would be bound to develop differently. Is environment so important? Newman tells about a pair of identical twins separated from birth, unaware of each other's existence. They met by accident when they were twenty-one. Each was a telephone repairman. Each had a wife the same age. Each had a baby son, and each had a fox terrier called Trixie. That's without trying to make environments similar. But suppose you did try. Suppose you saw to it that each of them had exactly the same experiences at the same times. For a moment it seemed to Jack that the room was dimming and wavering, becoming a dark pool in which the only motionless thing was Kesserich's sphinx-like face. Well... We've escaped quite far enough from Jameson's marine worms, the biologist said, all brisk again. He said it as if Jack were the one who had led the conversation down wild and unprofitable channels. Let's get on to your project. I want to talk it over now, because I won't have any time for it tomorrow. Jack looked at him blankly. Tomorrow I must attend to a very important matter, the biologist explained. Part 4 Morning sunlight brightened the colors of the wax flowers under the glass on the high bureau that always seemed to emit the faint odor of old hair combings. Jack pulled back the diamond-patterned quilt and blinked the sleep from his eyes. He expected his mind to be busy wondering about Keserich and his wife, things said and half-said last night, but found instead that his thoughts swung instantly to Mary Alice Pope, as if to a farthest island in a world of people. Downstairs the house was empty. After a long look at the cabinet, he felt behind it, but the key was gone. He hurried down to the waterfront. He stopped only for a bowl of chowder and, as an afterthought, to buy a half a dozen newspapers. The sea was bright, the brisk wind just right for the Annie O. 
There was eagerness in the way it smacked the sail and in the creak of the mast. And when he reached the cove, it was no longer still but nervous with faint ripples, as if time had finally begun to stir. After the same struggle with the underbrush, he came out on the rocky spine and passed the cove of sea urchins. The spiny creature struck an uncomfortable chord in his memory. This time he climbed the second island cautiously, scraping the innocent-seeming ground ahead of him intently with a boat hook he'd brought along for the purpose. He was only a few yards from the fence when he saw Mary Alice Pope standing behind it. He hadn't realized that his heart would begin to pound, or that, at the same time, a shiver of almost supernatural dread would go through him. The girl eyed him with an uneasy hostility, and immediately began to speak in a hushed, hurried voice. "'You must go away at once and never come back. You're a wicked man, but I don't want you to be hurt. I've been watching for you all morning.' He tossed the newspapers over the fence. You don't have to read them now, he told her. Just look at the date lines and a few of the headlines. When she finally lifted her eyes to his again, she was trembling. She tried unsuccessfully to speak. Listen to me, he said. You've been the victim of a scheme to make you believe you were born around 1916 instead of 1933, and that it's 1933 now instead of 1951. I'm not sure why it's been done, though I think I know who you really are. But, the girl faltered, my aunts tell me it's 1933. They would, and there are the papers, the magazines, the radio. The papers are old ones, the radio's faked, some sort of recording. I could show you if I could get at it. These papers might be faked, she said, pointing to where she'd let them drop on the ground. They're new, he said. Only old papers get yellow. But why would they do it to me? Why? Come with me to the mainland, Mary. That'll set you straight quicker than anything. I couldn't, she said, drawing back. He's coming tonight. He? The man who sends me the boxes and my life. Jack shivered. When he spoke, his voice was rough and quick. A life that's completely a lie, that's cut you off from the world. Come with me, Mary. She looked up at him wonderingly. For perhaps ten seconds the silence held and the spell of her eerie sweetness deepened. I love you, Mary, Jack said softly. She took a step back. Really, Mary, I do. She shook her head. I don't know what's true. Go away. Mary, he pleaded, read the papers I've given to you. Think things through. I'll wait for you here. You can't. My aunts would find you. Then I'll go away and come back. About sunset, will you give me an answer? She looked at him. Suddenly she whirled around. He, too, heard the chuff of the Essex. They'll find us, she said, and if they find you, I don't know what they'll do. Quick, run. She darted off herself, only to turn back to scramble for the papers. But will you give me an answer, he pressed. She looked frantically up from the papers. I don't know. You mustn't risk coming back. I will, no matter what you say. I can't promise. Please go. Just one question, he begged. What are your aunt's names? Honey and Hilda, she told him. And then she was gone. The head shook where she darted through. Jack hesitated, then started for the cove. He thought for a moment of staying on the island, but decided against it. He could probably conceal himself successfully, but whoever found his boat would have him at a disadvantage. Besides, there were things he must try to find out on the mainland. He entered the oaks. His spine tightened for a moment as if someone were watching him. He hurried to the rippling cove, wasted no time getting the Annie O underway. With the wind still in the west, he knew it would be a hard sail. He'd need half a dozen tacks to reach the mainland. When he was about a quarter of a mile out from the cove, there was a sharp smack beside him. He jerked around, heard a distant crack, and saw a foot-long splinter of fresh wood dangling from the edge of the sloop's cockpit, about a foot from his head. He felt his skin tighten. He was the bullseye of a great watery target. All the air between him and the island was tainted with menace. Water splashed a yard from the side. There was another distant crack. He lay on his back in the cockpit, steering by the sail, taking advantage of what little cover there was. There were several more cracks. After a second, there was a hole in the sail. Finally, Jack looked back. 
the island was more than a mile astern. He anxiously scanned the sea ahead for craft. There were none. Then he settled down to nurse more speed from the sloop and waited for the motorboat. But it didn't come out to follow him. Part 5 Same as yesterday, Mrs. Kesserich was sitting on the edge of the couch in the living room. Yet from the first, Jack was aware of a great change. Something had filled the domestic animal with grief and fury. "'Where's Dr. Kesserich?' he asked. "'Not here. "'Mrs. Kesserich,' he said, dropping down beside her, "'you were telling me something yesterday when we were interrupted.' "'She looked at him. "'You have found the girl?' she almost shouted. "'Yes,' Jack was surprised into answering. "'A look of slyness came into Mrs. Kesserich's bovine face. "'Then I'll tell you everything. "'I can now. "'When Martin found Mary dying, he didn't go to pieces.' You know how controlled he can be when he chooses. He lifted Mary's body as if the crowd and the railway men weren't there, and he carried it to the station wagon. Connie and Hilda were sitting on their horses nearby. He gave them one look. It was as if he had said, murderers. He told me to drive home as fast as I dared, but when I got there, he stayed sitting by Mary in the back. I knew he must have given up what hope he had for her life, or else she was dead already. I looked at him. In the dome light, his face had the most deadly and proud expression I've ever seen on a man. I worshipped him, you know, though he had never shown me one ounce of feeling. So I was completely unprepared for the naked appeal in his voice. Yet all he said at first was, Will you do something for me? I told him surely. And as we carried Mary in, he told me the rest. He wanted me to be the mother of Mary's child. Jack stared at her blankly. Mrs. Kesserich nodded. He wanted to remove an ovum from Mary's body and nurture it in mine, so that Mary, in a way, could live on. But that's impossible, Jack objected. The technique is being tried now on cattle, I know, so that a prize heifer can have several calves a year, all nurtured in scrub heifers, as they're called, but no one's ever dreamed of trying it on human beings. Mrs. Kesserich looked at him contemptuously. Martin had mastered the technique twenty years ago. He was willing to take the chance, and so was I, partly because he fired by scientific imagination and reverence, but mostly because he said he would marry me. He barred the doors, he worked swiftly. As far as anyone was concerned, Martin, in a wild fit of grief, had locked himself up for several hours to mourn over the body of his fiancée. Within a month we were married, and I finally gave birth to the child. Jack shook his head. You gave birth to your own child. She smiled bitterly. No, it was Mary's. Martin did not keep his whole bargain with me. I was nothing more than his scrub wife in every way. You think you gave birth to Mary's child. Mrs. Kesserich turned on Jack in anger. I've been wounded by him day in and day out for years, but I've never failed to recognize his genius. Besides... You've seen the girl, haven't you? Jack had to nod. What confounded him most was that, granting the near-impossible physiological feat Mrs. Kesserich had described, the girl should look so much like her mother. Mothers and daughters don't look that much alike, only identical twins did. With a thrill of fear, he remembered Kesserich's casual words, parthenogenesis, pure stock, special techniques. Very well, he forced himself to say. Granting that the child was Mary's and Martin's, no, Mary's alone. Jack suppressed a shudder. He continued quickly, what became of the child? Mrs. Kesserich lowered her head. The day it was born, it was taken away from me. After that, I never saw Hilda and Hani either. You mean, Jack asked, that Martin sent them away to bring up the child? Mrs. Kesserich turned away. Yes. Jack asked incredulously, he trusted the child with the two people he suspected of having caused the mother's death. Once, when I was his assistant, Mrs. Kesserich said softly, I carelessly broke some laboratory glassware. He kept me up all night building a new setup, though I'm rather poor at working with glass and usually get burned. Bringing up the child was his sister's punishment. And they went to that house on the farthest island? I suppose it was the house he'd been building for Mary and himself. 
Yes, and they were to bring up the child as his daughter. Mrs. Kesserich started up, but when she spoke, it was as if she had to force out each word. As his wife, as soon as she was grown. How can you know that? Jack asked shakily. The rising wind rattled the window pane. Because today, eighteen years after, Martin broke all of his promise to me. He told me he was leaving me. Part 6 White waves shooting up like dancing ghosts in the moon-sketched, spray-swept dark were Jack's first beacon of the island and brought a sense of physical danger, breaking the trance-like yet frantic mood he had felt ever since he had spoken with Mrs. Kesserich. Coming around further into the wind, he scudded past the end of the island into the choppy sea on the landward side. A little later, he let down the reef sail in the cove of the sea urchins where the water was barely moving, although the air was shaken by the pounding of the surf on the spine between the two islands. After making fast, he paused a moment for a scrap of cloud to pass the moon. The thought of the spiny creatures in the black fathoms under the anio sent an odd quiver of terror through him. The moon came out and he started across the glistening rocks of the spine, but he had forgotten the rising tide. Midway a wave clamped around his ankles, tried to carry him off, almost made him drop the heavy object he was carrying. Sprawling and drenched, he clung to the rough rock until the surge was past. Making it finally up to the fence, he snipped a wide gate with the wire cutters. The windows of the house were alight. Hardly aware of his shivering, he crossed the lawn, slipping from one clump of shrubbery to another, until he reached one just across the drive from the doorway. At that moment he heard the approaching chuff of the Essex. The door of the cottage opened, and Mary Alice Pope stepped out, closely followed by Hani or Hilda. Jack shrank close to the shrubbery. Mary looked pale and blank-faced, as if she had retreated within herself. He was acutely conscious of the inadequacy of his screen as the ghostly headlights of the Essex began to probe through the leaves. But then he sensed that something more was about to happen than just the car arriving. It was a change in the expression of the face behind Mary that gave him the cue, a widening and sidewise flickering of the cold eyes, the puckered lips thinning into a cruel smile. The Essex shifted into second, and without any warning accelerated, Simultaneously, the woman behind Mary gave her a violent shove, but at almost the exact same instant Jack ran, he caught Mary as she sprawled towards the gravel and lunged ahead without checking. The Essex bore down upon them, a square-snouted, roaring monster. It swerved viciously, missed them by inches, threw up gravel in a skid and rocked to a stop, stalled. The first incredulous voice that broke the pulsing silence Jack recognized as Martin Kesserich's. It came from the car, which was slewed around so that it almost faced Jack and Mary. Honey, you tried to kill her. You and Hilda tried to kill her again. The woman, slumped over the wheel, slowly lifted her head. In the indistinct light, she looked a twin of the woman behind Jack and Mary. Did you really think we wouldn't? she asked in a voice that spat with passion. Did you actually believe that Hilda and I would serve this eighteen years penance just to watch you go off with her? She began to laugh wildly. You never understood your sisters at all. Suddenly she broke off, stiffly stepped down from the car, lifting her skirts a little. She strode past Jack and Mary. Martin Kesserich followed her. In passing, he said, Thanks, Barr. It occurred to Jack that Kesserich made no more question of his appearance on the island than of his presence in the laboratory. Like Mrs. Kesserich, the great biologist took him for granted. Kesserich stopped a few feet short of Hani and Hilda. Without shrinking from him, the sisters drew closer together. They looked like two gaunt hawks. But you waited eighteen years, he said. You could have killed her at any time, yet you chose to throw away so much of your lives just to have this moment. How do you know we didn't like waiting eighteen years, Hani answered him. Why shouldn't we want to make as strong an impression on you as anyone? And as for throwing our lives away, that was your doing. Oh, Martin, you'll never know anything about how your sisters feel. He raised his hands baffledly. Even assuming that you hate me, at the word hate, both Hani and Hilda laughed softly. 
and that you were prepared to strike at both my love and my work, still, that you should have waited. Hani and Hilda said nothing. Kesservich shrugged. Very well, he said in a voice that had lost all its tension. You've wasted a third of a lifetime looking forward to an irrational revenge, and you failed. That should be sufficient punishment. Very slowly he turned around and for the first time looked at Mary. His face was clearly revealed by the twin beams from the stalled car. Jack grew cold. He fought against accepting the feelings of wonder, poignant triumph, of love, of renewed youth he saw entering the face in the headlights. But most of all, he fought against the sense that Martin Kesserich was successfully drawing them all back into the past, to 1933, and another accident. There was a distant hoot, and Jack shook. For a moment, he had thought it a railway whistle and not a ship's horn. The biologist said tenderly, Come, Mary. Jack's trembling arm tightened a trifle on Mary's waist. He could feel her trembling. Come, Mary, Kesserich repeated. Still, she didn't reply. Jack wet his lips. Mary isn't going with you, Professor, he said. Quiet, Barr, Kesserich ordered absently. Mary, it is necessary that you and I leave the island at once. Please come. But Mary isn't coming, Jack repeated. Kesserich looked at him for the first time. I'm grateful to you for the unusual sense of loyalty, or whatever motive it may have been, that led you to follow me out here tonight. And of course, I'm profoundly grateful to you for saving Mary's life. But I must ask you not to interfere further in a matter which you can't possibly understand. He turned to Mary. I know how shocked and frightened you must feel, living two lives and then having to face two deaths. It must be more terrible than anyone can realize. I expected this meeting to take place under very different circumstances. I wanted to explain everything to you very naturally and gently, like the messages I've sent you every day of your second life. Unfortunately, that can't be. You and I must leave this island right now. Mary stared at him. Then she turned wonderingly towards Jack, who felt his heart begin to pound warmly. You still don't understand what I'm trying to tell you, Professor, he said boldly now. Mary is not going with you. You've deceived her all her life. You've taken a fantastic amount of pains to bring her up under the delusion that she is Mary Alice Pope, who died in... She is Mary Alice Pope, Kesserich thundered at him. He advanced towards them swiftly. Mary, darling, you're confused, but you must realize who you are and who I am and the relationship between us. Keep away, Jack warned, swinging Mary half behind him. Mary doesn't love you. She can't marry you at any rate. How could she when you're her father? Bar, keep off. Jack shot out the flat of his hand and Kesserich went staggering backward. I've talked with your wife, your wife on the mainland. She told me the whole thing. Kesserich seemed about to rush forward again, then controlled himself. You got everything wrong. You hardly deserve to be told, but under the circumstances I have no choice. Mary is not my daughter. To be precise, she has no father at all. Do you remember the work that Jacques Loeb did with sea urchins? Jack frowned angrily. You mean what we were talking about last night? Exactly. Loeb was able to cause the egg of a sea urchin to develop normally without union with a male germ cell. I have done the same tiding with a human being. This girl is Mary Alice Pope. She has exactly the same heredity. She has had exactly the same life so far as it could be reconstructed. She's heard and read the same things at exactly the same times. There have been the old newspapers, the books, even the old recorded radio programs. Hani and Hilda have had their daily instructions to the letter. She retraced the same time trail. Rot, Jack interrupted. I don't for a moment believe what you say about her birth. She's Mary's daughter, or the daughter of your wife on the mainland. And as far as retracing the same time trail, that's senile self-delusion. Mary Alice Pope had a normal life. This girl has been brought up in cruel imprisonment by two insane, vindictive old women. In your frustrated desire, you've pretended to yourself that you've recreated the girl you lost. You haven't. You couldn't. 
Nobody could. The great Martin Keserich or anyone else. Keserich, his features working, shifted his point of attack. Who are you, Mary? Don't answer him, Jack said. He's trying to confuse you. Who are you? Keserich insisted. Mary Alice Pope, she said, rapidly in a breathy whisper before Jack could speak again. And when were you born? Keserich pressed on. You've been tricked all your life about that, Jack warned. But already the girl was saying, in 1916. And who am I then? Keserich demanded eagerly. Who am I? The girl swayed. She brushed her head with her hand. It's so strange, she said, with a dreamy, almost laughing throb in her voice that turned Jack's heart cold. I'm sure I've never seen you before in my life, and yet it's as if I'd known you forever. As if you were closer to me than... Stop it, Jack shouted at Keserich. Mary loves me. She loves me because I've shown her the lie her life has been and because she's coming away with me now, aren't you, Mary? He swung around so that her blank face was inches from his own. It's me you love, isn't it, Mary? She blinked doubtfully. At that moment, Keserich charged at them, went sprawling as Jack's fist shot out. Jack swept up Mary and ran with her across the lawn. Behind him he heard an agonized cry, Keserich's, and cruel mounting laughter from Hani and Hilda. Once through the ragged doorway in the fence, he made his way more slowly, gasping. Out of the shelter of the trees the wind tore at them and the ocean roared. Moonlight glistened, now on the spine of black wet rocks, now on the foaming surf. Jack realized that the girl in his arms was speaking rapidly, disjointedly, but he couldn't quite make out the sense of the words, and then they were lost in the crash of the surf. She struggled, but he told himself that it was only because she was afraid of the menacing waters. He pushed recklessly into the breaking surf, raced gasping across the middle of the spine as the rocks uncovered, sprang to the higher ones as the next wave crashed behind them, showering them with spray. His chest burning with exertion, he carried the girl the few remaining yards to where the Annie O was tossing. A sudden great gust of wind almost did what the waves had failed to do, but he kept his footing and lowered the girl into the boat, then jumped in after. She stared at him wildly. What's that? He, too, had caught the faint shout. Looking back along the spine, just as the moon came clear again, he saw white spray rise and fall. And then the figure of Keserich stumbling through it. Mary, wait for me. The figure was halfway across when it lurched, started forward again, and then was jerked back as if something had caught its ankle. Out of the darkness, the next wave sent a line of white at it, neck high. Crashed. Jack hesitated, but another great gust of wind tore at the half-raised sail, and it was all he could do to keep the sloop from capsizing and head her into the wind again. Mary was tugging at his shoulder. You must help him, she was saying. He's caught in the rocks. He heard a voice crying, screaming crazily above the surf. Ah, oh, love, let us be true to one another, for the world... The sloop rocked. Jack had it finally headed into the wind. He looked around for Mary. She had jumped out once hurrying back, scrambling across the rock toward the dark, struggling figure that even as he watched was once more engulfed in the surf. Letting go the lines, Jack sprang towards the stern of the sloop, but just then another giant blow came, struck the sail like a great fist of air, and sent the boom slashing at the back of his head. His last recollection was being toppled out onto the rocks and wondering how he could cling to them while unconscious. Part 7 the little cove was once again as quiet as time's heart. Once again the Annie O was a sloop embedded in a mirror. Once again the rocks were warm underfoot. Jack Barr lifted his fiercely aching head and looked at the distant line of the mainland, as tiny and yet as clear as something viewed through the wrong end of a telescope. He was very tired. Searching the island in his present shaky condition had taken all the strength out of him. He looked at the peacefully rippling sea outside the cove and thought of what a churning pot it had been during the storm. He thought wonderingly of his rescue, a man wedged unconscious between two rock teeth kept somehow from being washed away by the merest chance. 
He thought of Mrs. Kesserich sitting alone in her house, scanning the newspapers that had nothing to tell. He thought of the empty island behind him and the vanished motorboat. He wondered if the sea had pulled down Martin Kesserich and Mary Alice Pope. He wondered if only Hani and Hilda had sailed away. He winced, remembering what he had done to Martin and Mary by his blundering infatuation. In his way, he told himself he had been as bad as the two old women. He thought of death and of time and of love that defies them. He stepped limpingly into the Anio to set sail and realized that philosophy is only for the unhappy. Mary was asleep in the stern. End of Yesterday House by Fritz Leiber Recording by Richard Green www.richardgreenmagic.com Stopover by William Gherkin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Green What will the world be like the day after tomorrow for the lonely ones who will have talents that others will have fear, have envy? William Gherkin describes this strange world in which young and old will have to find new values and pursue new dreams as they search for the answer. Stopover by William Gherkin When he opened the door to the shed that day and saw the axe suspended in midair, he understood what was wrong. He had been living with us for a week before I found out he was a lifter. Even the discovery was an accident. I had started for the store, but then remembered a chore I wanted him to do. I heard the sounds of wood chopping coming from the shed, so I went behind the house to the small wooden structure. I must have gasped or something because he turned around to look at me, dropping the axe he had poised over a block of wood as he turned. Only he hadn't been holding the axe. It had been hanging in midair without support. The first time I saw him was when he knocked on my door. I don't think I'll ever forget how he looked, tall and thin, old clothes and older shoes, an unruly mop of blonde hair. It was only when I looked at his face that I realized that he was more than a mere boy of eighteen or nineteen. The tired lines around his mouth, the sad, mature look in his eyes, the stoop already evident in his young shoulders. He had been forced to mature too quickly, and seemed to have knowledge a boy his age had no right to be burdened with. I, I was wondering if I might get a bite to eat, sir, he said. I grinned. No matter how he looked, he was no different from anyone else his age where food was concerned. Sure, come on in and rest a spell, I told him. Marty, can you fix a plate of something? We've got a guest. Marty, my wife, glanced through the kitchen doorway. After a cursory look at the boy, she smiled at him and went back to work. Sit down, son, you look pretty done in. Come far today? He nodded. Guess it shows, huh? He said, brushing the road dust from his trousers. Uh-huh. Where are you from? Not around here, I know. Far back as I can remember, Oregon has been home. It wasn't hard to guess why he was almost a thousand miles from home. During the war, over ten million American families had been separated, their way of life destroyed by the hell of atomic bombings. Ever since its end, people had been seeking their loved ones, mainly only to find them dead or dying. Sometimes the searchers stretched across continents or oceans. In that respect, the boy sitting opposite me was no different from hundreds of others I've seen in the past ten years. The only difference was in his face. Looking for your family, I said, making it a statement. Yes, sir, he smiled, as though the sentence had double meaning. After he had eaten, he went down to the town store to look through its records. They all do. They turn the pages of the big stopover book, hoping to find a relative or friend had passed through the same town. Then they sign the book, put down the date and where they're headed, and set out once more. Almost all towns have stopover books nowadays, and a good thing, too. They helped me find Marty back in 63, when the truce was finally signed. In fact, I found her right here in this town. We got married, settled down, and haven't been more than a hundred miles away since then. Martha called me into the kitchen almost as soon as he was gone. He's a nice boy. That he is, I agreed. You know, I've been thinking. We could use a young fella around here to help with the work. If he'll stay, 
There was something in his eyes, a sort of longing for someone very close to him. That kind usually takes off after a night's rest. I know. I guess I'll drop by the store, see if I can talk him into staying. By the time I had reached the store, school was out, and a group of kids were gathered around him listening to his description of the Rocky Mountains, which he had crossed during the summer. The kids weren't the only ones listening. Even the adults were standing around the store, remembering the places they had once seen themselves, and getting such bits of news as he dropped about other towns he had passed through. The searchers are, next to the town radio stations, the only source of information we have now, so it's no wonder they're so warmly greeted wherever they stop. Soon as he'd finished telling about the Rockies, I said we'd appreciate it if he would stay for supper. He said he would. And later, while he and Tommy, my eight-year-old son, and I were walking home, I asked him if he'd stay with us for a while. For a moment, he looked wistful, as if wishing he could stay here and forget whoever he was trying to find. Then he smiled and said thanks. He would stay for a week or so. He was real helpful, too, cutting stove and fireplace wood for the coming winter, running errands, hunting for game animals, and teaching at the school. Almost all searchers teach when they can be persuaded to stay in town for a spell. Since there are no more colleges to produce teachers, anyone who knows something useful takes a turn at teaching. For the war, I was a mathematics major in college, so twice a week I teach all kinds of math at school, from numbers through calculus. Mostly, searchers teach about what the places they had passed through are like. Then, when I opened the door to the shed that day and saw the axe suspended in midair, I suddenly realized why he had that sad, tired look about him all the time. He picked up the axe from where it had fallen and stood it against the wall. Reaching for his jacket, he said, I I guess I'd better be moving along, Mr. Tratton. I'm really sorry if I've caused you any trouble. He started past me for the door. Hold on, son. I grabbed his arm. Why the rush? I don't want to cause you any trouble. Now that you know what I am. He gritted the words out bitterly. The word will get around. I wouldn't want the others in town to be angry with you because of me. You and Mrs. Tranton have been so swell to me. Thanks for everything. He tried to pull his arm loose, but I held fast. Let's go inside and have a cup of coffee, I suggested. I don't know about the other towns you've been through, but here we don't hate a person because he might happen to have powers we don't. Yesterday I was down at the store and I heard one of the men sounding off about us, he said. He didn't sound like he cared much for us. Must have been John Atherson. He never could understand ESP, and he blames the war on it. We just let him talk. Can't change a person like that. We went up the back steps and through the door into the kitchen. Go on, show Marty, I said, taking off my jacket. He looked at me to make sure I meant it. Then he raised the coffee pot from the stove and watched it move across the room under its own power to the table where I was sitting. Leaving the pot in midair, he made the cupboard open and still standing in the middle of the room, floated three cups and saucers to the table. Then he got the cream, sugar, and three spoons, put them on the table, and poured the coffee. Marty watched the coffee pot move back to the stove. Her mouth was open in amazement. I heard of it, but I don't think I'd have believed it if I hadn't seen it. I nodded, and she smiled at him. Now that I know, she said, I'm even gladder you chose to stay here for a while. He grinned. Thanks. He sat down with us at the table and stirred some sugar into his coffee. It must be hard on you, Marty said quietly in a knowing way. Are you really looking for your family or for others with ESP? My father was killed during the bombings. After that, Mom and I were alone. She only had a little talent. Dad and I were the ones who were really adept. Anyway, we stayed on the small farm we owned until last spring. Then Mom married again, and I was free to leave. I think her new husband was sorry to see me go, because it meant a lot of manual work for him that I had been doing in an easier way. I decided to see if I couldn't find any others like myself, so I left and started across the country. Do you have any other powers, or can you just control things? Marty asked. He grinned. If you mean, am I an all-around Superman, no, Dad wasn't either. I do have a scattering of other side talents, though, but nothing as well developed as my telekinesis. I'm still working on them. Tommy came in from school just then. Could you teach him how to use his mind that way, or do you have to be born with it, I said. 
He smiled again. No, you don't have to be born with it. Everyone can do it if they started training themselves young enough to use their minds to the fullest extent. All through history, certain people have had strange powers. The trouble was they were thought to be freaks instead of the better developed humans they actually were. Even now we're only on the threshold of learning the full power of the mind. He turned to Tommy. Would you like to learn how to do things, Tommy? Sure, like what? He glanced at Marty and me. Like making the world a better place to live? Two weeks later, at a meeting of the town council, I wasn't too worried about getting the proposal accepted. We might have some trouble with Atherson, but I figured between the two of us we could handle him. When the new business came up, I stood up and led Tommy to the front of the hall. There were a few whispers as we went, as children under fifteen aren't allowed in the hall during the council meeting. Tommy has something to say to you which I think will interest everyone here. Go on, son. Seconds afterwards, we all heard a clear hello, but not with our ears. The word came from inside our heads. Someone said, the kid's a telepath, and the silence was broken. Everybody was talking at the same time. I suppose you think it's an honor to have one of them damn things for your son, Atherson yelled. I'm glad you're the one who's got stuck and not me. Tommy was not born a telepath, John, I told him. He has been deliberately trained to make use of the latent power of his brain. And I don't think I'm stuck, either. We all know you've been slowly slipping into retrogression ever since 63. None of us like it, but there isn't anything we can do to halt it. Yet. We don't want our children or their children to keep slipping backwards. If we don't stop it in our lifetime, we may not be able to stop it at all. As I see it, the best chance we have to at least achieve a status quo is to accept the aid those among us with psi talents are willing to give. After all, it's their world, too. With their help, we may be able to build a better civilization, one without the social-political diseases that led to the war. The young man who has been staying at my house for the past three weeks taught Tommy to do what he just did. He says he thinks he can do it with any child under ten years old, and is even willing to try it with some teenagers. Of course, Tommy's training has just begun. He will keep on learning for years. Here's my idea. If some of the children get a groundling in how to develop their dormant brain power, by the time they're twenty, they'll be able to mold a new society, one geared to the present culture instead of past traditions. How about it? I waited. For a minute, there was silence. Finally, one of the older men stood up. Is he sure he can do it? All we know is it worked with Tommy, I replied. I don't like it. It's unnatural, Atherson said. No one asked you to like it, someone said. Another called. Do you think three world wars in 50 years is natural? Let's take a vote. A vote was taken, and it was decided to add an extra class for those children whose parents wanted them to attend. After a month, the council would expect a report on what progress, or lack of it, had been made. A few weeks later, when my math class was over, I hung around to watch the new class. It was divided into small groups, each training on a different side talent. One group was lifting pencils and gently returning them to desks by telekinesis. Another was sitting quietly, once in a while breaking into shouts of laughter, probably telepathy. There were other groups, but I didn't know enough about the talents to identify their work. During the time he was teaching, he met a girl. They spent quite a bit of time together, and she joined the special class. By the time the report to the council came due, it wasn't hard to tell they were in love. Just about everyone in town turned out for that meeting. The boys and girls who were taking the class were seated at the front of the hall. The report was first on the agenda so the kids could go home to bed. When we started, he said, I asked those children who weren't interested or who were um, unsuited to the work to leave. Then we ran through a general training exercise, and after a week, I split the class up into groups. Each group was to concentrate on one talent, but general sessions for the entire class give everyone practice in all talents. I think we've made fairly good progress. Some of the older teenagers have shown an interest in the talents. He glanced at his girl. And although progress has not been as rapid as with the younger children, they are sufficiently developed to help instruct. Now your children are going to demonstrate what they have learned. For the next half hour, we watched Tommy and 14 other boys and girls work. 
Tommy and the others, who had concentrated on telepathy, read silently to us from books and talked to each other, projecting their thoughts so we could also listen in. The telekinesis group all worked together to build a small table. All the necessary materials were stacked at the front of the room. The kids sat in a half circle, their brows furrowed in concentration as lumber, nails, and hammers moved under the guidance of their minds. When they had finished, the table was complete, even to the sanding and a coat of varnish. Finally, the only one with precognition, a girl about six years old with long blonde hair, gave the weather forecast for the next two weeks. Copies of her prediction were passed out to us so we could check her accuracy. Once the kids were gone, he stood up again. I hope you are all convinced as to what can be accomplished through the use of psi. The talents can and should be used for the betterment of society, not for carnival sideshows. Of course, there are more than those just demonstrated. Unfortunately, I couldn't find them present in this group. I was hoping for either a healer or a sensitive, but no one had the necessary ability. If you want the class continued, the decision is yours. Thanks for having open minds and for giving me a chance. He picked up his jacket and walked out. Atherson didn't bother to come to the meeting, so the vote to continue class was unanimous. He stayed on, teaching part-time, helping out with the work at my place, and seeing his girl. Then one afternoon, two weeks after the council meeting, she came to see me. "'You've got to stop him, Mr. Tranton,' she said. "'He's going to leave. He told me he was going right after he finished the class today. He's probably down at the store right now, buying things to take with him. You've got to make him stay.' Why? I asked quietly, watching the tears well up in her eyes. She hadn't lost her composure yet, but she felt so strongly about him she was on the verge of breaking down. Because I love him, and he loves me, she retorted, that's why. Won't you talk to him? At least get him to take me with him. Please. You said you love him. Would you rather he stayed here and was never fully happy, or left to continue searching, maybe to return someday ready to settle down? If you really love him, there's no question. Couldn't he take me with him? I shook my head. I don't think you should even ask him to take you. You'd be a burden that would slow him down. He'd worry about you, have to get your food, find shelter for you. He might let you go with him, but don't ask him to. He's too young to be tied down. Now go on and wish him good luck and kiss him goodbye. He's coming up the road now. She glanced out the open window, jumped up, and ran out into the sunlight to wait at the side of the road. I picked up the book I had been reading, but the window was too close to the road for me to concentrate on the pages. She didn't say anything until he was standing before her. I'll be waiting, she said. Take care of yourself. He nodded. I have to go, he told her, partly because it was Dad's last wish, partly because I need others of my own kind. Alone, we can't help the world much. Together, there's a good chance for results. I left a letter for the council saying you were going to take over the class because you have the ability to carry on. Watch Kathy and help her all you can. She's got it. Her weather forecast proved that much. You've got to drum that into her. Never let her forget it. Maybe I'll be back. I hope so. But first, I have to find others. I need them, and they might need me. We're still not completely self-sufficient. Give the kids my love and keep them at it. Just don't forget they are kids. Give them a chance to grow up as normally as possible. That's a chance I didn't have. He kissed her tenderly, then started off down the road. When he reached the crest of the hill, he turned and waved. Marty joined me at the doorway, and we waved too. Outlined against the bright blue afternoon sky, he stood immobile for a moment. To many, he would have just been a young man with a tired-out face, but to me, the symbol of a better life for Tommy and his children, a life unmarred by the threat of instant death as punishment for something he had little control over. He's gone now, but the work will go on and the Athersons of the world will come to realize he is giving us another chance, a chance we don't really deserve. Somehow he reminds me of another man, a man who said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. End of Stopover by William Gergen Read by Richard Green www.
www.richardgreenmagic.com. Belly Laugh by Iva Jorgensen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat. Me? I'm looking for my outfit. Got cut off in that Holland Tunnel attack. Might ever sit down with you guys a while? Thanks. Coffee? Damn! This is heaven. Ain't seen a cup of coffee in a year. What? You said it. This sure is a hell of a war. Tough on a guy's feet. Yeah, that's right. Holland Tunnel skirmish. Where the Ruskies use that new gun. Huh? God, it was awful. Guys popping off all round a guy and him not knowing why. No sense to it. No noise. No wound. Just popping off. That's the trouble with this war. It won't settle down to a routine. Always something new. What the hell chance has a guy got to figure things out? And I tell you, them Ruskies are coming up with new weapons just as fast as we are. Enough to make your hair stand on end. Sugar? Christ, yes! Ain't seen sugar for a year! You see, it's like this. We were bottled up in the pits around the tunnel for seven damn days. It was like nothing you ever saw before. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to splash you. I was laughing about something that happened there. To a guy. Maybe you guys would get a kick out of it. After all, you've got to keep a sense of humour. You see, there was me and a Kentucky kid named Stilwell in this pit. Pretty big pit with lots of room. And we were all alone. This Stilwell was a nice kid. Green and lonesome. And it's pretty sad, really. But there's a yak in it. And, as I say, we've got to keep a sense of humour. Well, this Stilwell, a really green kid, is unhappy. And just plain drooling for his gal back home. He talks about his mother, of course. And his old man. But it's the girl that's really on his mind, as you guys can plainly understand. He sees her every place, like spots in front of his eyes. Nice spots doing things to him, when this rusky babe shows up. My gun came up without orders from me, just as she poked a puss over the edge of the pit, and... Huh? Oh, thank you kindly. It sure tastes good, but I don't want to short you guys. Thank you kindly. Well, as I was saying, this rusky babe pokes her nose over the edge of the pit, and still well dives and knocks down my gun. He says, you son of a bitch, just like that. Wild and desperate, like you'd say to a guy if the guy was just kicking over the last jug of water on a desert island. It would have been long enough for her to kill us if I hadn't had good reflexes. Even then, all I had time to do was knock the pistol out of her hand and drag her into the pit. With her play bollocks, she was confused and bewildered. She ain't a fighter, and she just sits back against the wall, staring at us, deadpan, big expressionless eyes. She was plenty pretty, babe, but I could see exactly what had happened, as far as Stilwell was concerned. His spots had come to life, in a very adequate form, so to speak. Stilwell goes over, and sits down beside her, and I'm very much on the alert, because I know where his courage comes from. But I decide it's all right, because I see the babe is not belligerent, just confused, kind of, and friendly, and willing. Kind of whipped little dog willing, and man, oh man, she sure was what Stilwell needed. They kind of went together like a hand and a glove, natural-like. Had it followed, pretty natural, that when Stilwell got up and led her around the wing of the pit, out of sight, she went willing, like that same little dog. Uh, no, you guys, two's enough. I wouldn't rob you. Well, okay, and thanks kindly. Well, there I was, all alone, but happy for Stilwell, because I know it's what the kid needs, and in spots like that, what difference does it make? Yank, Rusky, Mongolian, as long as she's willing. Then you guys still well comes back, wall-eyed, real wall-eyed, like being hit but not knocked out and still walking. I know what it is, some kind of shock. I get up and walk over and take a look at the babe where he'd left her, and I burst out laughing. I told you guys there was a yak in this. I laughed like a fool. It was that funny, and as much time as I had to, before Stillwell cracked, it was enough to crack him, the little thing that pushes a guy over the edge. He lets out a yell and screams, For Christ's sake! For Christ's sake, nothing but a bucket of bolts, nothing but a couple of plastic lumps. That's when I hit him. I had to. He was for the birds. Stillwell was. An hour later, we got relieved and a couple of medicos carried him away, strapped to a stretcher. Gone like a kite. They took the robot too, and its clothes, but they forgot the brassiere. So I took it, and I've been carrying it ever since. But I'll leave it with you guys if you want. For the coffee. Might make you think about home. After all, like the man says, we've got to keep a sense of humour. Well. So long, you guys, and thanks. End of Belly Laugh by Ivor Jorgensen
Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The atomic bomb meant, to most people, the end. To Henry Bemis it meant something far different, a thing to appreciate and enjoy. Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable For a long time Henry Bemis had had an ambition, to read a book. Not just the title or the preface, or a page somewhere in the middle. He wanted to read the whole thing, all the way through from beginning to end. A simple ambition, perhaps, but in the cluttered life of Henry Bemis, an impossibility. Henry had no time of his own. There was his wife, Agnes, who owned that part of it that his employer, Mr. Carsville, did not buy. Henry was allowed enough to get to and from work, that in itself being quite a concession on Agnes's part. Also, nature had conspired against Henry by handing him a pair of hopelessly myopic eyes. Poor Henry literally couldn't see his hand in front of his face. For a while, when he was very young, his parents had thought him an idiot. When they realized it was his eyes, they got glasses for him. He was never quite able to catch up. There was never enough time. It looked as though Henry's ambition would never be realized. Then something happened which changed all that. Henry was down in the vault of the East Side Bank and Trust when it happened. He had stolen a few moments from the duties of his teller's cage to try to read a few pages of the magazine he had brought that morning. He had made an excuse to Mr. Carsville about needing bills in large denominations for a certain customer. And then, safe inside the dim recesses of the vault, he had pulled from inside his coat the pocket-sized magazine. He had just started a picture article cheerfully entitled, The New Weapons and What They'll Do to You, when all the noise in the world crashed in upon his eardrums. It seemed to be inside of him and outside of him all at once. Then the concrete floor was rising up at him, and the ceiling came slanting down toward him, and for a fleeting second Henry thought of a story he had started to read once called The Pit and the Pendulum. He regretted in that insane moment that he had never had time to finish the story, to see how it came out. Then all was darkness and quiet and unconsciousness. When Henry came to, he knew that something was desperately wrong with the East Side Bank and Trust. The heavy steel door of the vault was buckled and twisted, and the floor tilted up at a dizzy angle, while the ceiling dipped crazily toward it. Henry gingerly got to his feet, moving arms and legs experimentally. Assured that nothing was broken, he tenderly raised a hand to his eyes. His precious glasses were intact, thank God. He would never be able to find his way out of the shattered vault without them. He made a mental note to write Dr. Torrance to have a spare pair made and mailed to him. Blasted nuisance not having his prescription on file locally, but Henry trusted no one but Dr. Torrance to grind these thick lenses into his own complicated prescription. Henry removed the heavy glasses from his face. Instantly the room dissolved into a neutral blur. Henry saw a pink splash that he knew was his hand, and a white blob come up to meet the pink as he withdrew his pocket handkerchief and carefully dusted the lenses. As he replaced the glasses, they slipped down on the bridge of his nose a little. He had been meaning to have them tightened for some time. He suddenly realized, without the realization actually entering his conscious thoughts, that something momentous had happened, something worse than the boiler blowing up, something worse than a gas main exploding, something worse than anything that had ever happened before. 
He felt that way because it was so quiet. There was no whine of sirens, no shouting, no running, just an ominous and all-pervading silence. Henry walked across the slanted floor. Slipping and stumbling on the uneven surface, he made his way to the elevator. The car lay crumbled at the foot of the shaft, like a discarded accordion. There was something inside of it that Henry could not look at, something that had once been a person, or perhaps several people. It was impossible to tell now. Feeling sick, Henry staggered toward the stairway. The steps were still there, but so jumbled and piled back upon one another that it was more like climbing the side of a mountain than mounting a stairway. It was quiet in the huge chamber that had been the lobby of the bank. It looked strangely cheerful, with the sunlight shining through the girders where the ceiling had been. The dappled sunlight glinted across the silent lobby, and everywhere there were huddled lumps of unpleasantness that made Henry sick as he tried not to look at them. "'Mr. Carsville,' he called. It was very quiet. Something had to be done, of course. This was terrible, right in the middle of a Monday, too. Mr. Carsville would know what to do. He called again, more loudly, and his voice cracked hoarsely. "'Mr. Carsville!' And then he saw an arm and a shoulder extending out from under a huge, fallen block of marble ceiling. In the buttonhole was the white carnation Mr. Carsville had worn to work that morning, and on the third finger of that hand was a massive signet ring, also belonging to Mr. Carsville. Numbly, Henry realized that the rest of Mr. Carsville was under that block of marble. Henry felt a pang of real sorrow. Mr. Carsville was gone, and so was the rest of the staff, Mr. Wilkinson, and Mr. Emery, and Mr. Pritchard, and the same with Pete and Ralph and Jenkins, and Hunter and Pat the guard, and Willie the doorman. There was no one to say what was to be done about the East Side Bank and Trust, except Henry Bemis. And Henry wasn't worried about the bank. There was something he wanted to do. He climbed carefully over piles of fallen masonry. Once he stepped down into something that crunched and squished beneath his feet, and he set his teeth on edge to keep from retching. The street was not much different from inside, bright sunlight and so much concrete to crawl over, but the unpleasantness was much, much worse. Everywhere there were strange, motionless lumps that Henry could not look at. Suddenly he remembered Agnes. He should be trying to get to Agnes. He remembered a poster he had seen that said, In event of emergency, do not use the telephone. Your loved ones are as safe as you. He wondered about Agnes. He looked at the smashed automobiles, some with their four wheels pointing skyward, like the stiffened legs of dead animals. He couldn't get to Agnes now anyway. If she was safe, then she was safe. Otherwise, of course, Henry knew Agnes wasn't safe. He had a feeling that there wasn't anyone safe for a long, long way. Maybe not in the whole state, or in the whole country, or in the whole world. No, that was a thought Henry didn't want to think. He forced it from his mind and turned his thoughts back to Agnes. She had been a pretty good wife now that it was all said and done. It wasn't exactly her fault if people didn't have time to read nowadays. It was just that there was the house, and the bank, and the yard. There were the Joneses for Bridge, and the Graysons for Canasta, and charades with the Bryants, and the television, the television Agnes loved to watch, but would never watch alone. He never had time to read even a newspaper. He started to think about last night, that business about the newspaper. Henry had settled into his chair quietly, afraid that a creaking spring might call to Agnes's attention the fact that he was momentarily unoccupied. 
He had unfolded the newspaper slowly and carefully. The sharp crackling of the paper would have been a clarion call to Agnes. He had glanced at the headline of the first page. Collapse of conference imminent. He didn't have time to read the article. He turned to the second page. Salon predicts war only days away. He flipped through the pages faster, reading brief snatches here and there afraid to spend too much time on any one item. On the back page was a brief article entitled, Prehistoric Artifacts Unearthed in Yucatan. Henry smiled to himself and carefully folded the sheet of the paper into fourths. That would be interesting. He would read all of it. Then it came. Agnes's voice. Henry! And then she was upon him. She lightly flicked the paper out of his hands and into the fireplace. He saw the flames lick up and curl progressively around the unread article. Agnes continued. Henry, tonight is the Jones's Bridge night. They'll be here in thirty minutes and I'm not dressed yet, and here you are, reading. She had emphasized the last word as though it were some unclean act. Hurry and shave. You know how smooth Jasper Jones' chin always looks. And then straighten up this room. She glanced regretfully toward the fireplace. Oh, dear, that paper, the television schedule. Oh, well, after the Joneses leave, there won't be time for anything but the late, late movie. And don't just sit there, Henry. Hurry! Henry was hurrying now, but hurrying too much. He caught his leg on a twisted piece of metal that had once been an automobile fender. He thought about things like lockjaw and gangrene, and his hands trembled as he tied his pocket handkerchief around the wound. In his mind, he saw the fire again, licking across the face of last night's newspaper. He thought that now he would have time to read all the newspapers he wanted to. Only now, there wouldn't be any more. That heap of rubble across the street had been the Gazette building. It was terrible to think there would never be another up-to-date newspaper. Agnes would have been very upset. No television schedule. But then, of course, no television. He wanted to laugh, but he didn't. That wouldn't have been fitting, not at all. He could see the building he was looking for now but the silhouette was strangely changed. The great circular dome was now a ragged semicircle, half of it gone, and one of the great wings of the building had fallen in upon itself. A sudden panic gripped Henry Bemis. What if they were all ruined, destroyed, every one of them? What if there wasn't a single one left? Tears of helplessness welled in his eyes, as he painfully fought his way over and through the twisted fragments of the city. He thought of the building when it had been whole. He remembered many nights he had paused outside its wide and welcoming doors. He thought of the warm nights when the doors had been thrown open and he could see the people inside, see them sitting at the plain wooden tables with a stack of books beside them. He used to think then, what a wonderful thing a public library was. A place where anybody, anybody at all, could go in and read. He had been tempted to enter many times. He had watched people through the open doors. The man in greasy work clothes who sat near the door, night after night, laboriously studying a technical journal, perhaps. Difficult for him, but promising a bright future. There had been an aged, scholarly gentleman who sat on the other side of the door, leisurely paging, moving his lips a little as he did so, a man having little time left, but rich in the time because he could do with it as he chose. Henry had never gone in. He had started up the steps once, almost got to the door, but then he remembered Agnes, her questions and shouting and he had turned away. He was going in now, though, almost crawling, 
his breath coming in stabbing gasps, his hands torn and bleeding. His trouser leg was sticky red, where the wound in his leg had soaked through the handkerchief. It was throbbing badly, but Henry didn't care. He had reached his destination. Part of the inscription was still there, over the now doorless entry. P-U-B-C-L-I-B-R The rest had been torn away. The place was in shambles. The shelves were overturned, broken, smashed, tilted. Their precious contents spilled in disorder upon the floor. A lot of the books, Henry noted gleefully, were still intact, still whole, still readable. He was literally knee-deep in them. He wallowed in books. He picked one up. The title was The Collected Works of William Shakespeare. Yes, he must read that sometime. He lay it aside carefully. He picked up another, Spinoza. He tossed it away, seized another, and another, and still another. Which to read first? There were so many... He had been conducting himself a little like a starving man in a delicatessen, grabbing a little of this and a little of that in a frenzy of enjoyment. But now he steadied away. From the pile about him he selected one volume, sat comfortably down on an overturned shelf, and opened the book. Henry Bemis smiled. There was a rumbling of complaining stones minute in comparison with the epic complaints following the fall of the bomb. This one occurred under one corner of the shelf upon which Henry sat. The shelf moved, threw him off balance. The glasses slipped from his nose and fell with a tinkle. He bent down, clawing blindly, and found, finally, their smashed remains. A minor, indirect destruction stemming from the sudden, wholesale smashing of a city. But the only one that greatly interested Henry Bemis. He stared down at the blurred page before him. He began to cry. The End of Time Enough at Last by Lynn Venable Handyman by Frank Banta. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. They didn't have to worry about a thing for the rest of their natural lives. Handyman by Frank Banta. James Ypsilanti swung at the door with a stake cuber. Or was it a cube staker? No matter. The door was a good, hardwood door, and resisted his onslaught well. But time was on his side. He had the energy and the time, he knew, and sooner or later the door would be kindling. It was the door to his room. It was evident to him that he did not need the door to his room, and that he did need heat. In fact, he had better get some heat pretty soon, although he was keeping warm enough for the present by beating on the door. So he would beat this door to kindling, and then he would build a nice, cozy fire in the hall that would keep him warm for a long time, if he was stingy with his fuel. The carpenter came by. The carpenter was always coming by, except when you wanted him, Jim realized. The carpenter was a mighty, mighty busy fellow. The carpenter stopped short when he saw Jim demolishing the door. In fact, he came to a grinding halt. Jim, why didn't you tell me? Carpenter, how was I to know where you were? Who can ever find you? I know, Jim. Jim, you work so hard. Yes, he said, pounding. Take this hatchet, Jim. A hatchet is what you demolish doors with. Goodbye. The carpenter departed. Jim Ypsilanti swung on the door with his newly acquired hatchet. 
Soon he was ready for his fire. He struck a match, and in no time had a pile of varnished kindling blazing smokily in the hall. He held his hands over the blaze. Ah, good, good, good. He closed his eyes. What could be better than this? Then he opened them again regretfully. It's dinner time. I'd better fix it while I have my fire going. He hurried to the kitchen and chose a can of eggs, bacon, and pancakes from the massive stores. Opening the large can, he heated it over his hall fire. Then he dumped the contents on his tin plate and ate. Murder, he thought somberly. That's what I'm in for. Practically murder with consent. She said she couldn't live without me. Marge begged me to kill her, you might as well say. Good old Marge, a good kid, but I killed her. And now, well, that's life. He speared a pancake. Damn, but it's cold. He threw an armload of wood on the fire and it blazed up. Sure wish those carpenters had feelings. My lord, they've got no feelings at all. The carpenter arrived with a new hardwood door. Whistling cheerfully, he began to install it, where the other one had just been hatcheted away. Carpenter, that door won't stay there long. I'm almost out of fuel. I hope you don't expect me to be surprised, Jim. If the door doesn't last very long, the previous twenty-four doors at this location, Jim, did not last very long either. Still whistling to himself, he installed the last of the hinge screws. Why don't you just give me the doors instead of causing yourself all this work? demanded James Ypsilanti. Inmates will not be issued materials, Jim. I've quoted that section of the rules to you many times, Jim. But couldn't you just lean the door up against the door jam and leave it? argued the inmate. You go to a ridiculous amount of trouble. It's not ridiculous, Jim. I'm a carpenter, Jim. Goodbye. After lunch, James Ypsilanti crawled into his escape tunnel. He liked to go in there every day and daydream. The tunnel ended abortively at the wall of the prison, for the prison wall extended down into solid bedrock for a meter, and it was fabricated of one meter thick compressed steel. It was the nearest thing to an exit that the prison had. Officials had always come and gone through the massive, englobing wall by matter transmitters. Smarties couldn't find me, though, when I was in my escape tunnel, he chortled as he stretched out in the cave under the concrete. They can walk through walls, but they couldn't find me. Then his tone became baleful. The Smarties'll never find me. As James Ypsilanti chopped on the door next day, the carpenter stood cheerily watching. Carpenter, why don't you fix the damn heating plant? Then I wouldn't have to chop up your doors all the time to keep warm. I am a carpenter, Jim, not a heating plant fixture, as you well know from our previous negotiations on the subject. What will you do, carpenter, when I have used up all your doors? The convict jibed. Why, Jim, we will have to send out for more, the carpenter answered condescendingly. Still, I wish you would let me work on that heating plant, urged Ypsilanti. I might fix it. Inmates will not be permitted to disassemble or otherwise interfere with the machinery of the institution, quoted the carpenter. Need I say more, Jim? Okay, said James Ypsilanti, resuming his destructive work on the new door. Scram, stupid. The carpenter departed. That dope, Jim said between blows, is even foggier in the head than my lousy lawyer was, and that's going some. Jim, said the carpenter, returning, and sounding very pleased with himself. Look here what I have found, Jim. Jim Ypsilanti turned to look at what the carpenter held in his hand. It was a carpenter square, sheathed in plastic. Found enough of them to last me a lifetime, Jim, said the carpenter competently. I'll never have to buy any. No, you won't, agreed James Ypsilanti bitterly. 
Can't you get it into your head that you and I are the only ones left on Earth? After the war, the rest left. They couldn't find us when they evacuated this atomic explosion-wrecked planet, because we were in this escape-proof jug. So they went away and left us. I know, Jim. Ypsilanti studied the mobile features of the carpenter, searching intently for a sign. But the carpenter robot strolled away, whistling. The End of Handyman by Frank Banta The Smiler by Albert Hernhunter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Caveat The Smiler by Albert Hernhunter Your name? Cole. Martin Cole. Your profession? A very important one. I'm a literary agent specializing in science fiction. I sell the work of various authors to magazine and book publishers. The coroner paused to study Cole, to ponder the thin, mirthless smile. The coroner said, Mr. Cole, this inquest has been called to look into the death of one Sanford Smith, who was found near your home with a gun in his hand and a bullet in his brain. The theory of suicide has been rather hard to rationalize? The coroner blinked. You could put it that way. I would have put it even stronger. The theory is obviously ridiculous. It was a weak cover-up, the best I could do under the circumstances. You are saying that you killed Sanford Smith? Of course. The coroner glanced at his six-man jury, at the two police officers, at the scattering of spectators. They all seemed stunned. Even the reporter said to cover the hearing made no move forward toward the telephone. The coroner could think of only the obvious question. Why did you kill him? He was dangerous to us. Whom do you mean by us? We Martians, who plan to take over your world. The coroner was disappointed. A lunatic, but a lunatic can't murder. Best to proceed, the coroner thought. I was not aware that we have Martians to contend with. If I'd had the right weapon to use on Smith, you wouldn't be aware of it now. We still exercise caution. The coroner felt a certain pity. Why did you kill Smith? We Martians have found science fiction writers to be our greatest danger. Through the medium of imaginative fiction, such writers have more than once revealed our plans, if the public suddenly realized that. The coroner broke in. You killed Smith because he revealed something in his writings. Yes, he refused to take my word that it was unsaleable. He threatened to submit it direct. It was vital material. But there are many other such writers. You can't control. We control 90% of the output. We have concentrated on the field and all the science fiction agencies are in our hands. This control was imperative. I see, the coroner spoke in the gentle tones one uses with the insane. Any writing dangerous to your cause is deleted or changed by the agents. Not exactly. The agent usually persuades the writer to make any such changes, as the agent is considered an authority on what will or will not sell. The writers always agree? Not always. If stubbornness is encountered, the agent merely shelves the manuscripts and tells the writer it has been repeatedly rejected. The coroner glanced at the two policemen. Both were obviously puzzled. They returned the coroner's look, apparently ready to move on his order. The thin, mirthless smile was still on Cole's lips. Maniacal violence could lie just behind it. Possibly Cole was armed. Better to play for time. Tried to quiet the madness within. The coroner continued speaking. You Martians have infiltrated other fields also? Oh, yes. We are in the government, industry, education. We are everywhere. We have, of course, concentrated mainly upon the ranks of labor and in the masses of ordinary, everyday people. It is from these sources that we will draw our shock troops when the time comes. That time will be soon, very soon. The coroner could not forbear a smile. You find the science fiction writers more dangerous than the true scientists. Oh, yes. The scientific mind tends to reject anything science disproves. There was now a mocking edge to Cole's voice. Science can easily prove we do not exist. But the science fiction writer? The danger from the imaginative mind cannot be overestimated. The coroner knew he must soon order the officers to lay hands upon this madman. 
He regretted his own lack of experience with such situations. He tried to put a soothing, confidential note into his voice. You said a moment ago that you'd had the right kind of weapon to use on Smith. Cole reached into his pocket and brought out what appeared to be a fountain pen. This. It kills instantly and leaves no mark whatever. Heart failure is invariably stated as the cause of death. The coroner felt better. Obviously Cole was not armed. As the coroner raised a hand to signal the officers, Cole said, You understand, oh, of course, that I can't let you live. Take this man into custody. The police officers did not move. The coroner turned on them sharply. They were smiling. Cole pointed the fountain pen. The coroner felt a sharp chill on his flesh. He looked at the jury, at the newspaper man, the spectators. They were all smiling, cold, thin, terrible smiles. A short time later, the newspaper man phoned in his story. The afternoon editions carried it. Coroner Bell dies of heart attack. Shortly after this morning's inquest, which resulted in a jury verdict of suicide in the case of Sanford Smith, Coroner James Bell dropped dead of heart failure in the hearing room of the county building. Mr. Bell leaves a wife and the end. End of The Smiler by Albert Hearn Hunter No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Carcamo No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings I can't tell anyone about it. In the first place, they'd never believe me. And if they did, I'd probably be punished for having her, because we weren't allowed to have pets of any kind. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't sent me way out there to work, but, you see, there are so many things I can't do. I remember the day the chief of vocation took me before the council. I've tried him on a dozen things, he reported. People always talk about me as if I can't understand what they mean, but I'm not really that dumb. There doesn't seem to be a thing he can do, the chief went on. Actually... His intelligence seems to be no greater than that which we believe our ancestors had back in the twentieth century. As bad as that, observed one of the council members, you do have a problem. But we must find something for him to do, said another. We can't have an idle person in this state. It's unthinkable. But what? asked the chief. He's utterly incapable of running any of the machines. I've tried to teach him. The only things he can do are already being done much better by robots. There was a long silence, broken at last by one little old council member. I have it, he cried. The very thing. We'll make him guard of the treasure. But there's no need of a guard. No one will touch the treasure without permission. We haven't had a dishonest person in the state for more than three thousand years. That's it exactly. There aren't any dishonest people. So there won't be anything for him to do. But we will have solved the problem of his idleness. It might be a solution, said the chief. At least a temporary one. I suppose we will have to find something else later on, but this will give us time to look for something. So I became guard of the treasure, with a badge, and nothing to do, unless you count watching the key. The gates were kept locked, just as they were in the old days, but the large key hung beside them. Of course, no one wanted to bother carrying it around. It was too heavy. The only ones who ever used it anyway were members of the council. As the man said, we haven't had a dishonest person in the state for thousands of years. Even I know that much. Of course, this left me with lots of time on my hands. That's how I happened to get her in the first place. I'd always wanted one, but pets were forbidden. Busy people didn't have time for them. 
so I knew I was breaking the law. But I figured that no one would ever find out. First, I fixed a place for her, and made a brush screen so that she couldn't be seen by anyone coming to the gates. Then, one night, I sneaked into the forest and got her. It wasn't so lonely after that. Now I had something to talk to. She was so small when I got her, it would be too dangerous to go near a full-grown one, but she grew rapidly. That was because I caught small animals and brought them to her. Not having to depend on what she could catch, she grew almost twice as fast as usual, and was so sleek and pretty. Really, she was a pet to be proud of. I don't know how I could have stood the four months there alone if I hadn't her to talk to. I don't think she really understood me, but I pretended she did, and that helped. Every three or four weeks, three of the council members came to take part of the treasure, or add to it. Always three of them. That's why I was so surprised one day to see one man coming by himself. It was Grem, the little old member who had recommended that I be given this job. I was happy to see him, and we talked for a while mostly about my work and how I liked it. I almost told him about my pet, but I didn't, because he might get angry at me for breaking the law. Finally, he asked me to give him the key. I've been sent to get something from the treasure, he explained. I was unhappy to displease him, but I said, I can't let you have it. There must be three members. You know that. Of course I know it. But something came up suddenly, so they sent me alone. Now let me have it. I shook my head. That was the one order they had given me. Never give the key to any one person who came alone. Graham became quite angry. You idiot, he shouted. Why do you think I had you put out here? It was so I could get in there and help myself to the treasure. But that would be dishonest, and there are no dishonest people in the state. For three thousand years, I know. His usually kind face had an ugly look I had never seen before. But I'm going to get part of that treasure, and it won't do you any good to report it, because no one is going to take the word of a fool like you against a respected council member. They'll think you are the dishonest one. Now, give me that key! It's a terrible thing to disobey a council member. But if I obeyed him, I would be disobeying all the others. And that would be worse. No, I shouted. He threw himself upon me. For his size and age, he was very strong, stronger even than I. I fought as hard as I could, but I knew I wouldn't be able to keep him away from the key for very long. And if he took the treasure, I would be blamed. The council would have to think a new punishment for dishonesty. Whatever it was, it would be terrible indeed. He drew back and rushed me. Just as he hit me, my foot caught upon a root, and I fell. His rush carried him past me, and he crashed through the brush screen beside the path. I heard him scream twice. Then there was silence. I was bruised all over, but I managed to pull myself up and take away what was left of the screen. There was no sign of Grem, but my beautiful pet was waving her pearl-green feelers, as she always did in thanks for a good meal. That's why I can't tell anyone what happened. No one would believe that Grem would be dishonest. And I can't prove it, because she ate the proof. Even if I did tell them, no one is going to believe that a flycatcher plant, even a big one like mine, would actually be able to eat a man. So they think Grem disappeared, and I'm still out here with her. She's grown much larger now and more beautiful than ever, but I hope she hasn't developed a taste for human flesh. Lately, she stretches out her feelers. It seems she's trying to reach me. End of No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings Recording by Sam Carcamo The Stellar Legion by Lee Brackett this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Collie McMahon. The Stellar Legion by Lee Brackett. Silence was on the barracks like a lid clamped over tight coiled springs. Men in rumpled uniforms, outlanders of the Stellar Legion, space rats, the scrapings of the solar system, sweated in the sullen heat of the Venusian swamplands before the rains, sweated and listened. The metal door clanged open to admit Len, the young Venusian commandant, and every man jerked tautly to his feet. Ian McGeehan, the white-haired, space-burned Earthman, alone and hungrily poised for action. Thecla, the swart Martian low-canaller, grinning like a weasel beside Back, the hulking strangler from Titan. Every quick, nervous glance was riveted on Len. The young officer stood silent in the open door, tugging at his fair mustache. To McGeehan, watching, he was a trim, clean incongruity in this brutal wilderness of savagery and iron men. Behind him, the eternal mist writhed in a thin curtain over the swamp, stretching for miles beyond the soggy earthworks. Through it came the sound every ear had listened to for days, a low, monotonous piping that seemed to ring from the ends of the earth. The Nahali, the six-foot, scarlet-eyed swamp-dwellers, whose touch was weapon enough, praying to their gods for rain. When it came, the hot, torrential downpour of southern Venus, the Nahali would burst in a scaly tide over the fort. Only a moat of charged water and four electro-cannons stood between the Legion and the Horde. If those things failed, it meant two hundred lives burned out, the circle of protective forts broken, the fertile uplands plundered and laid waste. McKeon looked at Len's clean, university-bred young face and wondered cynically if he was strong enough to do his job. Len spoke so abruptly that the men started. I'm calling for volunteers, a reconnaissance in Holly territory. You know well enough what that means. Three men. Well? Ian McKeon stepped forward, followed instantly by the Martian Thecla. Back, the Titan hesitated, his queerly bright blank eyes darting from Thecla to Len and back to McKeon. Then he stepped up, his hairy face twisted in a sly grin. Len eyed them, his mouth hard with distaste under his fair mustache. Then he nodded and said, Report in an hour, light equipment. Turning to go, he added, almost as an afterthought, Report to my quarters, McKeon, immediately. McKeon's bony Celtic face tightened and his blue eyes narrowed with wary distrust. But he followed Len, his gaunt, powerful body as ramrod straight as the Venusian's own and no eye that watched him go held any friendship. Thecla laughed silently, like a cat with his pointed white teeth. Two of a kind, he whispered. Hope they choke each other. Bach grunted, flexing his mighty six-fingered hands. In his quarters, Len, his pink face flushed, strode up and down, while McGeehan waited dourly. It was plain enough what was coming. McGeehan felt the old, bitter, defensive anger rising in him. Look, he told himself inwardly, Books, good cigars, a girl's picture on the table. You had all that once, you damn fool. Why couldn't you? Len stopped abruptly in front of him, gray eyes steady. I'm new here, McGeehan, he said, but we've been Legion men for five generations, and I know the law. No man is to be questioned about his past. I'm going to break the law. Why are you here, McGeehan? McGeehan's white head was gaunt and stubborn as Tantalon Rock, and he kept silent. I'm trying to help, Len went on. You've been an officer. Every man in the barracks knows that. If you're here for any reason but failure in duty, you can be an officer again. I'll relieve you of special duty. You can start working for the examinations. No need to waste you in the ranks. Well? McGeehan's eyes were hidden, but his voice was harsh. What's behind this, Len? What the hell is it to you? The Venusian's level gaze wavered. For a moment, the boy looked through the man, and McGeehan felt a quick stab in his heart. Then all that was gone, and Len said curtly, If you find the barracks congenial, stay there, by all means. Dismissed. McGeehan glared at him half blindly for a moment, his fine long hands clenching and unclenching at his sides. Then he bout faced with vicious smartness and went out. Nearly an hour later, he stood with the Martian Thecla on the earthworks, waiting. The monotonous pipes prayed on in the swamp. McGeehan, looking up at the heavy sky, prayed just as hard that it would not rain, not just yet. Because if it rained before the patrol left, the patrol would not leave. Then Ahali would be on the march with the very first drop. My chance would be gone, he whispered to himself. Thecla's bright black eyes studied him as they always did, an insolent, mocking scrutiny that angered the Scot. Well, he said dryly, the perfect soldier, the gallant volunteer, for love of Venus, Thecla, or love of the Legion? 
Perhaps, said Thecla softly, for the same reason you did, Earthman. Perhaps not. His face, the swart, hard face of a low canal outlaw, was turned abruptly toward the mist-wrapped swamp. Love of Venus, he snarled. Who could love this lousy sweat box? Not even Len, if he had the brains of a flea. Mars is better, eh? McGeehan had a sudden inspiration. Cool, dry air and little dark women and the wine shops on the Jakara Low Canal? You'd like to be back there, wouldn't you? To himself, he thought in savage pleasure. I'll pay you out, you little scum. You tortured me with what I've lost until I'd have killed you if it hadn't been against my plan. All right, see if you can take it. The slow dusk was falling. Thecla's dark face was a blur, but McGeehan knew he'd got home. The fountains in the palace gardens, Thecla. The sun bursting up over red deserts. The singing girls in the thill in Madame Khan's. Remember the thill, Thecla? Ice cold, greenish, bubbling in blue glasses? He knew why Thecla snarled and sprang at him. And it wasn't Thecla he threw down on the soft earth, so much as a tall youngster with a fair mustache, who had goaded with good intent. Funny thought McGeehan, that well-intentioned goads hurt worse than the other kind. A vast paw closed on his shoulder, hauling him back. Another, he saw, yanked Thecla upright. And Bach the Titan's hairy travesty of a face peered down at them. Listen, he grunted in his oddly articulated Esperanto. I know it's up. I got ears, and the village houses got thin walls. I heard the Nahali girl talking. I don't know which one of you has the treasure, but I want it. If I don't get it. His fingers slid higher on McGeehan's shoulders, gripping his throat. Six fingers, like iron clamps. McGeehan heard Thecla choking and cursing. He managed to gasp, You're in the wrong place, Bach. We're men. I thought you only strangled women. The grip slackened a trifle. Men, too, said Bach slowly. That's why I had to run away from Titan. That's why I've had to run away from everywhere, men or women, anyone who laughs at me. McGeehan looked at the blank-eyed, revolting face and wondered that anyone could laugh at it, pity it, shut it harmlessly away, but not laugh. Bach's fingers fell away abruptly. They laugh at me, he repeated miserably, and run away. I know I'm ugly, but I want friends and a wife like anyone else, especially a wife. They laugh at me, the women do, when I ask them, and he was shaking suddenly with rage, and his face was a beast face, blind and brutal, and I kill them. I kill the damn little vixens that laugh at me. He stared stupidly at his great hands. Then I have to run away, always running away, alone. The bright empty eyes met McGeehan's with deadly purpose. That's why I want the money. If I have the money, they'll like me. Women always like men who have money. If I kill one of you, I'll have to run away again. But if I have someone to go with me, I won't mind. Thecla showed his pointy teeth. Try strangling in the Halley girl, Bach, then we'll be rid of you. Bach grunted. Not a fool. I know what the Nahali do to you. But I want that money the girl told about, and I'll get it. I'd get it now, only Len will come. He stood over them, grinning. McGeehan drew back between pity and disgust. The Legion is certainly the system's garbage dump, he muttered in Martian loud enough for Thecla to hear, and smiled at the low canaler's stifled taunt. Stifled, because Len was coming up, his heavy water boots thudding on the soggy ground. Without a word, the three fell in behind the officer, whose face had taken on an unfamiliar, stony grimness. McGeehan wondered whether it was anger at him or fear of what they might get into in the swamp. Then he shrugged. The young cub would have to follow his own trail wherever it led, and McGeehan took a stern comfort from this thought. His own feet were irrevocably directed. There was no doubt, no turning back. He'd never have again to go through what Len was going through. All he had to do was wait. The plank bridge groaned under them, almost touching the water in the moat. Most ingenious, that moat. The Nahali could swim it in their sleep normally. But when the conductor rods along the bottom were turned on, they literally burned out their circuits from an overload. The swamp rats packed a bigger potential than any earthly electric eel. Ian McGeehan, looking at the lights of the squalid village that lay below the fort, reflected that the Nahali had at least one definitely human trait. The banging of a three-tiered Venusian piano echoed in the heavy air, along with the shouts and laughter that indicated a free flow of swamp juice. This link in the chain of stations surrounding the swamplands was fully garrisoned only during the rains, and the less warlike Nahali were busy harvesting what they could from the soldiers and the rabble that came after them. Queer creatures, the swamp rats, with their ruby eyes and iridescent scales. Nature, in adapting them to their wet, humid environment, had left them somewhere between warm-blooded mammals and cold-blooded reptiles, 
anthropoid in shape, man-sized, capricious. The most remarkable thing about them was their breathing apparatus, each epithelial cell forming a tiny electrolysis plant to extract oxygen from water. Since they lived equally on land and in water, and since the swamp air was almost a mist, it suited them admirably. That was why they had to wait for the rains to go raiding in the fertile uplands, and that was why hundreds of inner-world legionnaires had to swelter on the strip of soggy ground between swamp and plateau to stop them. McKeon was last in line. Just as his foot left the planks, four heads jerked up as one, facing to the darkening sky. Rain! Big drops, splattering slowly down, making a sibilant whisper across the swamp. The pipes broke off, leaving the ears a little deafened with the lack of them after so long. And McGeehan, looking at Len, swore furiously in his heart. The three men paused, expecting an order to turn back, but Len waved them on. But it's raining, protested Bach, or it caught in the attack. The officer's strangely hard face was turned toward them. No, he said with an odd finality, they won't attack, not yet. They went on toward the swamp that was worse in silence than it had been with the praying pipes, and McKeon, looking ahead at the oddly assorted men plowing grimly through the mud, caught a sudden glimpse of something dark and hidden, something beyond the simple threat of death that hung always over a reconnoitering patrol. The swamp folded them in. It is never truly dark on Venus, owing to the thick, diffusing atmosphere. There was enough light to show branching muddy trails, great still pools choked with weeds, the spreading liha trees with their huge pollen pods, everything dripping with the slow rain. McGeehan could hear the thudding of that rain for miles around on the silent air, the sullen forerunner of the deluge. Fort and village were lost in sodden twilight. Len's boots squelched onward through the mud of a trail that rose gradually to a ridge of higher ground. When he reached the top, Len turned abruptly, his electro-gun seeming to materialize in his hand, and McKeon was startled by the bleak look of his pink young face. "'Stop right there,' said Len quietly. "'Keep your hands up, and don't speak until I'm finished.' He waited a second, with the rain drumming on his waterproof coverall, dripping from the ends of his fair mustache. The others were obedient, Bach a great grinning hulk between the two slighter men. Len went on calmly. Someone has sold us out to the Nahali. That's how I know they won't attack until they get the help they're waiting for. I had to find out, if possible, what preparations they've made for destroying our electrical supply, our only vulnerable point. But I had a double purpose in calling this party. Can you guess what it is? McGeehan could. Len continued. The traitor had his price, escape from the Legion, from Venus, through the swamp to Leva, where he can ship out on a tramp. His one problem was to get away from the fort without being seen, since all leaves had been temporarily cancelled. Len's mist-gray eyes were icy. I gave him that chance. Bach laughed, an empty, jarring road. See? That's what the Nahali girl said. She said he can get what he needs now. He'll get away before the rains, probably with a patrol. And then our people can attack. I know what he needed. Money. And I want it. Shut up. Len's electro-gun gestured peremptorily. I want the truth of this. Which one of you is the traitor? Thecla's pointed white teeth gleamed. McGeehan loves the Legion, sir. He couldn't be guilty. Len's gaze crossed McGeehan's briefly, and again the Scot had a fleeting glimpse of something softer beneath the new hardness. It was something that took him back across time to a day when he had been a green subaltern in the Terran Guards, and a hard-bitten, battle-tempered senior officer had filled the horizon for him. It was the something that had made Len offer him a chance, when his trap was set and sprung. It was the something that was going to make Len harder on him now than on either Bach or Thecla. It was hero worship. McGeehan groaned inwardly. Look here, he said. We're in Nahali country. There may be trouble at any moment. Do you think this is the time for detective work? You may have caught the wrong men anyway. Better do your job of reconnoitering and worry about the identity of the traitor back in the fort. You're not an officer now, McGeehan, snapped Len. Speak up and I want the truth. You, Thecla. Thecla's black eyes were bitter. I'd as well be here as anywhere since I can't be on Mars. How can I go back with a hanging charge against me? McGeehan? Len's gray graze was leveled stiffly past his head, and McGeehan was quivering suddenly with rage, rage against the life that had brought him where he was, against Len, who was the symbol of all he had thrown away. Think what you like, he whispered, and be damned. Bach's movement came so swiftly that it caught everyone unprepared. 
Handling the Martian like a child's beanbag, he picked him up and hurled him against Len. The electro gun spat a harmless bolt into empty air as the two fell struggling in the mud. Mickey and sprang forward, but Bach's great fingers closed on his neck. With his free hands, the Titan dragged Thecla upright. He held them both helpless while he kicked the sprawling Len in the temple. In the split second before unconsciousness took him, Len's eyes met McGeehan's, and they were terrible eyes. McGeehan groaned, you young fool. Then Len was down, and Box fingers were throttling him. Which one? snarled the Titan. Give me the money, and I'll let you go. I'm going to have the money if I have to kill you. Then the girls won't laugh at me. Tell me, which one? McGeehan's blue eyes widened suddenly. With all his strength, he fought to croak out one word. Nahali! Bach dropped them with a grunt. Swinging his great hands, forgetting his gun completely, he stood at bay. There was a rush of bodies in the rain-blurred dusk, a flash of scarlet eyes and triangular mouths laughing in queer, noseless faces. Then there were scaly, man-like things hurled like battering rams against the legionnaires. McGeehan's gun spat blue flame. Two Nahali fell, electrocuted, but there were too many of them. His helmet was torn off so that his drenched white hair blinded him. Rubber-shod fists and feet lashed against reptilian flesh. Somewhere just out of sight, Thecla was cursing breathlessly in low canal argot, and Len, still dazed, was crawling gamely to his feet. His helmet had protected him from the full force of Bach's kick. The hulking titan loomed in the midst of a swarm of red-eyed swamp rats, and McGeehan saw abruptly that he had taken off his clumsy gloves when he had made ready to strangle his mates. The great six-fingered hands stretched hungrily toward a Nahali throat. Bach, yelled McGeehan, don't! The titan's heavy laughter drowned him out. The vast paws closed in a joyous grip. On the instant, Bach's great body bent and jerked convulsively. He slumped down, the heart burned out of him by the electricity circuited through his hands. Len's gun spoke. There was a reek of ozone, and an Ahali screamed like a stricken reptile. The Venusian cried out in sudden pain and was silent. McGeehan, Struggling upright, saw him buried under a pile of scaly bodies. Then a clammy paw touched his own face. He moaned as a numbing shock struck through him and lapsed into semi-consciousness. He had vague memories of being alternately carried and towed through warm lakes and across solid ground. He knew dimly that he was dumped roughly under a liha tree in a clearing where there were thatched huts, and that he was alone. After what seemed a very long time, he sat up, and his surroundings were clear. Even more clear was Thecla's dark, thin face, peering amusedly down at him. The Martian bared his white, pointed teeth and said, Hello, traitor. McGeehan would have risen and struck him, only that he was weak and dizzy. And then he saw that Thecla had a gun. His own holster was empty. McGeehan got slowly to his feet, raking the white hair out of his eyes, and he said, You dirty little rat. Thecla laughed, as a fox might laugh at a baffled hound. Go ahead and curse me, McGeehan, you high and mighty renegade. You were right. I'd rather swing on Mars than live another month in this damn sweat box. And I can laugh at you, Ian McGeehan. I'm going back to the deserts and the wine shops on the Jakara Low Canal. The Nahali girl didn't mean money. She meant plastic surgery to give me another face. I'm free, and you're going to die right here in the filthy mud. A slow, grim smile touched McGeehan's face, but he said nothing. Oh, I understand, said Thecla mockingly. You fall in swells in your honor, but you won't die honorably any more than you've lived that way. McGeehan's eyes were contemptuous and untroubled. The pointed teeth gleamed. You don't understand, McGeehan. Len isn't going to die. He's going back to face the music after his post is wiped out. I don't know what they'll do to him, but it won't be nice. And remember, McGeehan, he thinks you sold him out. He thinks you cost him his post, his men, his career. His honor, you scut. Think that over when the swamp rats go to work on you. They like a little fun now and then. And remember, I'm laughing. McGeehan was silent for a long time, hands clenched at his sides, his craggy face carved in dark stone under his dripping white hair. Then he whispered, Why? Thecla's eyes met his in sudden, intense hate. Because I want to see your damn, proud, supercilious noses rubbed in the dirt. McGeehan nodded. His face was strange, as though a curtain had been drawn over it. Where's Len? Thecla pointed to the nearest hut. But it won't do you any good. The rats gave him an overdose, accidentally, of course, and he's out for a long time. McGeehan went unsteadily toward the hut through the rain. Over his shoulder, he heard Thecla's voice. 
Don't try anything funny, McGeehan. I can shoot you down before you're anywhere near an escape, even if you could find your way back without me. The Nahali are gathering now all over the swamp. Within half an hour, they'll march on the fort and then on to the plateaus. They'll send my escort before they go, but you and Len will have to wait until they come back. You can think of me while you're waiting to die, McGeehan. Me, going to Leva and freedom. McGeehan didn't answer. The rhythm of the rain changed from a slow drumming to a rapid, vicious hiss. He could see it almost smoking in the broad leaves of the Leah trees. The drops cut his body like whips, and he realized for the first time that he was stripped to trousers and shirt. Without his protective rubber coverall, Thecla could electrocute him far quicker even than in a holly with his service pistol. The hut, which had been very close, was suddenly far off. So far he could hardly see it. The muddy ground swooped and swayed underfoot. McGeehan jerked himself savagely erect. Fever. Any fool who prowled the swamp without proper covering was a sure victim. He looked back at Thecla, safe in helmet and coverall, grinning like a weasel under the shelter of a pod-hung tree branch. The hut came back into proper perspective. Aching, trembling suddenly with icy cold, he stooped and entered. Len lay there, dry but stripped like McGeehan, his young face slack in unconsciousness. McGeehan raised a hand, let it fall limply back. Len was still paralyzed from the shock. It might be hours, even days before he came out of it. Perhaps never, if he wasn't cared for properly. McGeehan must have gone a little mad then, from the fever and the shock to his own brain, and Thecla. He took Len's shirt in both hands and shook him, as though to beat sense back into his brain, and shouted at him in hoarse savagery. All I wanted was to die. That's what I came to the Legion for, to die like a soldier because I couldn't live like an officer. But it had to be honorably, Len, otherwise... He broke off in a fit of shivering, and his blue eyes glared under his white, tumbled hair. You robbed me of that, damn you, you and Thecla. You trapped me. You wouldn't even let me die decently. I was an officer, Len, like you. Do you hear me, young fool? I had to choose between two courses, and I chose the wrong one. I lost my whole command, 2,500 men, dead. They might have let me off at the court-martial. It was an honest mistake. But I didn't wait. I resigned. All I wanted was to die like a good soldier. That's why I volunteered. And you tricked me, Len. You and Thecla. He let the limp body fall and crouched there, holding his throbbing head in his hands. He knew he was crying and couldn't stop. His skin burned, and he was cold to the marrow of his bones. Suddenly, he looked at Len out of bright, fever-mad eyes. Very well, he whispered. I won't die. You can't kill me, you and Thecla, and you go on believing I betrayed you. I'll take you back, you two, and fight it out. I'll keep the Nahali from taking the fort, so you can't say I sold it out. I'll make you believe me. From somewhere far off, he heard Thecla laugh. McGeehan huddled there for some time, his brain whirling. Through the rain beat and the fever mist in his head and the alternate burning and freezing that racked his body, certain truths shot at him like stones from a sling. Thecla had a gun that shot a stream of electricity, a gun designed for Nahali, whose nervous systems were built to carry a certain load and no more, like any set of wires. The low-frequency discharge was strong enough to kill a normal man only under ideal conditions, and these conditions were uniquely ideal. Wet clothes, wet skin, wet ground, even the air saturated. Then there were metal and rubber. Metal in his belt and lens belt. Metal mesh, because the damp air rotted everything else. Rubber on his feet, on lens feet. Rubber was insulation. Metal was a conductor. McKeon realized with part of his mind that he must be mad to do what he planned to do. But he went to work just the same. Ten minutes later, he left the hut and crossed the soaking clearing in the downpour. Thecla had left the Liha tree for a hut directly opposite Lens. He rose warily in the doorway, gun ready. His sly black eyes took in McKeon's wild blue gaze, the fever spots burning on his lean cheekbones, and he smiled. Get on back to the hut, he said. Be a pity if you die before the Nahali have a chance to try electrotherapy. McKeon didn't pause. His right arm was hidden behind his back. Thecla's jaw tightened. Get back or I'll kill you. McGeehan's boots sucked in the mud. The beating rain streamed from his white hair over his craggy face and gaunt shoulders, and he didn't hesitate. Thecla's pointed teeth gleamed in a sudden snarl. His thumb snapped the trigger. A bolt of blue flame hissed toward the striding Scott. McGeehan's right hand shot out the instant the gun spoke. One of Len's rubber boots cased his arm almost to the shoulder, and around the ankle of it a length of metal was made fast. Two mesh belts linked together. 
the spitting blue fire was gathered to the metal circle, shot down the coupled lengths, and died in the ground. The pistol sputtered out as a coil fused. Thecla cursed and flung it at McGeehan's head. The Scot dodged it and broke into a run, dropping Len's boot that his hands might be free to grapple. Thecla fought like a low canal rat, but McGeehan was bigger and beyond himself with the first madness of fever. He beat the little Martian down and bound him with his own belt, and then went looking for his clothes and gun. He found them with Lens in the hut next door. His belt pouch yielded quinine. He gulped a large dose and felt better. After he had dressed, he went and wrestled Len into his coverall and helmet and dragged him out beside Thecla, who was groaning back to consciousness in the mud. Looking up, McGeehan saw three Nahali men watching him warily out of scarlet eyes as they slunk toward him. Thecla's escort. It was a near thing. Twice clammy Paul seared his face before he sent them writhing down into the mud, jerking as the overload beat through their nervous systems. Triangular mouths gaped in noseless faces. Hands like paws tore convulsively at scaly breastplates, and McGeehan, as he watched them die, said calmly, There will be hundreds of them storming the fort. My gun won't be enough, but somehow I've got to stop them. No answer now. He shrugged and kicked Thecla erect. Back to the fort, Scut, he ordered and laughed. The linked belts were fastened now around Thecla's neck, the other end hooked to the muzzle of McGeehan's gun, so that the slightest rough pull would discharge it. But if I stumble... Thecla snarled, and McGeehan answered, "'You'd better not.' Len was big and heavy, but somehow McGeehan got him across his shoulders, and they started off. The fringe of the swamp was in sight when McGeehan's brain became momentarily lucid. Another dose of quinine drove the mist back, so that the fort, some fifty yards away, assumed its proper focus. McGeehan dropped Len on his back in the mud and stood looking, his hand ready on his gun. The village swarmed with swamp rats in the slow, watery dawn. They were ranged in a solid mass along the edges of the moat, and the fort's guns were silent. McGeehan wondered why, until he saw that the dam that furnished power for the turbine had been broken down. Thecla laughed silently. My idea, McGeehan. The Nahali would never have thought of it themselves. They can't drown, you know. I showed them how to sneak into the reservoir right under the fort's guns and stay underwater, loosening the stones around the spillway. Pressure did the rest. Now there's no power for the big guns— nor the conductor rods in the moat. He turned furrow black eyes on McGeehan. You've made a fool of yourself. You can't stop those swamp rats from tearing the fort apart. You can't stop me from getting away after they're through. You can't stop Len from thinking what he does. You haven't changed anything by these damned heroics. Heroics, said McGeehan hoarsely and laughed. Maybe. With sudden viciousness, he threw the end of the linked belt over a low Lehigh branch, so that Thecla had to stand on tiptoe to keep from strangling. Then, staring blindly at the beleaguered fort, he tried to beat sense out of his throbbing head. There was something, he whispered, something I was saying back in the swamp, something my mind was trying to tell me, only I was delirious. What was it, Thecla? The Martian was silent, the bloody grin set in his dark face. McGeehan took him by the shoulders and shook him. What was it? Thecla choked and struggled as the metal halter tightened. Nothing, you fool. Nothing but Nahali and Leha trees. Leha trees. McGeehan's fever bright eyes went to the great green pollen pods hung among the broad leaves. He shivered, partly with chill and partly with exultation, and he began like a madman to strip Len and Thecla of their rubber coveralls. Len's, because it was larger, he tented over two low branches. Thecla's he spread on the ground beneath. Then he tore down pod after pod from the liha tree, breaking open the shells under the shelter of the improvised tent, pouring out the green powder on the ground cloth. When he had a two-foot pile, he stood back and fired a bolt of electricity into the heart of it. Thick, oily black smoke poured up, slowly at first, then faster and faster as the fire took hold. A sluggish breeze was blowing out of the swamp, drawn by the cooler uplands beyond the fort. It took the smoke and sent it rolling toward the packed and struggling mass on the earthworks. Out on the battlefield, Nahali stiffened suddenly, felt tearing convulsively at their bodies. The beating rain washed the soot down onto them harder and harder, streaked it away, left a dull film over the reptilian skins, the scaly breastplates. More and more of them fell as the smoke rolled thicker, fed by the blackened madman under the liha tree, until only legionnaires were left standing in its path staring dumbly at the stricken swamp rats. The squirming bodies stilled in death. 
Hundreds more out on the edges of the smoke, seeing their comrades die, fled back into the swamp. The earthworks were cleared. Ian McIan gave one wild shout that carried clear to the fort. Then he collapsed, crouched shivering beside the unconscious Len, babbling incoherently. Thecla, strained on tiptoe under the tree branch, had stopped smiling. The fever mist rolled away at last. McGeehan woke to see Len's pink young face, rather less pink than usual, bending over him. Len's hand came out awkwardly. I'm sorry, McGeehan. Thecla told me. I made him. I should have known. His gray eyes were ashamed. McGeehan smiled and gripped his hand with what strength the fever had left him. My own fault, boy. Forget it. Len sat down on the bed. What did you do to the swamp rats? He demanded eagerly. They all have a coating as though they'd been dipped in paraffin. McGeehan chuckled. In a way, they were. You know how they breathe, each skin cell forming a miniature electrolysis plant to extract oxygen from water. Well, it extracts hydrogen, too, naturally, and the hydrogen is continually being given off, just as we give off carbon dioxide. Black smoke means soot. Soot means carbon. Carbon plus hydrogen forms various waxy hydrocarbons. Wax is impervious to water and air, so when the oily soot from the smoke, united with the hydrogen exuded from the Nahali's bodies, it sealed away the life-giving water from the skin cells. They literally smothered to death, like an earthly ant doused with powder. Len nodded. He was quiet for a long time, his eyes on the sick base well-scrubbed floor. At length, he said, My offer still goes, McIan. Officer's examinations. One mistake, an honest one, shouldn't rob you of your life. You don't even know that it would have made any difference if your decision had been the other way. Perhaps there was no way out. McIan's white head nodded on the pillow. Perhaps I will, then. Something Thecla said had set me thinking. He said he'd rather die on Mars than live another month in exile. I'm in exile too, Len, in a different way. Yeah, I think I'll try it, and if I fail again? He shrugged and smiled. They're always in a holly. It seemed for a minute after that as though he'd gone to sleep. Then he murmured, so low that Len had to bend down to hear him. Thecla will hang after the court-martial. Can you see that they take him back to Mars first? End of The Stellar Legion by Lee Brackett Recording by Colleen McMahon From the Ocean's Depths by Sewell Peasley Wright This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org From the Ocean's Depths by Sewell Peasley Wright from somewhere out on the black, heaven Atlantic, the rapid, muffled popping of a speedboat's exhaust drifted clearly through the night. I dropped my book and stretched, leaning back more comfortably in my chair. There was real romance and adventure. Rum runners, seeking out their hidden port with their cargo of contraband from Cuba, heading fearlessly through the darkness, fighting the high seas, still running after the storm of a day or two before daring a thousand dangers for the sake of the straw-packed bottles they carried. Sea-bronzed men, with hard, flat muscles, and fearless eyes, ready guns slapping their thighs as they absorbed in my mental picture of these modern freebooters. The sudden alarm of the telephone startled me, like an unexpected shot fired beside my ear. Brushing the cigarette ashes from my smoking jacket, I crossed the room and snatched up the receiver. Hello? I snapped ungraciously into the mouthpiece. It was after eleven by the ship's clock on the mantel, and if... Taylor? The voice, Warren Mercer's familiar voice, rattled on without waiting for a reply. Get in your car and come down here as fast as possible. Come just as you are, and... What's the matter? I managed to interrupt him. Burglars? I had never heard Mercer speak in that high-pitched, excited voice before. His usual speech was slow and thoughtful, almost didactic. Please, Taylor... Don't waste time questioning me. If it weren't urgent, I wouldn't be calling you, you know. Will you come? You bet, I said quickly, feeling rather a fool for ragging him when he was in such deadly earnest. Have... The receiver snapped and crackled. Mercer had hung up the instant he had my assurance that I will come. Usually the very soul of courtesy and consideration, that act alone would have convinced me that there was an urgent need for my presence at the monstrosity. That was Mercer's own name for the impressive pile that was at once his residence and his laboratory. I threw off the smoking jacket and pulled on a woolen golfing sweater, for the wind was brisk and sharpish. 
In two minutes, I was backing the car out of the garage. A moment later, I was off the graveled drive and tearing down the concrete with the accelerator all the way down, and the black wind shrieking around the windshield of my little roadster. My own shack was out of the city limits, a little place I keep to live in when the urge to go fishing seizes me, which is generally about twice a year. Mercer picked the place up for me at a song. The monstrosity was some four miles further out from town, and off the highway perhaps a half mile more. I made the four miles in just a shade over that many minutes, and clamped on the brakes as I saw the entrance to the little drive that led toward the sea and Mercer's estate. With the gravel rattling on my fenders, I turned off the concrete and swept between the two massive stuccoed pillars that guarded the drive. Both of them bore corroded bronze plates, the billows, the name given the monstrosity by the original owner, a newly rich munitions manufacturer. The structure itself loomed up before me in a few seconds, a rambling affair with square-shouldered balconies and a great deal of wrought iron work, after the most flamboyant Spanish pattern. It was ablaze with light. Apparently every bulb in the place was burning. Just a few yards beyond, the surf boomed hollowly on the smooth, shady shore, littered now, I knew, by the pitiful spoils of the storm. As I clamped on my brakes, a swift shadow passed two of the lower windows. Before I could leave from the car, the broad front door, with his rounded top and circular, grilled window, was flung wide, and Mercer came running to meet me. He was wearing a bathrobe, ha- hastily flung over a damp bathing suit, his spare legs terminating in a pair of disreputable slippers. Fine, Taylor, he greeted me. I suppose you're wondering what it's all about. I don't blame you, but come in, come in. Just wait till you see her. Her? I asked, startled. You're not in love by any chance. And bringing me down here like this merely to back up your own opinion of them eyes and them lips, Mercer? He laughed excitedly. You'll see, you'll see. No, I'm not in love, and I want you to help and not admire. There are only Carson and myself here, you know, and the job's too big for the two of us. He hurried me across the broad concrete porch and into the house. Throw the cap anywhere and come on. Too much to maze to comment further. I followed my friend. This was a war on Mercer I did not know. Usually his clean-cut, olive-tinted face was a polite mask that seldom showed even the slightest trace of emotion. His eyes, dark and large, smiled easily and shone with interest, but his almost beautiful mouth, beneath the long, slim mustache, always closely cropped, seldom smiled with his eyes. But it was his present excited speech that amazed me most. Mercer, during all the years I had known him, had never been moved before to such tempestuous outbursts of enthusiasm. It was his habit to speak slowly and thoughtfully, in his low musical voice, even in the midst of our hottest arguments, and we had had many of them. His voice had never lost its calm, unhurried gentleness. To my surprise, instead of leading the way to the really comfortable, although rather gaudy, living room, Mercer turned to the left, towards what had been the billiard room, and was now his laboratory. The laboratory, brilliantly illuminated, was littered, as usual, with apparatus of every description. Along one wall were the retorts, scales, racks, hoods, and elaborate setups, like the articulated glass and rubber bones of some weird prehistoric monster that demonstrated Mercer's taste for this branch of science. On the other side of the room, a corresponding workbench was littered with a tangle of coils, transformers, meters, tools, and instruments. And at the end of the room, behind high black control panels with gleaming bus bars and staring gaping meters, a pair of generators hummed softly. The other end of the room was nearly all glass and opened onto the patio and the swimming pool. Mercer paused a moment, with his hand on the knob of the door, a strange light in his dark eyes. Now you'll see why I called you here, he said tensely. You can judge for yourself whether the trip was worthwhile. Here she is. With a gesture, he flung open the door, and I stared, following his glance, down at the great tiled swimming pool. It is difficult for me to describe the scene. The patio was not large, but it was beautifully done. Flowers and shrubs, even a few small palms, grew in profusion in the enclosure, while above, through the movable glass roof, made a section to disappear in fine weather, was the empty blackness of the sky. None of the lights provided for the illumination of the covered patio was turned on, but all the windows surrounding the patio were aglow, 
and I could see the pool quite clearly. The pool and its occupants. We were standing at one side of the pool, near the center. Directly opposite us, seated on the bottom of the pool, was a human figure, nude, save for a great mask of tawny hair that fell about her like a silken mantle. The strangely graceful figure of a girl, one leg stretched out straight before her, the other drawn up and clasped by the interlocked fingers of her hands. Even in the soft light, I could see her perfectly, through the clear water, her pale body outlined sharply against the jade-green tiles. I tore myself away from the staring, curious eyes of the figure. In God's name, Mercer, what is it, porcelain? I asked hoarsely. The thing had an indescribably eerie effect. He laughed wildly. Porcelain? Watch. Look! My eyes followed his pointing finger. The figure was moving. Gracefully, it arose to its full height. The great cloud of corn-colored hair had floated down about it, falling below the knees. Slowly, with a grace of movement comparable only with the slow soaring of a gull, she came toward me, walking on the bottom of the pool through the clear water as though she floated in air. Fascinated, I watched her. Her eyes, startlingly large and dark in the strangely white face, were fixed on mine. There was nothing sinister in the gaze, yet I felt my body shaking, as though in the grip of a terrible fear. I tried to look away, and found myself unable to move. I felt Mercer's tense, sudden grip upon my arm, but I did not, could not, look at him. She's, she's smiling, I heard him exclaim. He laughed, an excited, high-pitched laugh that irritated me in some subtle way. She was smiling, and looking up into my eyes. She was very close now, within a few feet of us. She came still closer, until she was at my very feet as I stood on the raised ledge that ran around the edge of the pool. Her head flown back, staring straight up at me through the water. I could see her teeth, very white between her coral pink lips and her bosom, rising and falling beneath the veil of pale gold hair. She was breathing water. Mercer literally jerked me away from the edge of the pool. What do you think of her, Taylor? He asked, his dark eyes dancing with excitement. Tell me about it, I said, shaking my head dazedly. She's not human? I don't know. I think so. As human as you or I. I'll tell you all I know, and then you can judge for yourself. I think we know in a few minutes, if my plan works out. But first, slip on a bathing suit. I didn't argue the matter. I let Mercer lead me away without a word. And while I was changing, he told me all he knew of the strange creature in the pool. Late this afternoon... I decided to go for a little walk along the beach, Mercer began. I had been working like the devil since early in the morning, running some tests on what you call my thought telegraph. I felt the need of some fresh sea air. I walked along briskly for perhaps five minutes, keeping just out of reach of the rollers and the spray. The shore was littered with all sorts of flotsam and jetsam washed up by the big storm, and I was just thinking that I would have to have a man with a truck come and clean up the shore in front of the place. When, in a little sandy pool, I saw her. She was lying face down in the water, motionless, her head towards the sea, one arm stretched out before her, and her long hair wrapped around her like a half-transparent cloak. I ran up and lifted her from the water. Her body was cold and deathly white, although her lips were faintly pink, and her heart was beating faintly but steadily. Like most people in emergency, I forgot all I ever knew about first aid. All I could think of was to give her a drink, and of course I didn't have a flask on my person. So I picked her up in my arms, and I brought her to the house as quickly as I could. She seemed to be reviving, for she was struggling and gasping when I got here with her. I placed her on the bed, in the guest room, and poured her a stiff drink of scotch, half a tumbleful, I think. Lifting up her head, I placed the glass to her lips. She looked at me, blinking and took the liquor in a single draught. She had not seemed to drink it, but sucked it out of the glass in a single amazing gulp. That's the only word for it. The next instant she was off the bed, her face a perfect mask of hate and agony. She came at me, hands clutching and clawing, making odd murmuring or mewing sounds in her throat. It was then that I noticed for the first time that her hands were webbed. Webbed? I asked, startled. Webbed, nodded Mercer solemnly. As are our feet. But listen, Taylor, I was amazed, and not a little rattled when she came for me. I ran through the French windows out into the patio. 
For a moment, she ran after me, rather awkwardly and heavily, but swiftly nevertheless. Then she saw the pool. Apparently forgetting that I existed, she leaped into the water, and as I approached a moment later, I could see her breathing deeply and gratefully, a smile of relief upon her features, as she lay upon the bottom of the pool. Breathing, Taylor, on the bottom of a pool, under eight feet of water. And then what, Mercer? I reminded him, as he paused, apparently lost in thought. I tried to find out more about her. I put on my bathing suit and dived into the pool. Well, she came at me like a shark, quick as a flash, her teeth showing, her hands tearing like claws through the water. I turned, but not quickly enough to entirely escape. See? Mercer threw back the dressing robe, and I saw a jagged tear in his bathing suit in his left side, near the waist. Through the rend, three deep, jagged scratches were clearly visible. She managed to claw me, just once, Mercer resumed, wrapping the robe around him again. Then I got out and called on Carson for help. I put him into a bathing suit, and we both endeavored to corner her. Carson got two bad scratches, and one rather serious bite that I had bandaged. I have a number of lacerations, but I didn't fare so badly as Carson because I am faster in the water than he is. The harder we tried, the more determined I became. She would sit there, calm and placid, until one of us entered the water. Then she became a veritable fury. It was maddening. At last I thought of you. I phoned, and here we are. But, Mercer, it's a nightmare, I protested. We moved out of the room. Nothing human can live under water and breathe water as she does. Mercer paused a moment, staring at me oddly. The human race, he said gravely, came up out of sea. The human race as we know it. Some may have gone back. He turned and walked away again, and I hurried after him. What do you mean, Mercer? Some may have gone back. I don't get it. Mercer shook his head but made no other reply until we stood again on the edge of the pool. The girl was standing where we had left her, and as she looked up into my face, she smiled again and made a quick gesture with one hand. It seemed to me that she invited me to join her. I believe she likes you, Taylor, said Mercer thoughtfully. You're light, light skin, light hair. Carson and I are both very dark, almost swarthy. And in that white bathing suit, yes, I believe she's taking the fancy to you. Mercer's eyes were dancing. If she has, he went on, it'll make our work very easy. What work? I asked suspiciously. Mercer, always an indefatigable experimenter, was never above using his friends in the benefit of science. And some of his experiments in the past have been rather trying, not to say exciting. I think I have what you call my thought telegraph perfected, experimentally, he explained rapidly. I fell asleep working on it at three o'clock or thereabouts this morning and some tests with Carson seem to indicate that it's a success. I should have called you tomorrow for further test. Nearly five years of damned hard work to a successful conclusion, Taylor, and then this mermaid comes along and makes my experience appear about as important as one of those breakers rolling in out there. And what do you plan to do now? I asked eagerly, glancing down at the beautiful pale face that glimmered up at me through the clear water of the pool. Why try it on her? exclaimed Mercer with mounting enthusiasm. Don't you see, Taylor? If we will work on her, and we can direct her thoughts, we can find out her history, the history of her people. We'll add a page of scientific history, a whole big chapter. That will make us famous. Man, this is so big, it swept me off my feet. Look. And he held out a thin, aristocratic, brown hand before my eyes, a hand that shook with nervous excitement. I don't blame you, I said quickly. I'm no savant, and still I see what an amazing thing this is. Let's get busy. What can I do? Mercer reached around the door into the laboratory and pressed a button. For Carson, he explained. We'll need a cell. In the meantime, we'll look over the setup. The apparatus is strewn all over the place. He had not exaggerated. The setup consisted of a whole bank of tubes, each one as his own shielding copper box. On a much drilled horizontal panel, propped up on insulators, were half a score of delicate meters of one kind and another, with thin black fingers that pulsed and trembled. Behind the panel was a tall cylinder wound with shining copper wire, and beside it, another panel, upright, fairly bristling with knobs, contact points, potentiometers, rheostats, and switches. On the end of the table and nearest the door was still another panel, the smallest of the lot, bearing only a series of jacks along one side, and in the center, a switch with four contact points. A heavy, snaky cable led from this panel to the maze of apparatus further on. 
This is the control panel, explained Mercer. The whole affair, you understand, is in laboratory form. Nothing assembled. Put the different antenna plug into these jacks, like this. He picked up a weird, hastily built contravance, composed of two semicircular pieces of spring grass, crossed at right angles. On all four ends were bright silvery electrodes, three of them circular in shape, one of them elongated and slightly curved. With a quick, nervous gesture, Mercer fitted the thing to his head, so that the elongated electrode pressed against the back of his neck, extending a few inches down his spine. The other three circular electrodes rested on his forehead and either side of his head. From the center of the contravance ran a heavy insulated cord, some ten feet in length, ending in a simple switchboard plug, which Mercer fitted into the uppermost of the three jacks. Now, he directed, you put this one on. He adjusted the second contravance upon my head, smiling as I shrank from the contact of the cold metal on my skin, and think. He moved the switch from the position marked off to the second contact point, watching me intently, his dark eyes gleaming. Carson entered and Mercer gestured him to wait. Very nice old chap, Carson, impressive even in his bathing suit. Mercer was mighty lucky to have a man like Carson. Something seemed to tick suddenly, somewhere deep in my consciousness. Yes, that's very true. Carson is a most decent sort of chap. The words were not spoken. I did not hear them. I knew them. What? I glanced at Mercer, and he laughed loud with pleasure and excitement. It worked, he replied. I received your thought regarding Carson, and then turned the switch that you received my thought. And you did. Rather gingerly, I removed the thing from my head and laid it on the table. It's wizardry, Mercer. If it will work as well as on her. It will, I know it will, if we can get her to wear one of these, replied Mercer confidently. I have only three of them. I had planned some three-cornered experiments with you, Carson, and myself. We'll leave Carson out of tonight's experiment, however, for we'll need him to operate the switch. You see, as it is now wired, only one person transmits thoughts at a time, the other to receive. When the switch is on first contact, number one sends, and number two and three are received. When the switch is on to number two, then he sends thoughts, and number one and three receive them, and so on. I'll lengthen these leads so that we can run them out of the pool, and they'll be ready. Somehow we must induce her to wear one of these things, even when we have use force. I'm sure the three of us can handle her. We should be able to. I smiled. She was such a slim, graceful, almost delicate little thing. The thought that three strong men might not be able to control her seemed almost amusing. You haven't seen her in action yet, said Mercer grimly, glancing up from his work, lengthening the cords that led from the antenna to the control panel. And once more, I hope you don't. I watched him in silence as he spliced and securely taped the last connection. All set, he nodded. Carson, will you operate the switch for us? I believe everything is functioning properly. He surveyed the panel of instruments hastily, assuring himself that every reading was correct. Then, with all three of the devices he called antenna in his hands, their leads plugged into the control panel, he led the way to the side of the pool. The girl who was strolling around the edge of the pool, feeling the smooth towel sides with her hands, we came into view, but as soon as she saw us, she shot through the water to where we were standing. It was the first time I had seen her move in this fashion. She seemed to propel herself with a sudden mighty thrust of her feet against the bottom. She darted through the water with the speed of an arrow, yet stopped as gently as though she had nearly floated there. As she looked up, her eyes unmistakably sought mine, and her smile seemed warm and inviting. She made again that strange little gesture of invitation. With an effort, I glanced at Mercer. There was something devilishly fascinating about the girl's great dark searching eyes. I'm going in, I said hoarsely. Hand me one of your headset things when I reach for it. Before you could protest, I dived into the pool. I headed directly towards the heavy bronze ladder that led to the bottom of the pool. I had two reasons in mind. I would need something to keep me underwater, with my lungs full of air, and I could get out quickly if it were necessary. I had not forgotten the livid, jagged furrows in Mercer's side. Quickly, as I shot to the ladder, she was there before me, a dim, wavering white shape, waiting. I paused, holding to a rung of the ladder with one hand. She came closer, walking with the airy grace I had noted before, and my heart pounded against my ribs as she raised one long, slim arm towards me. The hand dropped gently on my shoulder, 
pressed it, as though in token of friendship. Perhaps, I thought quickly, this was, with her, a sign of greeting. I lifted my own arm and returned the salutation, if salutation it were, aware of a strange rising and falling sound, as of a distant humming in my ears. The sound ceased suddenly, on a rising note, as though of inquiry, and it dawned on me that I heard the speech of this strange creature. Before I could think of a course of action, my aching lungs reminded me of the need of air, and I released my hold on the ladder and let my body rise to the surface. As my head broke the water, a hand, strong and cold as steel, closed around my ankle. I looked down. The girl was watching me, and there was no smile on her face now. All right, I shouted across the pool to Mercer, who was watching anxiously. Then, filling my lungs with air again, I pulled myself, by means of the ladder, to the bottom of the pool. The restraining hand was removed instantly. The strange creature thrust her face close to mine as my feet touched bottom, and for the first time I saw her features distinctly. She was beautiful, but in a weird, unearthly sort of way. As I had already noticed, her eyes were of an unusual size, and I saw now that they were an intense shade of blue, with a pupil of extraordinary proportion. Her nose was well-shaped, but the nostrils were slightly flattened, and the orifices were rather more elongated than I have ever seen before. The mouth was utterly fascinating, and her teeth, revealed by her engaging smile, were as perfect as it would be possible to imagine. The great mane of hair which enveloped her was, as I have said, tawny in hue, and almost translucent, like the stems of some seaweeds I have seen. And as she raised one slim white hand to brush back some wisps that floated by her face, I saw distinctly the webs between her fingers. They were barely noticeable, for they were as transparent as the fins of a fish, but they were there, extending nearly to the last joint of each finger. As her face came close to my own, I became aware of the humming, crooning sound I had heard before, louder this time. I could see, from the movement of her throat, that I had been correct in assuming that she was attempting to speak with me. I smiled back at her and shook my head. She seemed to understand, for the sound ceased, and she studied me with a little thoughtful frown, as though trying to figure out some other method of communication. I pointed upward, for I was feeling the need for fresh air again, and slowly mounted the ladder. This time she did not grasp me, but watched me intently, as though understanding what I did and the reasons for it. Bring one of your gadgets over here, Mercer, I called across the pool. I think I'm making progress. Good boy, he cried, and came running with two of the antenna, a long, insulated cord trailing behind him. Through the water, the girl watched him, evident dislike in her eyes. She glanced at me with sudden suspicion, as Mercer handed me the two instruments, but made no hostile move. "'You won't be able to stay in the water with her,' explained Mercer rapidly. "'The salt water would short the antenna, you see. "'Try to get her to wear one, and then you get your head out of water and don yours. "'And remember, she won't be able to communicate with us by words. "'We'll have to get her to convey her thoughts by means of mental pictures. "'I'll try to impress that on her. "'Understand?' I nodded, and picked up one of the instruments. Fire when ready, gridly, I commented, and sank again to the bottom of the pool. I touched the girl's head with one finger, and then pointed to my own head, trying to convey to her that she could get her thoughts to me. Then I held up the antenna, and placed it on my own head to show that it would not harm her. My next move was to offer her the instrument, moving slowly and smiling reassuringly, no mean feet underwater. She hesitated a moment, and then, her eyes fixed on mine, she slowly fixed the instrument over her own head, as she had seen me adjust it upon my own. I smiled, and nodded, and pressed her shoulder in token of friendly greeting. Then, gesturing toward my own head again, and pointing upward, I climbed the ladder. "'All right, Mercer,' I shouted. "'Start at once, before she grows restless.' "'I've already started,' he called back, and I hurriedly donned my own instrument." Bearing in mind what Mercer had said, I descended the ladder but a few rungs, so that my head remained out of water, and smiled down at the girl, touching the instrument on my head and then pointing to hers. I could sense Mercer's thoughts now. He was picturing himself walking along the shore with the stormy ocean in the background. Ahead of him, I saw the white body lying face downward in the pool. 
I saw him run up to the pool and lift the slim, pale figure in his arms. Let me make it clear at this point that when I say that I saw these things, I mean only that mental pictures of them penetrated my consciousness. I visualized them just as I could close my eyes and visualize, for example, the fireplace in the living room of my own home. I looked down at the girl. She was frowning, and her eyes were very wide. Her head was a little on one side, in the attitude of one who listens intently. Slowly and carefully, Mercer thought out the whole story of his experiences with the girl until she had plunged into the pool. Then I saw again to the beach, where the girl's figure in the pool. The picture grew hazy. I realized Mercer was trying to picture the bottom of the sea. Then he pictured again the girl lying in the pool, and once again, the sea. I was aware of the soft little tick in the center of my brain that announced the switch had been moved to another contact point. I glanced down at her. She was staring up at me with her great curious eyes, and I sensed, through the medium of the instrument I wore, that she was thinking of me. I saw my own features, idealized, glowing with a strange beauty that was certainly not my own. I realized that I saw myself, in short, as she saw me. I smiled back at her and shook my head. A strange, dim world of pictures swept through my consciousness. I was on the bottom of the ocean. Shadowy shapes swept by silently, and from above, a dim bluish light filtered down on the scene such as mortal eyes have never seen. All around were strange structures of jagged coral, roughly circular as to base, and rounded on top, resembling very much the igloos of the Eskimos. The structures varied greatly in size, and seemed to be arranged in some sort of regular order like houses along a narrow street. Around many of them grew clusters of strange and colorful seaweeds that waved their banners gently, as though some imperceptible current dallied with them in passing. Here and there, figures moved, slim white figures that strolled along the narrow street, or at times shot overhead like veritable torpedoes. There were both men and women moving here. The men were broader of shoulder, and their hair, which they wore to their knees, but somewhat darker in color than that of the woman. Both sexes were slim, and there was a remarkable uniformity of size and appearance. None of the strange beings wore garments of any kind, nor were they necessary. The clinging tresses were cinctured at the waist with a sort of a cord of twisted orange-colored material, and some of the younger women wore bands of the same material around their brows. Nearest of all the figures was the girl who was visualizing all this for us. She was walking slowly away from the cluster of coral structures. Once or twice she paused, and seemed to hold conversation with others of the strange people, but each time she moved on. The coral structures grew smaller and poorer. Finally, the girl trod alone on the floor of the ocean, between great growths of kelp and seaweeds, with the dim, looming masses of faintly tinted coral everywhere. Once she passed close to a tilted, ragged hulk of some ancient vessel, its naked ribs passed the drifting stand. Sauntering dreamily, she moved away from the ancient derelict. Suddenly, a dim shadow swept across the sand at her feet, and she arrowed from the spot like a white, slim meteor. But behind her darted a black and swifter shadow, a shark. Like a flash, she turned and faced the monster. Something she had drawn from her girdle showed palely in her hand. It was a knife of wetted stone or bone. Darting swiftly downward, her feet spurned the yellow sand, and she shot at her enemy with amazing speed. The long blade swept in an arc, ripped the pale belly of the monster just as he turned to dart away. A great cloud of blood dyed the water. The white figure of the girl shot onward to the scarlet flood. Blinded, she did not see that the jutting ribs of the ancient ship were in her path. I seemed to see her crash, head on, into one of the massive timbers and I cried out involuntarily, and glanced down at the girl in the water at my feet. Her eyes were glowing. She knew that I had understood. Hazily, then, I seemed to visualize her body floating limply in the water. It was all very vague and indistinct, and I understood that this was not what she had seen, but what she had thought had happened. The impressions grew wilder, swirled, grew gray and indistinct. Then I had a view of Mercer's faith, so terribly distorted it was barely recognizable. Then a kaleidoscope maze of inchoate scenes, shot through with flashes of vivid, agonizing colors. The girl was thinking of her suffering, taken out of her native element. In trying to save her, 
Mercer had almost killed her. That, no doubt, was why she hated him. My own face appeared next, almost godlike in its kindliness and its imagined beauty, and I noticed now that she was thinking of me with my yellow hair grown long, my nostrils elongated like her own, adjusted to her own ideas of what a man should be. I flung the instrument from my head and dropped to the bottom of the pool. I gripped both her shoulders, gently, to express my thanks and friendship. My heart was pounding. There was a strange fascination about this girl from the depths of the sea. A subtle appeal that was answered from some deep subterranean cavern of my being. I forgot, for the moment, who and what I was. I remembered only that a note that had been sounded, that awoke an echo of a long-forgotten instinct. I think I kissed her. I know her arms were about me, and that I pressed her close, so that our faces met. Her great, weirdly blue eyes seemed to bore into my brain. I could feel them throbbing there. I forgot time and space. I saw only that pale, smiling face and those great dark eyes. Then, strangling, I tore myself from her embrace and shot to the surface. Coughing, I cleared my lungs of the water and inhaled. I was weak and shaking when I finished, but my head was clear. The grip of the strange fascinacy that had gripped me was shaken off. Mercer was bending over me, speaking softly. I was watching, old man, he said gently. I can't imagine what happened. A momentary, psychic, fusing of an ancient, long-since-broken link. You, together with all mankind, came up out of the sea. But there was no retracing the way. I nodded, my head bowed on my streaming chest. Sorry, Mercer, I muttered. Something got into me. Those big eyes of hers seemed to tug at threads of memory. Buried. I can't describe it. He slapped me on my naked shoulder, a blow that stung, as he had intended it to. It helped jerk me back to the normal. You've got your feet in the ground again, Taylor, he commented soothingly. I think there's no danger of you losing your grip on terra firma again. Shall we carry on? There's more you'd like to learn that you think she can give us? I asked hesitantly. I believe, replied Mercer, that she can give us the history of her people if we can only make her understand what she wish. God, if only we could. The name of the deity was a prayer as Mercer uttered it. We can try, old timer, I said, a bit shakenly. Mercer hurried back to the other side of the pool, and I adjusted my headset again, smiling down at the girl. If only Mercer could make her understand, and if only she knew what we wanted to learn. I was conscious of the little click that told me the switch had been moved. Mercer was ready to get his message to her. Fixing my eyes on the girl pleadingly, I settled myself by the edge of the pool to wait the second more momentous part of our experience. The reason was vague, for Mercer was picturing his thoughts with difficulty. But I seemed to see again the floor of the ocean, with the vague light filtering down from above, and soft, monstrous growths waving their branches lazily in the flood. From the left came a band of men and women, looking around as though in search of some particular spot. They stopped, and one of the older men pointed, the others gathering around him as though in council. Then the band set to work. Coral growth was dragged to the spot. The foundation for one of the semicircular houses was laid. The scene swirled and cleared again. The house was completed. Several other houses were in the process of building. Slowly and deliberately, the scene moved. The houses were left behind. Before my consciousness now was only a vague and shadowy expanse from my ocean floor, and in the sand dim imprints that marked where the strange people had trod, the vague footprints disappearing in the gloom of the direction from which the little weary band had come. To me, at least, it was quite clear that Mercer was asking whence they came. Would it be as clear to the girl? The switch clicked, and for a moment I was sure Mercer had not been able to make his question clear to her. The scene was the interior of one of the coral houses. There were persons here, seated on stone or coral chairs, padded with marine growths. One of the occupants of the room was a very old man. His face was wrinkled, and his hair was silvery. With him were a man and a woman, and a little girl. Somehow, I seemed to recognize the child as the girl in the pool. The three of them were watching the old man. While his lips did not move, I could see his throat muscles twitching, as the girls had done when she made the murmuring sound I'd guessed was her form of speech. The scene faded. 
For perhaps thirty seconds, I was aware of nothing more than a dim gray mist that seemed to swirl in stately circles. Then, gradually, it cleared somewhat. I sensed the fact that what I saw now was what the old man was telling, that the majestic swirling mist was the turning back of time. Here was no ocean bottom, but land, rich tropical jungle. Strange exotic trees and dense growths of rank undergrowth choked the earth. The trees were oddly like undersea growths, which puzzled me for an instant. Then I recalled that the girl could interpret the old man's words only in terms without which he had seen and understood. This was the way she visualized the scene. There was a gray haze of mist everywhere. The leaves were glistened with condensed moisture. Swift drops fell incessantly to the soaking ground below. Into the scene roamed a pitiful band of people. Men with massive frames, sunken in starvation. Women tottering with weakness. The men carried great clubs, some tipped with rudely shaped stone heads, and both men and women clothed only in short kittles of skin. They searched ceaselessly for something, and I guessed that something was food. Now and then, one or the other of the little band tore up a root and bit at it, and those that did so soon doubled into a twitching knot of suffering and dropped behind. At last they came to the edge of a sea. A few yards away, the water was lost in the dense, seeming miasma that hemmed them in on all sides. With glad expressions on their faces, the party ran down to the edge of the water and gathered up great masses of clams and crabs. At first, they ate the food raw, tearing the flesh from the shells. Then they made what I understood was a fire, although the girl was able to visualize it only as a bright red spot that flickered. The scene faded and there was only the slowly swirling mist that I understood indicated the passing of centuries. Then the scene cleared again. I saw that same shoreline, but the people had vanished. There was only the thick, steamy mist, the tropic jungle, crowding down to the ocean, and the waves rolling in monotonously from the waste of gray ocean beyond the curtain of fog. Suddenly, from out of the sea, appeared a series of human heads, and then a band of men and women that waited ashore and seated themselves upon the beach, gazing restlessly out across the sea. This was not the same band I had seen at first. These were a slimmer race, and whereas the first band had been exceedingly swarthy, these were very fair. They did not stay long on shore, for they were restless and ill at ease. It seemed to me they came there only from force of habit, as though they obeyed some inner urge they did not understand. In a few seconds, they rose and ran into the water, plunged into it as though they welcomed its embrace, and disappeared. Then again, the vision was swallowed up by the swirling mist of time. When the scene cleared again, it showed the bottom of the sea. A group of perhaps a hundred pale creatures moved along the dim ocean of the floor. Ahead, I could see the dim outlines of one of their strange cities. The band approached, seemed to talk with those there, and moved on. I saw them capture and kill fish for food. I saw them carve the thick, spongy hearts from certain giant growths and eat them. I saw a pair of killer sharks swoop down to the band, and the quick, deadly accuracy with which both men and women had met the attack. One man, older than the rest, was injured before the sharks were vanquished, and when their efforts to staunch his wounds proved unavailing, they left him there and moved on. And as they left, I saw a dim, crawling shape move closer throw it a long whip-like tentacle, and wrap the body in a hungry embrace. They came to and passed other communities of beings like themselves, and a city of their own, in much the way that Mercer had visualized it. Fading, the scene changed to the interior of the coral house again. The old man finished the story and moved off into a cubicle in the rear of the place. Dimly, I could see there a low couch, piled high with soft marine growths. Then the scene shifted once more. A man and a woman hurried up and down the narrow streets of the strange city the girl had pictured when she showed us how she met with the shark, and struck her head, so that for a long period she lost consciousness and was washed ashore. Others, after a time, joined them in their search, which spread out to the fore of the ocean, away from the dwellings. One party came to the gaunt skeleton of the ancient wreck, and found the scattered, fresh-picked bones of the shark the girl had killed. The man and the woman came up, and I looked closely into their faces. The woman's features were torn with grief. The man's lips were set tight with severing. Here, it was easy to guess, 
were the mother and the father of the girl. A milling mass of white form shot through the water in every direction. Searching. It seemed like they were about to give up the search, when suddenly, from out of the watery gloom, there shot a slim white figure. The girl! Straight to the mother and the father, she went, gripping the shoulder of each with frantic joy. They returned the caress. The crowd gathered around them, listening to her story as they moved slowly, happily, towards the distant city. Instead of the picture, I was conscious then of a sound, like a single pleading word repeated softly, as the stone had said, please, 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 over and over again. The sound was not at all like the English word. It was a soft musical beat, like the distant stroke of a mellow gong, but it had all the pleading quality of the word it seemed to bring to mind. I looked down into the pool. The girl had mounted the ladder until her face was just below the surface of the water. Her eyes met mine, and I knew I had not misunderstood. I threw off the instrument on my head and dropped down beside her. With both hands, I grasped her shoulders, and smiling, I nodded my head vigorously. She understood, I know she did. I read it in her face. When I climbed the ladder again, she looked after me, smiling confidently. Although I had not spoken to her, she had read and accepted the promise. Mercer stared at me silently, grimly, as I told him what I wished. Whatever elegance I may have, I used on him, and I saw his cold, scientific mind waver before the warmth of my appeal. We have no right to keep her from our people, I concluded. You saw her mother and father, saw their suffering, and the joy her return would bring. You will, Mercer, you will return to the sea? For a long time, Mercer did not reply. Then he lifted his dark eyes to mine and smiled rather wearily. It is the only thing we can do, Taylor, he said quietly. She is not a scientific specimen. She is, in her way, as human as you or I. She would probably die, away from her own kind, living under conditions foreign to her. And you promised her, Taylor, whether you spoke your promise or not. His smile deepened a bit. We cannot let her receive too bad an opinion of her cousins who live above the surface of the sea. And so, just as the dawn was breaking, we took her to the shore. I carried her, unresisting, trustful, in my arms, while Mercer bore a huge basin of water, in which her head was submerged, so that she might not suffer. Still in our bathing suits, we waded out into the ocean, until the waves splashed against our faces. Then I lowered her into the sea. Crouching there, so that the water was just above the tawny glory of her hair, she gazed up at us. Two slim white hands reached toward us, and with one accord, Mercer and I bent towards her. She gripped both our shoulders with a gentle pressure, smiling at us. Then she did a strange thing. She pointed, under the water, out towards the depths, and with a broad sweeping motion of her arm, indicated the shore, as though to say that she intended to return. With a last, swift, smiling glance up into my face, she turned. There was a flash of white through the water. She was gone. Silently, through the silence and beauty of the dawn, we made our way back to the house. As we passed through the laboratory, Mercer glanced out at the empty pool. Man came up from the sea, he said slowly, and some men went back to it. They were forced back to the teeming source from whence they came, for lack of food. You saw that, Tyler. Saw our forebears become amphibians, like the now extinct Dipnoista and Gaunoidae, or the still existing Nocrit Serratus. Polypterus and Amia. Then their lungs became, in effect, gills, and they lost their power of bringing atmospheric air and could only use air dissolved in water. A whole people there beneath the waves that land man never dreamed of, except, perhaps, the sailors of olden days, with their tales of mermaids, which we are accustomed to laugh at in our wisdom. But why were no bodies ever washed ashore? I asked. I would think. You saw why, interrupted Mercer grimly. The ocean teems with hungry life. Death is the signal for a feast. It was little more than a miracle that her body came ashore. A miracle due perhaps to the storm which sent the hungry monsters to the greater depths. And even had a body come ashore, it would have been buried as that of some unknown, unfortunate human. The difference between these people and ourselves would not be noticeable to a casual observer. No, Taylor, we have been party to what was close to a miracle. And we are the only witnesses to it, you and Carson and myself. And, he sighed deeply, it is over. I did not reply. 
I was thinking of the girl's odd gesture at parting, and I wondered if it were indeed a finished chapter. End of From the Ocean's Depths by Sewell Peasley Wright Card Trick by Walter Bupp This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Richard Green The Psy Lodge had their ways and means of applying pressure when pressure was needed. But the particular talent this fellow showed was one that even they'd never heard of. Card Trick by Walter Bupp The game was stud. There were seven at the table, which makes for good poker. Outside of Nick, who banked the game, nobody looked familiar. They all had the beat look of compulsive gamblers fogged over by their individual attempts at a poker face. They were a cagey-looking lot. Only one of them was within ten years of my age. Just in case, gamblers, the young one said. I looked up from stacking the chips I had just bought from Nick. The speaker was a skinny little guy with a sharp chin and more freckles than I'd like to have. If any one of you guys has any psi powers, the sharp-chinned gambler said sourly, you better beat it. All gamblers here will recoup double their losses from any snake we catch using psi powers to beat the odds. He shot a hard-eyed look around the room, not yet dim by cigar smoke. I got the most baleful glare, I thought. He didn't need to worry. I'd been certified normal by an expert that very evening. The expert was Dr. Sherry King, whom I had taken to dinner before joining the game at Nick's. It had gotten to be sort of a weekly date, although this night had given signs of being the last one. For a while that spring, disoxyribonucleic acid had begun to take second place in my heart. This is a pitiful admission for a biochemist to make. DNA should be the cornerstone of his life. But Sherry was something rare. A gorgeous woman, if somewhat distant, who was thoroughly intelligent. She had already earned her doctorate while I was still struggling with the tag ends of my thesis. Poker techs? Sherry had asked when the waitress was bringing dessert. Is this becoming a problem? You've played every night this week. No problem, Sherry, I said. I'm winning, and I see no point in not pocketing all that found money. Compulsive gambling is a sickness, she said, looking at me thoughtfully. She was wearing a shirtwaist and skirt that had the bright colors and fullness you associate with peasant dress. The only sick thing about me is my bank account, I grinned, relishing her dark romantic quality. I need the dough, Sherry. I got a thesis to finish if I ever want to get a job teaching. Her thick eyebrows fluttered upward, a danger signal I had learned to look for. That's a childish rationalization text, she said, with a lot more sharpness than I had expected. There are certainly other ways to get money. So I'm not as smart as you, I told her. Smart? She didn't think I was tracking. I wasn't as shrewd as you in picking my parents, I said. Mine never had much and left me less than that when they died. She threw her spoon to the table. I'll remind you of how silly these remarks sound after you hit a losing streak, she told me. I laughed at that one. I don't lose, Sherry, I said, and I don't intend to. Her lashes veiled her violet eyes as she smiled and said more quietly, Then you were in even worse trouble than I thought. I hear a lot about what happens to these strange people who never lose at cards or at dice or at roulette. Aren't you afraid of winding up in the gutter with your throat slit? Isn't that what happens to people with psi powers who gamble, she insisted? What's your trick, Tex? Do you stack the deck with telekinesis or does precognition tell you what's about to be dealt? That crack isn't considered funny in Texas, I growled. Is it any more silly for me to think you might be a psi personality than for you to think you never lose at cards? She nailed me. I could feel my face getting red. Damn it, I started. Nobody talks to a friend like that. Pretty convincing proof, Sherry said tartly. Of what? Of the fact that you aren't making any sense about this gambling kick you're on, Tex. You should have laughed my teasing off. Who would seriously suggest that you were a psi personality, she demanded. And most of all, with my background in psi, do you think I could be misled about it? I shrugged, trying to cool down. Sherry's doctorate had been earned with a startling thesis on psi phenomena and psi personalities, and she had stayed on at Columbia as a research fellow in the field. In egghead circles, she rated as a psi expert, all right. Guess not, I said, trying to kill the subject. She wasn't going to let it die. I don't think you're a psi, Tex. You're a normal. The way she said it, it didn't sound like a compliment. Worse than that, she insisted, you're beginning to act like a compulsive gambler. She took a deep breath and let me have the clincher. I could never marry a gambler, Tex. You've never been asked, I reminded her. She had the last word. Let's go, she snapped. Angry as I was about her acting as though I were a snake, 
I wish I could have thrown her certification that I was a normal in the freckled face of the sharp-chinned gambler at Nick's later that night. After Sherry's needling, I didn't take very kindly to his popping off with the law of the pack. It's understood whenever people gamble that size aren't welcome. Nick didn't like it any better than I did. All right, lefty, he said to the sharp-chinned gambler. Calm down, huh, kid? What kind of game do you think I run, huh? I didn't let the sour start spoil my game. I was lucky right from the start and hit big in several hands. Lefty, the gambler who had yelped about side powers at the game, dealt the tenth hand. He gave me the eight of spades in the hole. By the fourth card, I had three other spades showing, which gave me four-fifths of a rare flush in stud poker. By the fourth card, Lefty had given himself a pair of jacks. That drove all the other gamblers to cover. Lefty raised, of course, and it cost me five hundred bucks to see my fifth card. It was a classic kind of standoff in stud, and the waiter stopped with his tray of drinks to press in among the other kibitzers and watch the payoff. Lefty shucked out the last two cards carelessly as if they didn't really matter. His own fifth card made no difference. His jacks already had a busted flush beaten. His smile was just a little too sharp as he tossed me my last card face up and reached for the pot with the same left-handed gesture. I took the poker panatella out of my teeth. All blue, I said, turning up my whole card with the other hand. Lefty threw the unused part of the deck to the center of the table. That does it, you snake, he swore at me. It took a second for his accusation to sink in. I started across the table after him. If they hadn't stopped me, I would have torn his lying throat out. Funny, but there were kibitzers on my shoulders before I can rise an inch out of my chair. Down in Texas, you could get shot for a crack like that, Lefty, I said. I guess I really yelled it. And in New York, you can, and probably will, get your rotten throat slit for a trick like the one you just pulled, he replied. He turned to the other gamblers, most of whom had their hands on the edge of the table ready to jump to their feet if it got any rougher. I stacked the deck this last deal, he said coolly. He held a palm up at their surprised mutter. Texas' fifth card was stacked to be a heart, gamblers. You saw him get a spade and take the pot. I won't sit at the same table with a guy who can do that. Telekinesis has no place in poker. Pretty near as bad as stacked decks, one of the gamblers rasped. But the others weren't with him. I only had to take one look at Nick's face. I stood up slowly, and the hands on my shoulders didn't hold me down any longer. Lefty says he stacked the deck, I told him. I say he lies. You know there's nothing to choose between our statements. Lefty is a cheap grandstander, and I'll settle with him myself. Nick, I won't embarrass you tonight. This isn't your fault, but I'll be here tomorrow night, and you had better be glad to see me. Sure, Tex, he said uncomfortably, rising with me. Take my seat, Shorty, he directed one of the kibitzers. He walked around to grab me by the elbow and steer me as far away from Lefty's truculent face as he could. At least the sharp-chinned little rat had quit the game, too. Both of us had left our chips on the table. Nick wanted me to leave. Pay me off, I insisted. He said yes a lot quicker than I thought he would. The other gamblers could have squawked that my chip should go into the next pot, but apparently none of them did. Lefty sidled out as Nick was paying me off. Wait outside for me, I said to him. Why not, he said, sticking his chin out at me and walking out. Nick grabbed me again. Don't get hot, Tex, he warned me. I don't want a killing on my own sidewalk. Take it someplace else, huh, kid? Sure, I said. There wasn't any danger Lefty would hang around. I was big enough to break him in two, which is exactly what I planned if I caught up with him. It had been dark for some hours by the time I hit the street and waved for a skimcopter. Nick's games start late. You ask me to wait, somebody said. I spun around and saw Lefty standing in the alleyway beside the building. I went for him, charging hard. He scuttled back into the alley, out of what little light there was that far downtown. Just as I reached for him, somebody slugged me in the gut. I went down on a knee, gasping. I hadn't seen his sidekick. The alley was pretty dark. I heard Lefty's breath suck in sharply as I came up out of my crouch, diving for him. After all, it was only pain, something inside my head. It wasn't as though I'd been really crippled. My fingers clawed at his jacket and would have held him. But the other guy grabbed at my ankle and threw me down on the slippery cobbles again. I came up slower that time. I'd bunged up my kneecap more than I wanted to think about. Lefty was still out of reach. I called him a name that was always good for a fight in Texas and started after him, but slower than before. I wasn't fast enough to avoid the hard thing that rammed against my spine. Even down in Texas, a gun in the back freezes you up. Lefty was all guts now that I was hung up on the gun barrel. It might as well have been a meat hook. 
I warned you not to use Psy in the game, he snapped. Now you'll have to talk to Pete. One of us isn't going to live through this, I promised him, starting to reach for his throat. The gun jabbed a reminder to watch my manners. Do you come quietly, Lefty asked shrilly, or do we... The sudden shrillness of his voice scared me more than anything else. He was worked up worse than I was. Quietly, I conceded, trying to get some saliva to flow again. The pressure against my spine eased off. Lefty stepped out of the alley to the curb and flagged down a cruising copter. He made me get in first, which gave me a chance to turn when I sat down and see who had been holding the gun on me from behind. The gunman had drifted in one awful hurry. There wasn't a soul except Lefty around. He hopped in after me. The turbine howled as the driver gunned us up on the air cushion and sent us skimming away. The trip lasted only four or five minutes through the thinning traffic of late evening. We pulled up in front of a brownstone house in the upper 80s that reared up four stories among a string of three-story neighbors. I limped to the top of the steps after Lefty. He let us in with a key. We were in a dimly lit hall that had a staircase against its left wall and an open door at its right leading into a darkened room. A tall, skinny girl was sitting about a third of the way up the carpeted flight of steps. Her face was drawn out to a point by a long, thin nose. Here they are, she called up the stairway, showing braces on her teeth. She stood up and came down the hall. She was clad in a shorty wrapper that showed off her racehorse legs. Billy Joe, she said to Lefty, I told them you were coming. Hi, Fiola, he said. Good for you, he sounded pleased. There were steps above, and two others joined us. First came a short, square man with gray hair and bushy gray eyebrows. He was wrapped up in a flannel robe that had once been maroon and was now rusty with age and wear. It only served to confirm that he had just been yanked out of bed. He hadn't bothered to put anything on his bare feet or to comb his hair. A pretty wild-looking old man. Behind him stumped a chunky woman crowding fifty. She was in a worse state of disability. She hadn't quite made it to bed and was still in her slip. Her stockings had been unhitched from her garters and hung in slack transparency around her fat calves, like a sloughed-off skin of a snake. I told you, Fiola said to the gray-haired man. It's nice that you're right once in a while, he said in a scratchy, sleepy voice, walking past her to switch on the ceiling of the room on the right side of the hall. She didn't like that. Lefty stopped a reply. Will it be PC, he asked her. No, she said. You missed that one, Lefty said. Didn't neither. Well, sit in with us and see, he suggested. What for, she asked. I know what's going to happen in there. You'll be along to bed right soon, darling Billy. He looked over at me. Go on in, Tex, he said. Darling Billy, I sneered. Don't pay any attention to her, he said. She's in another time-space continuum. I pointedly oogled the girl's pretty legs going up the stairs and whistled softly. My wife, he said, blushing. A powerful PC, or someday will be. You're kidding, I said. His arm on my elbow pushed me into the lighted room. It had been the front parlor of the old brownstone in its prime, and was now fixed up as an office. The place held an executive desk with several buttons and enough other controls to put it in orbit. There were a number of cushioned straight-back chairs and a comfortable leather couch under the window. Only the fact that it was getting on towards midnight made me willing to believe that the couple who had walked down the stairs expected to be taken seriously. This is George Roberts and the poker whiz, Lefty said briefly to the two sleepy heads. They call him Tex. Tex, this is Peter Morrigan, Grand Master of the Lodge. The gray-haired man gave me a tired nod. I imagine you're a pretty angry young man, Mr. Robertson, he said in his scratchy voice. I started to tell him quite a little about how I felt, but he held up his hand. I've had a hard day, he complained, and I got out of bed solely to adjudicate your case. Now, this will go a lot more quickly if you listen. He smacked his lips a couple of times as if he wondered where he had left his partial plate. I hoped he had swallowed it. Sit down. Sit down, he said irritably, pointing to the chair across the desk from him. I debated it, but took the chair, grinding my teeth. You aren't stupid, or you wouldn't be a scientist, he said, revealing that he knew a lot more about me than I did about him. Let's start out with a couple of facts. He pointed a gnarled finger at Lefty. Wally Bupp stacked a deck of cards on you tonight, he said gruffly. What you don't know is that he stacked them with telekinesis. He's a TK. A snake, I gasped. Watch your lip, Merrigan croaked. Everybody in this room is a psi. Snake is a dirty word around here, Mr. Robertson. Mr. Bupp has a special aversion to it. What's the purpose? I began hotly. Ha! Morrigan barked. A good word. He cackled a laugh at me. Purpose. Exactly, Mr. Robinson. Well, the lodge has a purpose, and you'll act a lot more sensibly if you know it. You, he said to me, are a TK. You, I yelled right back, are a liar. He ignored me completely. 
We can't afford to have you gambling and cheating normals, he went on. One of the Lodge's fundamental rules is that no Psy may use his powers to the detriment of normals. Lefty's big scene at Nick's fixed it so you won't be welcome in a big-time poker game anywhere in town. We did that deliberately, and we're telling you to quit gambling as of this minute. You say you're a TK, I interrupted. Somewhat, he said. I have Psy powers, but I'm not mainly a TK. Whatever your powers are, I said, they don't make you Superman immune from the laws of libel. If you or anybody I catch breathes one false word about my being a snake, you'll be on the receiving end of the roughest lawsuit you've ever heard of. The silliness of that statement will occur to you in a while, he said dryly. And truth is a defense against a claim of libel. But to get back to purpose, our second purpose tonight is to get it through your thick head, Mr. Robinson, that the Lodge insists on its right to control your actions insofar as they involve the use of your psi powers. We mean business, Mr. Robertson, and before you are through with our heartless Mr. Bupp tonight, you'll know it. That's all that's behind our little charade. He came to a stop and took a deep breath. I'm going to make one statement and rest on it, I said, trying to keep my voice calm and level. He shrugged. Your turn, he said. I'm a normal, I said. I flatly deny that I have the slightest shred of psi power. I accuse that freckled snake over there of lying deliberately. I'll make him pay for it and he'll be lucky if it isn't with his blood. That's all? Isn't it enough? He laughed harshly and grinned over at Lefty. Some of you maverick sighs scream like a gelded porker, he said. I figured you'd tell me we'd cost you a fortune in prospective poker winnings, to say the least. My stomach dropped. I hadn't thought of that, not as much as I should have. It was my only income. Something a darn sight more important than money is involved, I said. Maybe you aren't such a bad guy, he decided. He looked over at the woman standing silently in her slip beside the desk, her bare arms folded over her ample bosom. How about it, Millie? he asked her. She shrugged. He believes what he says, she told him. He honestly doesn't think he has any side powers. That mitigates the affair, Morrigan said. Still, our purpose demands an object lesson. I have to fine you, Mr. Robertson. You've broken one of our rules by using TK to stack a poker deck. Because you weren't aware of it, though, half of your fine will be remitted if you join the lodge within a week. Accordingly, I assess you, um, how much, Millie? he asked. He's got eight thousand and some in his breast pocket, she said with fiendish accuracy. Every penny he has in the world. Assess you eight thousand dollars, Morgan concluded. He got wearily to his feet and started to pad past me towards the door. Mr. Bupp will collect, he said. The woman followed him, her hose hanging down around her ankles, and climbed the stairs stolidly behind him. Lefty, who Morrigan had just called Wally Bupp, walked around behind the desk and took the swivel chair that the older man had just vacated. I'll take the eight thousand now, Tex, he said, poking his chin at me belligerently. You'll take four, I said, getting my feet under me. He frowned. Four, he repeated. Four knuckles, I gritted and started for him. The gun barrel rammed me in the kidney, harder than it had in the alley. They'd smuggled in some protection. I really slammed on the brakes halfway across the desk. Lefty hadn't bothered to flinch, but sat there with his legs crossed, looking idly at his fingernails. Look behind you, he said. I did. The gun eased off my kidney as I turned. There wasn't anybody there. TK, Lefty said. I also used it to trip you up when you went for me in the alley, after I'd TK to left right in your gut. You're a hired guy to stop, Tex, but don't overdo it. Mere pain never stopped a guy who really meant it. I went for him again. Then it hit me. A deep and sickening pain throbbed from my breastbone down my left arm. The light started to dim, and I sagged down on the desk. How'd that feel, Lefty asked, apparently not expecting an answer. I clamped your coronary artery shut for a few seconds. A post-mortem would never be able to tell it from the real thing if I held down tight. His grin had a viciousness in it I hadn't seen before. He held out his hand. I struggled erect and handed my wallet to him. He only took out the big bills and tossed it back across the desk to me. Thanks, he said. You'll get half of this back if you decide to join the lodge within a week. What's all this about a lodge, I tried weakly. What lodge? Why, this lodge, Lefty said, waving a hand around loosely. It's an organization of folks with psi powers, guys like you and me, Tex. I'm no TK, I growled. I didn't manipulate those cards in any way. Funny you say that, he said, looking interested and leaning his elbows on the desk. You're right. I hadn't actually bothered to stack the deck, Tex. Just kept a light TK touch on it to see if you were moving cards. You weren't. But you were hitting them right all the time. 
I haven't had time to tell Marga and the boys on the crap patrol were wrong. It wasn't telekinesis text. It was precognition. You're a PC text. He stood up and pointed towards the door. I was shaking so badly from the heart attack the snake had induced that I got up helplessly and allowed him to steer me out by the elbow. Remember, he said at the head of the steps that led down the street, you've got a week to make up your mind about joining the lodge. In the meantime, don't gamble. Great, I said bitterly. You sat me down and rolled me for my poke, or the next thing to it, and now you tell me not to get in a game and try to get whole again? Why should you care? You don't listen, he said sourly. Look, size are supermen, in spite of your sneers, and whether you like it or not, Tex, you've got some psi powers. Normals resent, fear, and hate us. We can't afford to have you make a killing at a poker table and then get exposed as a snake. We size are a tiny minority. We all get blame for things any one of us does. I'm a normal, I said a little hollowly. You're more fortunate than that, he assured me. Just so you understand the origin and purpose of the Lodge, we find strength in union, strength to resist the pressure of the majority, and membership in the Lodge gives us control, control over size like you who might bring the wrath of the normal majority down on us by their short-sightedness. I shook my head. You don't have to dress it up like this, I protested. This is blackmail or extortion, I'm not sure which. I'm not joining anything you bunch of creeps are part of. You won't find that practical, he said, turning to go back inside. And remember, stay away from cards. You're supposed to have nightmares at night. I had mine the whole next day. No, I wasn't a TK, Lefty had said. I was a PC. You don't have anemia text, it's leukemia. I made a farce of trying to get some work done in the lab. After letting the third test tube slip through my fingers and shatter on the lab bench, I gave it up. How would you have acted if you had gotten that kind of news? the first gut-twisting admission that you really may be a snake, then sharp awareness of what it means. A guillotine couldn't cut you off more sharply from normal humanity, but the spirit struggles and refuses to accept it. You can't be a snake. Take action, I said aloud, getting a worried look from my lab assistant, busy mopping up my last shattered culture. Don't spin around like this. Do something. I did the only thing I could think of and dialed Sherry at her laboratory. She refused to accept the call at first. Finally, she tore herself away from a delicate experiment long enough to look at me angrily in the screen. We don't have anything to say to each other, she said coldly. There are delicate experiments. Can you test me for psi powers? I interrupted. Whatever for? To settle whether I have any, I snapped. It's important to me. Not necessary, she said. Do you think I'd be successful in the psi field if I weren't sensitive to this sort of thing? Don't worry, Tex. You're a normal. Thanks, I said. So you've told me. Now prove it to my satisfaction. We shut up shop at five o'clock, she said. I'll be here for about an hour after that. My dinner date isn't until seven. Bet he doesn't gamble, I said, trying to win a little sympathy. You bet he doesn't, she sniffed. Sherry's laboratory was nothing more than a large, windowless office that can be cut into two soundproof parts with a movable partition. She had a whopper desk with full controls and other evidences of academic pelf. On a table against the short wall was her apparatus, if that's what you'd call decks of cards, a roulette wheel, a set of Rhine ESP cards, several dice, and, so help me, a crystal ball. Sherry stood up behind her desk when I came in. It was something of a shock to find that her colorful peasant getup was antiseptically sheathed in a white laboratory coat. She was sure dressed for dirtier work than she would ever have to do in that lab. Her first look at me was one of surprise but it softened to one of concern, which might have been cheering on some other occasion. What has happened, Tex? she asked. Nothing, I said, keeping calm. Not a thing. Outside of seeing a ghost, eh, she said. Stop grinding your teeth like that. You'll give me the creeps. Sit down. Sit down. Do you hear me? Relax. I guess I found the chair across from her at the desk. Do I have psi powers, I asked her. Either TK or PC? Test me, Sherry. What happened, she insisted. I shook my head. I'd rather not talk about it. Not until I know the result of your test, I said. Sherry thought about it for a while, tapping her desk with an irritated finger, and finally got a set of cards from the lab table against the wall. She shuffled them slowly on her desk blotter. Cards are your strong point, she observed. If you have any psi powers, you're most likely to show up with cards. I take it you will do your utmost to be right? Who would double-cross himself, I said tightly. Most people, Sherry said, when it comes to psi. But we'll assume for a starter that you're on the level. She stacked the cards in her hand. We'll keep it simple, Sherry suggested. I'll deal the cards one at a time. 
All you have to do is tell me whether the next card will be red or black. Fair? Sure, I said. Deal. She was a lousy dealer. Or maybe it was because it was a one-handed operation. She was scoring my hits and misses with a little counter in her other hand. She ran the deck ten times for me. I got 38 right on my best attempt and 37 wrong on my worst. In total of 520 chances, I was right 273, or 52.2% 2 of the time, according to Sherry's slide rule. Oh no, I said dismally. I do have a little edge on the cards. As a statistician, you'd make a great biochemist, Sherry said, putting the deck away. That would only be true if I hadn't let you see your hits and misses as each deal proceeded. You made succeeding guesses in the knowledge of what you had already been dealt. Actually, your score was below average for trained observers without psi powers. She heaved a sigh, which somehow seemed to be of relief. And now, you crazy cowpoke, she said, tell me what this is all about. I'm not a psi, I demanded. Not if you were really trying, she said, were you? You think I want to be a psi, I demanded. I told her all that had happened the night before, from the time Lefty had accused me of being a snake until he had let me out of the brownstone house and warned me against gambling. Guess how Sherry reacted. A big nothing. Well, I asked as she sat silent with her elbows on the edge of her desk and her chin propped up on her knuckles. You're really quite naive, aren't you, Tex? she asked me. Let me give you an objective statement of what happened to you last night. She counted these things off on her fingers. You won some money at poker. A gambler said you used TK to win. He took your winnings and then some away from you as the price of silence. He warned you not to gamble anymore. He claimed he was part of an organization of side personalities. Is that a fair statement? Except for one thing, I said. He used his side powers on me in a pretty dramatic fashion. Try Occam's razor, she suggested. She was getting insulting. All right, I growled, feeling my face get red. Prefer the simpler explanation if you can find one. I was prodded in the back, both in the alley and in the office at the Brownstone house. Something hit me in the gut and tripped me up. I had a heart seizure. What's simpler than TK in accounting for the fact that this was done without a soul around? I suppose I shouldn't be critical of you, she said. It's not your field and you haven't been exposed to the links to which charlatans go just to prove they're supermen. The simpler explanation is that there was someone else in the alley, carefully dressed in dull black to stay invisible in the darkness. The second prodding of a gun in your spine was pure suggestion. You'd been so well sold by that time you were ready to believe anything. And my heart attack? I can think of ten poisons that would give you the symptoms, Sherry said. And don't tell me you let nothing pass your lips, she burst out hotly as I started to speak. I suppose you'd never had a spray hypodermic. You'd never have felt it. Don't you see why they went to all this trouble? Honestly, I said, I can't. I'm simply not that important to anyone in the world. You're not, she said dryly. But your $8,000 was. I'd say if people can steal that much money and convince the victim he shouldn't go to the police, it was worth their while. You're not very likely to advertise the claim that you're a psi, are you? No, I admitted. And, she said wearily standing up, there's always the angle that they'll con you by letting you into their imaginary lodge and extract some kind of dues out of you in return for keeping quiet about your so-called psi powers when you gamble. That would serve you right, she concluded. For what, I demanded, beginning to feel pretty icy. Being such an easy mark, for one thing, Sherry said. And for seriously thinking that you might be a PC. That, I must confess, I find most comical of all. You, Tex, a PC. Why is that funnier than being a TK, I demanded, getting up. She waved her hand impatiently. We see a little TK here in the lab right along, she said. At least there are those who seem to have a small, genuine edge on the cards that we can explain no other way. It's small, but apparently exists. But precognition? That's not simply mechanical or kinetic like TK. PC is something terrifyingly different. Her voice hushed as she said it. It's a kind of sensitivity that has nothing to do with mere kinetics. It defies time. She looked back at me. I simply find it comical that you thought of yourself as sensitive to that degree. So I've been a fool, I mused. In a word, yes. You're a normal. They suckered you if you want the jargon. Wait till tonight, I see, beginning to feel my anger grow as my fear dwindled. Let them try to pin the sigh label on me. I'll call their bluff. The TV phone on Sherry's desk rang, and she pressed the accept key. Let me speak with Tex, a familiar aggressive voice said. It didn't sound as if it would stand for much nonsense. Sherry still had another look of surprise in her. For you, she said arching her romantic eyebrows and turning the instrument around so I was facing the scope and screen. 
Sure enough, it was Wally Bupp. Don't do it, Tex, he warned me. Don't do what? Don't play tonight. It won't be practical. We mean business. So do the laws of libel, I said. One crack about my having psi powers. Yeah, yeah, he interrupted. You told us about the lawsuit, he said. You've got six more days. I could see his hand coming up to cut the image. Hey, I said. How'd you know where to reach me? His sharp face split in that vicious grin. I forgot to tell you, he said. Murrigan is a clairvoyant, too. The image faded. See what I mean, I said shakily to Sherry. They sure talk a good game. I didn't tell a soul I was coming here. How'd they catch me? Occam's razor, she said. How many wrong numbers did they try first? Come back to Earth. That snake lefty still worries me, I admitted, going to the door. Sherry, I know I've acted nuts, but they nearly got me to flip. Thanks for helping me. I couldn't have stood it to know I was a snake. You got my mind back on track again. Not enough to keep from going back to the poker table, she observed. There didn't seem to be any point in telling her how badly I needed the dough. Anyway, I had to prove a point. I was a normal. I left. There were already seven at the table when I got to Nick's after dinner. He didn't want to deal me in. Seven's a full table, huh, Tex, he said. Not for stud, it isn't, I told him. You can deal to ten gamblers. Dealer's choice tonight, he protested, while some of the gamblers eyed me curiously. Can't deal to more than seven for three-card draw. I told you where I stood on this thing last night, I snapped. All right, Nick said warmly. So maybe I'd like the whole stink to cool down a little, huh? Not with my dough in it, Nick, I told him, being pretty free with something I didn't have much of anymore. You'll deal me in tonight, or I'll find another banker. A gink with a long, scrawny neck put down his highball and rose from the table. Gosh, fellas, he said, I'm sort of a fifth wheel around here, I guess. Here, neighbor, he insisted, take my place. He was all grins and teeth and bobbed his head around with a rural awkwardness. You don't have to do that, Sneed, Nick started to say. Just as soon, Kibitz, he insisted, drawing up a chair behind me as I took his seat. You don't mind, neighbor, he asked anxiously. I shook my head and yanked out my much-depleted wallet to pay for chips. It took all that the lodge hadn't. Four hands were enough. On the first, at stud, I had aces back-to-back -back and picked up a pair of sevens on the next two cards. Two pair, aces high, will win about ninety-nine out of a hundred stud hands. I chewed down on the panatella in my teeth and bet them like I had them. The tilt of my cigar showed just a little too much confidence as a way to convince some of the gamblers that I was bluffing. It must have been a good act, for three of them stayed with me all the way. None of them had much showing, and regardless of what their whole cards were, by the time we had our fifth cards, I had them all beaten. It was raise against raise, but somebody finally called, and I turned over my ace in the hole. Aces and sevens, gamblers, I grinned, reaching for the pot. I see the sevens, a fat man across the table said around his cigar. But what's this jazz about aces? So help me, Hannah, my whole card was a two. I tried to cover it up. You'll have to admit I bet them like aces, I said. Somebody laughed, but not very hard. I paid mighty close attention to what I was dealt the next hand and turned down a drink to make sure I was cold sober. Unfortunately, I got all screwed up over what one of the other gamblers had. It had been a bunch of spinach when I'd been betting my pair against it, but it was one good-looking straight when he flipped the card in the hole. The third hand I dropped out before the fourth card. After a gambler raked in that pot, my kibitzer asked me, how much do you have to have on the first three cards to stay in the pot? Any pair would convince me, I said. Why? What was the matter with the kings you had showing, he asked. They were still on the table in front of me, king of hearts and king of clubs. I scarcely dared bet the fourth hand. We had switched to three-card draw. I discarded two small diamonds, keeping a pair of nines and an ace for a kicker. On the draw, I got one card that claimed to be the 14 of eagles, and one which there was a message reading, These hallucinations are sent to you with the courtesy of the Manhattan chapter of the lodge. Are you finding it practical? I threw the hand in and stood up shaking. Since when don't you bet a full house, my kibitzer demanded after the hand was won. He picked up what I had thrown in. The 14 of eagles turned out to be a nine, and the card with the hallucination message, the other ace. Gotta confuse the other betters, I said, one of the fundamentals of poker. There really weren't enough chips left in front of me to bother cashing in. I just left them lying there and wandered down to the street, flat broke. Wally Bupp was right. I hadn't found it practical. All of a sudden, I saw that it really didn't matter whether I was a psi or not. The important question had always been whether Lefty and the others were size. If so, they might be on the level about my psi powers, which meant I was right back being a snake again. And if they weren't, it was a simple case of blackmail, which at least let me rejoin the human race. 
On that basis, I was in tough shape. Occam's razor had no answer for hallucinations. Either you had them or you hadn't. I had. Nobody could change my mind on that score. That made Sneed and presumably Lefty a sigh. And me too. But what if they were mistaken? Cherry's test looked conclusive to me. I saw that as the only way out. I had to insist on a test in their presence. And that meant I had to get in touch with Wally Bupp. My kibitzer came stalking out of the building, gangling and gawky. Didn't mean to spoil your luck, neighbor, he said. Don't give it a second thought, Sneed, I said. Call me Mortimer, he said. You mind a word of advice, neighbor, he asked, bobbing his head around and grinning in a self-conscious way. Next time, bet that fourteen. Highest card in the deck beats all the others. You lousy snake, I gasped. I'd learned better than to take a poke at him. Lefty had taught me my lesson on that one. Sneed might turn out to be a TK as well as a hallucinator, and I wanted no more heart attacks. He handed me a card. There'll be somebody at this number all night, neighbor. Gamblers Anonymous. He faded off down the dark street. The card merely said, Manhattan Chapter, number 55600. Sherry must have had a swell time at dinner with some guy who didn't gamble because she didn't come home until nearly midnight. I know because I dialed her apartment every ten minutes until I got her face on the screen. She was still dressed for dinner and had sort of a tiara over her thick tresses. What is it, she said. I'm not a sigh, I demanded. No, she said. Hasn't this gone? Well then, am I crazy? I cut in on her. Her lips compressed. It's a lot more likely, she decided. Why? Either I'm nuts, I told her, or those characters really are sighs. She was reaching up to cut the image when I caught her interest. Is there such a thing as a sigh who can induce hallucinations, I demanded. No, flatly. They've got me sold that they can do it, I said. What does Occam's razor say about that? You idiot, she exploded. They don't believe you are a PC any more than I do. She was so sensitive about my having precognition. Okay, I said, then you make them eat it. Aren't you the one who knows all about exposing charlatans? That was the right button. Certainly, Sherry said. I'll pick you up in ten minutes, I said. Now? Midnight? This is the payoff, I said, and cut the image. I dialed the number Sneed had given me. Manhattan Chapter, the operator cartoon said. This is George Robertson, I said. Mortimer Sneed told me there'd be someone here to talk to me. Maybe Lefty. Sneed, the cartoon said, frowning. No one here by that. Oh, wait a minute. Dr. Walter Bupp will talk to you, the cartoon said, and Wally's face appeared on the screen. It wasn't practical, I admitted. Six days early, he observed. Nuts, I said. Look, you've got me convinced you are a sigh. That Sneed puts on a terrific show. Sneed, he frowned. Oh, he laughed. Yeah, he agreed condescendingly. He's red hot every now and then. But you haven't sold me that I'm a PC, I growled. I've been tested. I'm not. Now I want you to get off my back. You and the rest of them lay off. He shook his head. The Lodge acts unilaterally on this, he said soberly. You've got psi powers. You'll accept our direction in their use or else, Tex. All I ask is a fair test, I said desperately, under laboratory conditions. He gave me an address. Come any time, he said. That's me walking in, I told him. Sherry had to pay off the copter when we got there. It wasn't the brownstone I had seen the night before. This place was a medium-sized office building, say a hundred stories or so, quite new. There was no identification on its front other than the street number. The directory in the silent and unpopulated lobby was names, all names. But Dr. Walter Bupp was one of them, in 7704. Sherry and I rode the elevator to 77 in chilly silence. The corridor was dim with its lights on nighttime setting. Stronger light came from an open door quite a way down the hall. It had to be Bupp's office, and it was. Well, he certainly wasn't surprised to see Sherry. He shook hands with her briefly, pushing his sharp chin out at her in his gamecock fashion. Your maid, he asked me. Certainly not, she told him. We're uh, colleagues at the university. That's not what Viola says, he told her sourly, pointing to chairs we could take. Viola, Sherry questioned. A powerful PC, Wally said. She predicted you would accompany Tex tonight. Oh, really, Sherry said scathingly. I was there, I told her. She really did. Let's not be diverted by sideshows, Sherry said. We're here to measure the psi powers of Tex Robertson, not to talk over the reputed clairvoyance of some dim and misty character. Precognition, while he corrected her. Stick around, Dr. King. Fiola will be down a little later. She thinks Tex is something special. That was not going to make a good interchange, so I cut in. Dr. King is a professional in this field, I started. While he waved a disgusted hand, we know all about Dr. King and her field, he said. 
proving that psi powers don't exist, right, Dr. King? Sherry bristled. It was hard to stay friendly in any talk with Bup. You know my field, she said, about 20 degrees below zero. I accept any and all evidence, regardless of what it proves. There's a lot of talk about psi powers, but precious little that can ever be detected under laboratory conditions. Oh well, Wally Bup grinned. That's not so strange. All members of the lodge are cautioned to stay away from laboratories. You've been testing normals. What do you expect for results? Then you show me, she stormed. Go on with you, he grinned. I thought it was Texas powers you wanted tested. Mine are irrelevant. I thought so, she said triumphantly. Charlatan. For a moment, the grin flickered off his face, and I tensed to catch Sherry if she should start to drop. But I guess he thought better of it. Some other time, he said. Let's get this over with. Make it simple. You may have some statistical objections to my technique tonight, but I'm not looking for fringe effects. If this hot-eyed swain of yours is any good at all, he'll bat a thousand. He got a deck of cards out of his desk drawer and fanned it out face up so he could pluck the two of spades and the two of hearts from the deck. The rest he put back in his desk. He put his hands under the desk with the two cards in them, produced the cards again face down and laid them in a thin stack on the desk before all of us. What's on top, he said, red or black? How will you score, Sherry insisted. He scowled at her and tossed a squeeze counter across the desk. You score, he said. It really isn't necessary. Tex will either be right all the time or it won't matter. But before I could call the top card, the office door opened behind us. I looked around, expecting Fiola. Instead, it was Millie with the down-down hose. Only this time she was decently dressed in a dark two-piece suit and wore makeup. She certainly was no more talkative than before, nor did Wally introduce her. Sherry was perfectly equal to the occasion and looked through Millie with composure. This takes about three generations of overbreeding. Try it, Wally insisted. What's on top? I hit it. Then I missed it. Then I hit three in a row. It wasn't fast work, because Wally hid the cards under his desk after each guess, shuffled the two cards around, and then laid them before me again. This went on for about twenty minutes. At that point, Sherry spoke. That makes exactly three hundred tries, she said, looking at the counter in her hand. Have you been keeping score, Mr. Bupp? I thought you were. So I was, she snapped, throwing up her tiara at head. He sure brought out the worst in people. Tex has been right exactly one hundred and fifty times. He's never been more than five tries to the good in the whole series. Interesting, Wally said. I took my first decent breath in the day. This ought to let me off the hook, I said to him. Are you convinced? He shrugged. How about it, Millie, he asked. A random sample, she said. He doesn't want to score. He didn't try. Sherry was ready for that one. She turned and spoke to Millie. You have ways of knowing what Tex was thinking, she asked sweetly. Yes. Name any three, Sherry lashed at her furiously. The solid woman wasn't the least bit bowled over. Read his mind, she said matter-of-factly, just like I can tell that you're getting ready to screech charlatan at me, and like you think I got a cast-iron girdle and homely shoes. Well, they're comfortable, dearie, which is more than I can say for those high-heeled slippers of yours. That left little toe of yours is killing you, dearie. Sherry's lips moved, but her mouth was as empty of sound as her face was of blood. Millie had hit the bullseye. Everybody relax a moment, Wally said. Tell me, Dr. King, what's your attitude towards PC? I don't have any, she snapped. It's a phenomenon. I have as much attitude towards it as I do towards osmosis or towards peristalsis. None. Would you consider a person fortunate to possess the power of precognition, Wally asked her? Sherry's head came up. If there were such a thing, she said, much more quietly, yes, I should imagine that precognition would be a very powerful talent. If you have no emotional bias against Psy as such, he went on smoothly, you'd be happy for Tex if he were a PC. Her eyebrows drew together. She looked at me, veiling her violet eyes as if to hide her thoughts from us. I would consider Tex quite fortunate, but only if you could show that such a thing really existed, she said more loudly. How about you, Tex, Wally asked me. Nuts, I said. You can't make me like the idea of being a snake no matter how you dress it up. I shook my head. Psy powers are the mark of a diseased mind for my dough. They're pure poison. What have they ever done for you, I insisted rudely. Made me a surgeon, he said. Never, Sherry said hotly. Ask Tex, Wally suggested. He felt me put a lift on his coronary artery. I'm a TK surgeon. I've got enough TK to put clamps on inaccessible arteries and feel out mechanical disorders of the body. Check it. I'm on the staff at Universal Hospital. And what are you doing here, she argued. Meeting my obligation to the lodge, he said. This is where I got my training, right in this building. I thought that brownstone house was the lodge, I said. 
No, he said, that's just the Grand Master's residence. The lodge provides quarters for its brass. This building is the real chapter house. He heaved a long sigh and dug into his drawer again. You can beat it, Millie, he said. Thanks. I know, she told him from the door. She had started out long before he spoke. Impressive stuff, but it got a sniff from Sherry. What Wally got out of his desk had a refreshing shape and color. It was oblong. It was green. It was money. It was, in fact, a stack of $1,000 bills. Wally shuffled the two cards under the desk again and piled them too deep in front of Sherry and me. You heard what Dr. King said, Wally reminded me. She'll love you no less for being a PC. Now, we'll play the game a little more realistically. Every time you guess the top card right, Tex, I'm going to give you $1,000. No strings attached. When you miss, you give one back. But if you have none to give, you don't have to pay. You can't lose. Maybe you can win. All set? One minute, I demanded. Sherry, is this a fair test? She shrugged. Why not? Is it gambling? She smiled faintly, her first sign of relaxation. Hardly, she said. Then you don't mind if I win? She found a laugh this time. You can try, she corrected me. This could be our nest egg, I said. She blushed. If that's a proposal, she said tartly, the answer is no. I'll talk to you later, I growled, when I'm richer. I looked at the back of the card on the desk. Wally was leaning back in his swivel chair and wasn't within four feet of the pasteboards. If there was any hanky-panky, I couldn't see how he planned to work it. Heart, I said. Why don't you turn it over, Dr. King, Wally suggested. Remove any possible chance of manipulation. It was the two of hearts that Sherry turned over. I was a thousand dollars richer. I won the next. And the next. My stomach tightened up. Every thousand dollars drove another nail into my coffin. Went that much further to prove I was a snake. Well, I wasn't. I missed the fourth one. Cut that out, Wally snapped at me. I jumped a foot. I had tried to miss it. With a sickening realization of doom, I called the next four right. Stop it, Sherry screeched, grabbing the cards. I'll shuffle, she announced. She hid the pasteboards from me with her body and took care in putting them before me on the desk that I didn't see the face of the bottom card. Her eyes were violet pools of hate and rage, and she spoke to me. Now try it. Spade. That made eight straight. Even Sherry succumbed to the ghastly fascination of it. There had been $50,000 in the stack of bills Wally had taken from his desk. Soon, all 50 of the bills were stacked in front of me, except for the one time I had tried to, I had never missed. Lefty stuck his sharp chin at Sherry. I'd call that a fairly convincing string, he said. Will you concede, Dr. King? She gave him an awful mouthful of silence. A pitiless blackness descended over my spirit. I looked at the money in front of me. It had been like selling my soul to the devil. There it was, all that money. All I'd had to give up was any claim to being a human. I wasn't a normal anymore. I was a sigh. Then Sherry was talking in short, gasping bursts, half choking, half sobbing. No wonder Tex is in a whirl, she said. I've seen some good illusions worked by the best light-fingered operators in the country, but nothing to compare to this. Just let me see you match this charade in my laboratory with my apparatus. She meant her playing cards. Wally was sweet and reasonable. You dealt and shuffled most of the hands yourself, he reminded her. I never touched the cards. How could I control them? He grinned a little more sharply. And you can't call it TK, he went on. Did you feel the cards move or twitch or resist you as you shuffle them? It has to be PC. She blew her top on that one. It's sickening to see someone you love goaded past all endurance and break down into screams and wild gestures. Ah, she cried, shaking her head blindly. Before I believe that Tex Robertson can feel things that I can't feel, I'll accept any other explanation. What are those cards of yours? Small TV screens? Is this more electronic hokum? Wally quietly tore one of the cards in two. Now I understand, he said. That's the real reason. I looked my surprise at him, and Sherry quieted down just a little. Relax, Dr. King, he advised her. The possession of Psy powers isn't a mark of moral superiority. Part of the problem in the Lodge is that Psy powers are possessed as often by evil and stupid people as by the good and intelligent. Yes, I know that you think you deserve precognition, Dr. King, but that ain't the way the ball bounces. You're a normal, Dr. King, and that's all you'll ever be. He got a face full of fingers for his trouble. Sherry leaped to her feet and really slapped him in the kisser. She stormed out of there. I started to follow, but a tug at my earlobe signaled me to stop. Hold on a minute, Tex, Wally said sympathetically. You're one of us now. I had to go after her. I love her, I said hopelessly. I can't see her hurt and upset like that. I've got to. But he was shaking his head. You haven't got a chance, Wally. She'll never forgive you for having precognition. That's why she made the study of Psy her life work. 
She wanted PC for herself and was sure she was pure enough of heart to deserve to have the power. Well, she doesn't have it, and she'll hate you for having what she thinks she deserves. Forget her. Talk about your cup brimming over. Well, if I had to get used to being cut off from the human race, perhaps Sherry was the place to start. That's what happens to superhumans. There was one desperate hope. This wasn't hallucination, I tried. No, Tex, he said calmly. This was on the level. Just for fun, he went on, can you do it when there isn't any money riding on it? Reluctantly, I came back to his desk and looked down at the back of the top card. Heart, I said dully. I hit ten times in a row for him. The spade was on top four times, the heart six times. And was that on the level, I asked? He scowled at me and chewed his thin lips. Yeah, he said. That settles it, I said, sagging back into my seat. I'm a snake, a rotten PC. Don't you believe it, Wally growled, lunging out of his chair. He started to pace back and forth across the office, his chin stuck way out ahead of him as he prowled. I don't know what you are, Tex, he declared, but you're no PC. I'm a normal after all, I gasped, feeling a surge of blessed relief. He swiped at the air with a hand. Don't be silly, he snapped. You've got a psi power so incredible that he whirled on me while I died for good. You explain it, he insisted. After your lovely Dr. King flew out of here, I shuffled the cards ten times under the desk, and you hit ten in a row, right? Right, dismally. I cheated on the shuffle, he told me. I used TK to make sure that I put the two spades on top all ten times. No, I insisted. Six times the heart was on top. You turned them over yourself. That's just it, he whispered, leaning toward me. I put that spade on top every time. I did. But when I turned it over, more than half the time it was a heart. You mean I'm a hallucinator, I asked? Look, this is getting ridiculous. I was kidding myself, too? Nonsense. It was real. His face jerked in surprise. You couldn't, he gasped as the idea hit him. But you did, he reminded himself. Wait till Morrigan hears this. And then he told me. It couldn't be, I knew, but it was. He proved it to me, or I proved it to us. At some stage, you have to get excited about it if it's no more than a grisly fascination. At that, it was dawn before we could stop our intoxicated talk. Marigan had been yanked out of bed again, and when he heard the news, woke up a darn sight faster than the night before. Fiola of the racehorse legs joined us, and several other sighs as well. Before it was over, the Grandmaster had put on a ridiculous piece of regalia and mumbled me into probationary membership in the lodge. There was nothing creepy about the ritual, only about the way I felt. I guess if we hadn't gotten hungry, we'd be there yet. Wally had one last little wrinkle for me as I started down the corridor for the elevator. Fiola, he called. Yes, darling Billy, she said, coming to his side. How's Tex going to make out with that over-educated iceberg he's hot after, he asked her. I flinched at the thought of Sherry. I was getting used to considering her a memory. Fiola looked into the corner for a moment. Oh, yum, she said, smiling and showing the braces on her teeth. She kissed me. I think I was about as startled as Wally was. Just so you let her be the only Cassandra, she said. And you call that an iceberg? She looked at me curiously. You better start eating red meat, Tex, she told me, and would say no more. I had a heck of a time getting Sherry on the phone. An hour before lunch, she caved in and accepted my call. She looked pale and shaken, even in the black and white of the screen. Please, she said, I've had all I can stand. You stayed there all night, didn't you? I'm not a PC, Sherry, I said. Nothing else would have caught her ear. Not? I proved it before I left, I said. I can prove it to you, too. Ridiculous, you can't prove a negative. Well, in a manner of speaking. What I can do is show you how the card trick was worked. I had her hooked. You mean it? It really was a trick after all, she said, slumping? It sure wasn't PC, I said. Let me show you. At the lab, Sherry said. I'll be there in ten minutes. A couple of graduate students were there fooling around with Rhine cards when we arrived, and Sherry chased them out without ceremony. She locked the door behind them. We were to have privacy. She didn't bother with her lab coat this time. Show me, she insisted. The apparatus, Sherry, I grinned. She gave me a deck of cards and pulled out the two of hearts and the two of spades. We'll do it face up, I said, so you can see how it's done. I laid the two cards side by side on her blotter face up. Now put a finger on each one, I directed, and watch them like a hawk. What card is under your right forefinger? Heart, Sherry said. Wrong, I told her. Spade. They could have heard that shriek clear to Keokuk. Good thing we were in a soundproof laboratory. I got her calmed down after a while. It didn't happen, she insisted, clutching at her temples. If you won't holler, I said, I'll do it again. Remember, it's just a phenomenon, like osmosis. It is not, she gasped. But I did it for her. Ten times in a row, the cards changed under her fingers without moving. 
So it's not PC, I said. Oh, Tex, but what is it? You agree it's real? Sherry nodded. It's real. You can do it, whatever it is. What is it? TK, I told her. Telekinesis. Nonsense, she said. Are you trying to make me believe I wouldn't have felt the cards move if you'd snapped them out from under my fingers? I was pressing hard on them every time. I didn't move the cards, I explained. But you said it was telekinesis. Sure. I just moved the molecules of the pigment in the printing ink and reassembled them in the opposite cards. You didn't expect to feel molecular movement, did you? No. Then it really happened? I nodded. What an incredible power, she said. A glow of satisfaction spread over me. Can you really test this molecular hypothesis, she asked. I told her of the hours of demonstrations I had made during the night. The perception on scanning part of it goes on at some subconscious level, Sherry, I said, but we had evidence that it can be made completely conscious. She shuddered and hugged her arms to herself. I hate to say this to you, she said, but you're a freak. I took a deep breath and smiled. Unique is the way the Grand Master puts it, I said, pleased with myself. He says it has terrific possibilities. And then it hit me, that delicious thought that I was among the elect, that I always had been. What possibilities, Sherry demanded, recoiling from me, doing card tricks? To name a few, I said, they feel sure I can operate directly on the molecular chain and genes. This means we can alter heredity to suit ourselves. Next, why not rearrange the DNA molecule in a cancer? If you can change the genes in one cell, you can change them in another. Knock out the ability of cancerous cells to reproduce their own kind, and the cancer disappears. A silly one. Morrigan says that I can be a one-man catalytic cracking station. Pipe a liquid through a tube within my TK range, and I can make an equilibrium reaction run uphill as the stuff flows past me. How about a one-step operation to produce those rare drugs and now take 49 separate reactions? This does have a significance for science, she admitted. The genetic part is right down your alley, and it's not PC, is it? Strictly TK, I told her. You're the only PC in the family. Family? She turned pink as I went around the desk after her. I told you the answer was no. I have inside information, I said, pulling her to me. One of the PCs up at the chapter house said this was what would happen. She didn't fight my kiss for more than a couple of seconds. Then it was a pure case of self-preservation for me. This girl was a tiger. Looks can be awfully deceiving. She broke away from me. Tex, she gasped. Stop, honey. Suppose somebody walks in. A PC like you never gets that kind of surprise, I lied valiantly. Am I, she whispered. Am I really a PC? That's why you locked the door, I said. Remember? End of Card Trick by Walter Bupp Reading by Richard Green www.richardgreenmagic.com The Business, as usual, by Jack Sharkey This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Business, as usual by Jack Sharkey. In 1962, the United States Air Force found itself possessed of a formidable tool of battle, a radar-resistant airplane. While this was the occasion for much rejoicing among the Defense Department members who were cleared for top secret, this national defense solution merely posed a greater problem. What should we do with it? There must, said the Secretary of Defense, be some utilization of this new device to demonstrate to certain powers that the world can be made safe for freedom and democracy. Certain powers my foot, said the president. Why don't we ever just come out and say it? Policy, the secretary said. We've always walked softly in our foreign policy, especially softly in cases where we didn't have the big stick to carry. Well, grumbled the president, we've got the big stick now. What do we do with it? We just want to shake it a bit, said the secretary. No contusions intended, of course. We just have to let him know we have it, but are too kind-hearted to use it, unless provoked. Naturally. I can see, said the president, that this new plane is burning a hole in your pocket. Suppose we do send it flying over Russia. Mr. President, said the Secretary of Defense. The president sighed. All right, all right. Flying over certain areas, then. Let's say we get it there. Fine. What do we do with it? Drop leaflets? No, that comes under the proselytizing clause of the Geneva Conference of 59. I don't suppose a small, well, you know. Aggression, said the secretary. We'd lose face in the Middle East. So, demanded the president, spreading his hands. They don't like us anyhow, do they? 
or the competition, or each other for that matter. That's not the point. We have to feel as though our dollars are buying friends, whether or not it's true. Well then, what can we do? said the president. No leaflets, no aggression. We couldn't maybe seed their clouds and make it rain on them? And get sued by other countries for artificially creating low-pressure conditions that they could claim rob them of their rightful rainfall? We've had it happen right here between our own states. Maybe we should just forget about it then? Never! It must be demonstrated to the world that we have the... We could take a full-page ad out in the New York Times. It just isn't done that way, the secretary protested. Why not? It'd save money, wouldn't it? A simple ad, like, Hey there, certain powers. Looky what we got. What'd be wrong with that? They'd accuse us of capitalistic propaganda, that's what. And to get the egg off our face, we'd have to demonstrate the plane. And be right back where we are now, the president realized aloud, nodding gloomily. Okay, so what do we do? The secretary looked to the left and the right, although they were alone together in a soundproof, heavily guarded room, before replying. We drop an agent, he whispered. The president blinked twice before responding. Have you gone mad? What man in his right mind would volunteer for such a thing? Drop an agent, indeed. Ten minutes after landing, he'd be up against a wall and shot. Wouldn't that be lovely for freedom and democracy? We'd have the r the certain powers gloating over the airwaves for weeks about nipping a capitalist assassin plot in the bud. Not to mention the mothers of America beating down the White House door just because one of our boys was sacrificed. You know how our country reacts. If an entire division is wiped out, we bite the bullet and erect statues and make speeches and then forget it. But let a single man get in the Dutch, and the whole population goes crazy until something is done about it. No, it won't work. May I finish? said the secretary patiently. The president shrugged. Why not? This agent would be something special, sir. One that would not only demonstrate our new aircraft, but would positively leave the ru Damn, you've got me doing it. Certain powers tied in knots. In point of fact, our military psychologists think that this agent might be the wedge to split communism apart in hopeless panic. Really, the president said, with more enthusiasm than he'd shown throughout the entire meeting. I'd like to meet this agent. The secretary pressed a black button upon the conference table. An instant later, the door opened and the secretary's personal aide stepped in. Yes, sir? Jenkins, have the corridor cleared and Secret Service men posted at all entrances and exits. When it's safe, bring in Agent X-45. He paused. And Professor Blake, too. At once, sir. Jenkins hurried out. X-45, said the president. He has no name? The secretary smiled inscrutably. Teddy, sir. Why, that smirk. You'll see, sir. They sat in fidgety silence for another minute, and then a buzzer sounded twice. Ah, that's Jenkins, said the secretary, and pressed the button once more. Jenkins came in, followed by a tall, gray-haired man who carried a large black suitcase. The president rose, and, as Jenkins left the room again, shook hands with the man. Agent X-45, he asked. Professor Charles Blake, the man corrected him calmly. Agent X-45, is it here? The president stared. In the suitcase? What are we sending, a dwarf? Hardly, said the secretary, snapping up the hasp on the suitcase and opening it upon the table. This, he said, lifting something from under tissue paper padding, is Agent X-45. The president's gaze was returned by two shiny black eyes, set on either side of a little brown muzzle with a gentle stitched-on smile. Agent X-45 was clad in a flight helmet, miniature jacket and tiny boots, with a baggy pair of brown canvas trousers belted at the waist and a bandolier holding a dozen small wooden bullets and dangling a patent leather holster containing a plastic water pistol, and he wore a small parachute and harness. But it's a teddy bear, cried the president. Precisely, Professor Blake said. I think I'll sit down, said the president, and did so visibly looking like a man who believes he is surrounded by lunatics. And look here, said the secretary, slipping his hand within Teddy's jacket and withdrawing a small oilskin pouch. It's rather rudimentary, but the Cyrillic lettering is genuine, and our ambassador assures us the layout is correct. The president took the pouch, unfolded it, and drew out a small sheet of paper, 
covered with the inscrutable letterings, and numerous rectangles and curved red lines. I give up, he said. What is it? A map of the Kremlin, said the secretary, his eyes dancing. That big red X is the location of the Politburo Council Chamber. Perhaps, the president said weakly, you could explain. Mr. President, said Professor Blake, I'm the new chief of propaganda for the government. The president nodded, poured himself a glass of water from a pitcher, and drained it. Yes, yes, he said. Naturally, I have spent my career studying the psychology of a certain power, the president groaned. Please, gentlemen, let's name names. It need never go outside this room. My lips are sealed. The professor and secretary exchanged a look, a raising of eyebrows, and then a shrug of surrender. Very well, said Blake. Russia? There, said the president. That's more like it. Blake cleared his throat and went on. We know that the weak spot in the Russian armor is the mentality of the average communist official, he explained, while the secretary, who had heard all this before, fiddled with the straps of Teddy's parachute and hummed softly to himself. They have a distrust complex. Everything and everybody is under 24-hour-a-day suspicion. Yes, so I hear, said the president. What do you suppose would happen to an agent that was caught by the Russians? asked Blake. I'd rather not even think about it. Not the sadistic details, sir. I mean the general train of events from the time of capture onward. The president pondered this. After his capture, he said thoughtfully, he would be questioned, through various methods, hopelessly at variance with the regulations of the Geneva Convention. They would discover his mission, and then he would be shot, I guess, or in prison. Blake nodded grimly. And what if an agent landed there that could not divulge his mission? The secretary stopped fiddling with the harness and watched the president's face. On the worn features, he read first puzzlement, then incredulity, then a flash of sheer amazement. Good heavens, said the president. They'd, they'd have to admit defeat, I suppose. But can they? Blake leaped forward and slammed his fist upon the tabletop. Can the communist mentality ever admit that it's been bested? I, I guess not. At least they never do, said the president. But this, he wagged a forefinger at the stuffed thing on the table, this certainly won't upset them. I mean, after all, he looked from one to the other for agreement and found none. But gentlemen, it's nothing but a stuffed bear. It won't upset them, queried Blake slowly. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. They'll find the bear wherever it lands and they'll, well, they'll know it's a gag and just laugh at us. How will they know? Blake persisted. Well, they'll be pretty well certain, the president said scathingly. I mean, a stuffed toy, would they give up on something of which they were pretty well certain? Well, they'd have to. Teddy here certainly wouldn't tell them anything. They'd say it was a joke and forget it. His voice barely sounded the last few words. He no longer believed them. A smile flickered upon his face. Gentlemen, you don't think they'd... The Russians said Blake without emotion, would go off their rockers, sir. To be unable to explain a thing like this would devastate their morale. The communist is a man who must hold all the aces. He'll shuffle and reshuffle until he gets them, too. Well, we're giving him a cold deck, sir. There are no aces for him to find. Hmm, said the president. As long as there's any doubt in their minds, they'll have to keep plugging at it, won't they? And since there's no solution... His smile grew calculating. Yes, yes, I begin to see. It's a small thing, to be sure, but I find I must leap at the opportunity to stick a few ants in their pants for a change. It won't wipe them out, began the secretary. But it'll wear them down a little, Blake finished. Done, said the president. How soon can we get Operation Frustration underway? The plane is ready to leave right now, said the secretary with a small blush. I... I rather thought you'd see this thing our way. The president frowned at this and then shrugged. Good enough. Let's get this bear in the air. You sure this plane will work? Asked the president, averting his face from the spray of leaves caught up in the shrieking jet stream of the waiting plane. It's too simple not to, said Blake, clutching his suitcase, on whose side a large red top secret had been stenciled, to his chest and shouting over the scream of the plane. 
The radar-resistant device is nothing more than a radio receiver that blankets the structure, making the entire plane a receiver. If it receives the radar impulses, it can't bounce back and make a blip on the enemy radar screens. The president sighed. You make it sound almost too easy. Very well. He shook the man's hand. Good luck. Thank you, sir, said Blake, patting the suitcase. I'll take good care of Teddy. The president nodded and moved away. Blake boarded the jet, and minutes later, the president was watching a last fading streamer of the twin exhaust dwindling upon the eastern horizon. I shan't sleep until he's back, said the secretary. Nor I, said the president. I have the weirdest damn apprehension. About what, sir? asked the secretary as they made their way from the field. About the... The president looked around, then lowered his voice to a whisper. The Russians. There's something in their makeup we may have overlooked. Impossible, sir, said the secretary of defense. Blake is our top psychologist. I hope you're right. If this fails, I'd hate for it to be traced to us. It can't be. The jacket was made in Japan, the boots in Mexico, the parachute in... I know, I know, said the president. But if they should trace it to us, we'll be a laughing stock. They won't, the secretary assured him. Two days later, Blake was back, his manner jovial when he met in secret session once more with the two executives. Couldn't have gone more perfectly, gentlemen, he said, rubbing his hands together and bouncing at his toes. We passed directly over Moscow, at a height of ten miles, on the stroke of midnight. The night was overcast and starless. Teddy was dropped through the bomb bay. I saw his parachute open myself. He's down there now, and we're sure to see signs any day now of the little cracks in the Iron Curtain. You had no trouble with the enemy, the president asked, though the answer, since Blake was back alive, was obvious. None, Blake said. The radar shield performed exactly as specified, sir. Not a blink of a searchlight, nor a single ground-to-air rocket did we see. Perhaps, on hearing us pass by, they sent up an investigating plane or two, but we were long gone by then. That's the advantage of moving faster than the sound you make, he added pontifically. I still feel we've overlooked something said the president. In the back of my mind, a small voice keeps trying to remind me of something about the Russians, something that should have made me veto this whole scheme at the start. Blake looked puzzled. What about them, sir? If it's in regard to their psychology, I can assure you. I don't mean their psychology at all, said the president. No, wait. Yes, I do, but in a minor way. They must pursue this thing, no matter what, but... A light glimmered then burned brightly in the president's eyes, and he stood up and smacked his fist into his open palm. Of course, he said. They're methods. Methods? asked Blake a little nervously. The president's reply was interrupted by a knock at the door. The three men exchanged a look. Then the secretary jabbed the button, and Jenkins came in. Just came in for you, sir, he said, handing the secretary a small envelope and making his exit silently. The president waited impatiently as the envelope was torn open and its contents read. Then the secretary's hands opened limply and the message fell upon the table. Diplomatic note. Russian. Teddy. He whispered. What? yelped the president. He snatched the paper from the table and read it, then sank into his chair once more, his face grim and eyes suspiciously moist. The dirty, low-down, rotten... Blake hovering at table side, hesitated a moment, then asked, What about Teddy? What happened? What we might have expected, said the secretary dolefully. You don't mean... Blake mumbled, horrified. He couldn't continue, just waited for the worst. The president nodded miserably. He's confessed. The End The Business, as usual, by Jack Sharkey. Recorded by Sean Fager.